Lifting the Veil An Investigative History of the United States Pathocracy Researched and Written by Timothy M. Silver Lifting the Veil is being constantly updated thanks to continuous reader feedback and further research. This copy was released on March 12, 2014. If more than a month has passed, please check my website thepeopleshistory.net for a more recent version. I know the capacity that is there to make tyranny total in America, and we must see to it that this agency CIA and all agencies that possess this technology operate within the law and under proper supervision, so that we never cross over that abyss. That is the abyss from which there is no return. Senator Frank Church, 1975 One preface It has been a little over a year since I first read about the Central Intelligence Agency program known as MKUltra, which was dedicated to exploring the vast possibilities of biological behavioral engineering, also known as mind control. I was stunned by the depth of the horror unleashed on the unwitting victims of the program, less than a decade removed from the Nuremberg trials which concluded that never again should scientists experiment on subjects without their willing consent. I was impressed that the agency deftly avoided any significant reform, even after multiple congressional inquiries into their illegal, unconstitutional activities which the disclosure of MK Ultra prompted, and was disturbed by the complete lack of information regarding the program in the general public. Most shocking, despite agency insistence to the contrary, was the documented evidence that their mission of controlling the human mind bore significant fruit. As an aspiring historian, I set off to work on turning over every stone related to covert intelligence activities and other suppressed history, created the pen name Morgan Martell and began publishing my research on a blog titled The People's History. Since then, I have read dozens of books and thousands of mainstream media articles, interviews, scientific studies and primary documents in my quest for knowledge. Before long I came to the understanding that I was not just learning about a series of unrelated clandestine agency abuses and financial crimes, but rather was researching various disclosures of an organized subversive network working behind the scenes. A bold statement like this requires bold evidence, of course, and I invite you to investigate the nearly 500 citations of publicly available, mainstream sources yourself and come to your own conclusions. I used the name Morgan Martell for a brief period because I was worried that my work would attract the wrong kind of attention. In fact, when I first wrote about the MK2 Ultra project, I deliberately omitted some information, not because I thought it was unimportant or that it lacked sufficient documentation, but because some of the documented history is so shocking that I was afraid to write about it. The revelations of Edward Snowden, beginning on June 6, 2013, changed my mind about the secrecy. The NSA knows exactly who I am and what I am researching, so you might as well too. I promise that nothing I have learned which can be corroborated has been left out of this book, even when facing the depths of depravity unleashed by certain psychopaths in position of power. Whether you are approaching this work from a vantage point of exploring new ideas, learning more about topics that already interest you, or if you are antagonistic to the idea that something is not quite right with the United States today, I urge you to have an open mind and to be prepared to synthesize new information into your worldview. In return, I am willing to do the same from you. Every day I strive to learn new things and explore new ideas, a fact which has delayed the release of this book for some months as I continuously refined and expanded the thesis. If you have alternative ideas you would like to share, criticism to offer, or have additional research that would augment this work, please do not hesitate to contact me. I thoroughly enjoy the correspondence. Lifting the Veil is structured in a way that discusses two startling problems with the current political system in the United States today, and then jumps to 1946 and works forward in time to shed light on how these problems came about. Woven in is information on psychopathy and its relationship to politics and power, my own conclusions drawn from the information, and food for thought questions. The final portion of the book ties together the pieces of the puzzle and presents potential, nonpartisan solutions we can take to effect change. I ask one thing from you, the reader, before embarking on this journey. Once you finish, if you believe that this work is important, 
please resolve yourself to share it with at three least two people, whether they are someone you know in real life, online acquaintances, or anonymous recipients. I have released this book free for a reason. It is the only way this information will spread to a point where it will reach a critical mass. Once it does, change will be inevitable. Let's endeavor to make this happen as soon as possible. Thanks for reading. Timothy M. Silver Tim Silver People's History at gmail.com for index chapter I, The War on Terror is a Fraud chapter 2, The One Party State chapter 3, Psychopathy, Power and Politics chapter 4, Operation Paperclip chapter V, MK Ultra chapter 6, Operation Gladio chapter 7, Operation Mockingbird chapter 8, COINTELPRO chapter 9, The Phoenix Program chapter X, Iran slash Contra Chapter 11, Continuity of Government Chapter 12, The Pedophocracy Chapter 13, Cults and Child Abuse Chapter 14, Trauma. Based Mind Control Chapter 15, The Pathocracy Chapter 16, Solutions Chapter 17, The Awakening. 1. The War on Terror is a Fraud in the Mid-80s, if you remember. Saudi Arabia and the United States were supporting the Mujahideen to liberate Afghanistan from the Soviets. He Osama bin Laden came to thank me for my efforts to bring the Americans, our friends, to help us against the atheists, he said the communists. Isn't it ironic? Prince Bandar bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia, on Larry King Live 2 in 2009, a series of events occurred that ought to have raised questions in the press. First, the United States began a troop surge in Afghanistan designed to deliver the final blow to the Taliban insurgency. Three then the United States provided a $7.5 billion aid package to Pakistan. For around the same time, the Carnegie Foundation published a study which revealed a majority of Pakistan aid goes to the intelligence agency ISI and the military. Five the problem with these three events is that earlier in the year, U.S. officials revealed to the New York Times that the ISI was funding the Taliban, and was responsible for providing direct assistance and helping with some of their strategic strikes. 6. The press did cover these stories, but independent of one another. Not one media institution connected the dots that the United States was actively funding the harm that its armed forces were simultaneously fighting. Following the official narrative of the war, it certainly doesn't make any sense that the United States was indirectly prolonging the quagmire. Perhaps such mistakes are the inevitability of a bloated war bureaucracy, or that U.S. officials simply didn't realize the connection. Unfortunately, a collection of evidence points to a more sinister explanation, the United States and its allies have been deliberately proliferating radical Islam for decades, only to later spend trillions fighting the enemy they created. Just days after the July 7, 2005 London terror attack, and less than a month before his untimely death, the Right Honourable Robin Cook, former UK Foreign Secretary, wrote a scathing and emotional review of the war on terror in The Guardian. Bin Laden was, though, a product of a monumental miscalculation by Western security agencies. Throughout the 80s he was armed by the CIA and funded by the Saudis to wage jihad against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, literally the database, was originally the computer file of the thousands of Mujahideen who were recruited and trained with help from the CIA to defeat the Russians. Inexplicably, and with disastrous consequences, it never appears to have occurred to Washington that once Russia was out of the way, Bin Laden's organization would turn its attention to the West. 7. While Cook's remarks were downplayed and ridiculed by the mainstream media and the United Kingdom establishment at the time, available evidence shows his assertions to be largely correct. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Operation Cyclone They the CIA told me these people were fanatical, and the more fierce they were the more fiercely they would fight the Soviets. I warned them that we were creating a monster. Scholar Selig Harrison 8 The story begins in 1978 shortly after the Soar Revolution, which resulted in the Communist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan gaining control of the Afghanistan government. The CIA immediately initiated a program known as Operation Cyclone and began funding militant Islamic groups favored by the Pakistani intelligence agency ISI, 
to the tune of 7.5 billion. 9. The money went to producing, training, and arming militant Islamic radicals who be directed towards fighting the secular communist government. At the time, the Mujahideen was composed of many different, loosely organized groups encompassing a broad spectrum of ideologies, with widely varying perspectives on religion, society, and state. Seven major Afghan factions began receiving aid, three of them Islamic moderates and four of them Islamic fundamentalists as defined by the military, and in addition to native Afghans they were composed of many foreigners who traveled to fight the invasion, such as Osama bin Laden himself. Tend to understand the scope of the funding, the BBC stated that the CIA provided enough arms to equip a 240,000 man army, and Saudi Arabia matched them dollar for dollar. 11. The weapons given to these fighters were not just AK-47S and other simple arms. Many were high-tech, such as Stinger anti-aircraft missiles 12, provided with the intention of demoralizing Soviet commanders and soldiers. 13. The majority of the funding was funneled through the ISI, which acted as an arm of CIA interests and began setting up religious schools known as madrasas in Pakistan cities and frontier areas, churning out tens of thousands of students who would join the Mujahideen. 14. Note, madrasas are not inherently negative institutions, however the ones who received funding from the CIA were particularly radical. All of this began before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. A full six months, according to Zbigniew Brzezinski, President Carter's national security advisor, who recalled his involvement to a French news magazine in 1998. We didn't push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the probability that they would. That secret operation was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Soviets into the Afghan trap. The day that the Soviets officially crossed the border I wrote to President Carter, we now have the opportunity of giving the Soviet Union its Vietnam War 15. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Early years of Osama bin Laden 15 Bilbir Singh, the Talibanization of Southeast Asia, excerpt available here. 6. When Osama bin Laden arrived in Afghanistan from Saudi Arabia, he created a group called Maktab al qadamat abbreviated as MAC, a precursor to Al-Qaeda. It is frequently claimed that the CIA directly funded this group, though top CIA officers say that this is not the case. It has been confirmed, at least, that the MAC did receive funding from the ISI, 16 the CIA's primary conduit for conducting their covert war against Russia. CIA station chief in Afghanistan Milt Bearden has stated that he was well aware of bin Laden in the Mujahideen, and welcomed his efforts in funding, though he never met with him personally. 17 bin Laden also brought in construction equipment from his father's company Saudi bin Laden Group, considered the largest construction firm in the world, to build training camps, in collaboration with the ISI and CIA 18 in 1986, Osama used his construction assets to build a CIA-financed tunnel complex to serve as a training facility. It was also a major arms and medical depot for the Mujahideen in the Peshawar Mountains near Pakistan which was later used by Al-Qaeda. 1915 years later, the Western media would describe Al-Qaeda as hiding out in caves, but the truth is a little more complex, there were intricate tunnels connecting hundreds of different caves, a majority of them man-made, equipped with irrigation systems, accommodation for trucks and even tanks, hotels, mosques, arms depots, medical and radio centers, and kitchens. 20 In short, it is more accurate to call them mountain fortresses. Al-Qaeda was formed sometime between 1987 to 88, with the radical elements of MAC joining after the group split. It is apparent that the CIA had no plan to deal with the tunnel complex after the conclusion of Operation Cyclone, though surely that must have been aware that the cotter of radicals they were instrumental in producing would not simply disappear or de-radicalize. Perhaps long-term destabilization of the country was their plan all along. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Taliban. Evidence suggests that the Taliban is actively involved with Al-Qaeda. For example, one 1998 State Department cable claimed that, Taliban leader Mullah Omar lashed out at the U.S., 
asserting that the Taliban will continue providing a safe haven for bin Laden 21. There is plenty of evidence that Pakistan's ISI currently actively funds the Taliban and other terrorist cells as well, while barring the US military from operating in the tribal areas. A 2010 BBC article stated that the ISI was giving funding, training and sanctuary to the Afghan Taliban on a scale much larger than previously thought, going as far as to say that support for the Taliban was official ISI policy. Since 9-11, the United States has given Pakistan over $15 billion, much of which goes to the ISI and military. 22 Current Vice President Joe Biden said himself in 2003 that the ISI was either turning a blind eye or cooperating with the Taliban. In addition, some members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee contend that the intelligence service may have provided money, weapons, and broadcast equipment to Taliban fighters now in Pakistan to transmit anti-Karzai, anti-American messages into Afghanistan 23. BBC has reported on a secret NATO document which notes, Pakistan's manipulation of the Taliban senior leadership continues unabated 24. A report published by the London School of Economics gave nine in-depth interviews with Taliban insurgent commanders. They suggest that the ISI has members on the Taliban Leadership Council, though they expressed fear of assassination if they went into too much depth on this topic. 25 It's not hard to establish that the United States has allied itself with one of the biggest funders of terrorism in the Middle East, a fact which blatantly clashes with the official narrative of Western involvement in the region. It makes much more sense when understood in the context that the goal of the United States in the Middle East is not the prevention of terrorism, but rather for political, military, and economic hegemony. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Osama runs wild I do not profess a broad expertise in international affairs, but between January 1996 and June 1999 I was in charge of running operations against Al-Qaeda from Washington. When it comes to this small slice of the large U.S. national security pie, I speak with first-hand experience, and for several score of CIA officers, when I state categorically that during this time senior White House officials repeatedly refused to act on sound intelligence that provided multiple chances to eliminate Osama bin Laden either by capture or by U.S. military attack. I witnessed and where life-risking intelligence gathering work of the agency's men and women in the field was wasted. Michael Scheuer, 22-year veteran of the CIA 26A 2001 Washington Post article states that in 1996 the government of Sudan offered to keep tabs on Osama, or if that did not suffice, arrest him and hand him over to either the United States or Saudi custody. 27 The Sudanese security services, he said, would happily keep close watch on bin Laden for the United States. But if that would not suffice, the government was prepared to place him in custody and hand him over, though to whom was ambiguous. In one formulation, Airway said Sudan would consider any legitimate proffer of criminal charges against the accused terrorist. Their negotiations concluded as such, we said he will go to Afghanistan, and the US officials said, let him. The Clinton administration claimed that they lacked criminal charges to pin on bin Laden, though this explanation is a farce, as within a year ago previous they had named him as a co-conspirator in the World Trade Center bombing, among other terrorist activities. 28 Just a year later, the Clinton administration would commit the egregious war crime of the bombing of the Sudanese Al-Shifa pharmaceutical factory, which provided 50% of the medicine for Sudan. 29 The destruction of the factory was estimated to be responsible for the deaths of several tens of thousands of people according to the German ambassador to Sudan, on a much flimsier pretext. 30 Interestingly, the pretext of the Al-Shifa bombing is that the factory had ties to bin Laden, in the very country that had proposed to extradite him, by the very people who declined to accept his arrest. A 2002 article in The Guardian reveals that the first Interpol arrest warrant for bin Laden came from Libya's Muammar Gaddafi in 1998. 31 It also uncovered that the MI6 paid large sums of money to an Al-Qaeda cell in Libya in a failed attempt to assassinate Gaddafi.
Perhaps this is why US and UK intelligence agencies apparently buried the fact that Libya had issued the warrant for bin Laden's arrest and downplayed the threat he posed. Five months after the arrest warrant was issued, Al-Qaeda killed over 200 people in bombings of US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. 32 These actions are consistent with the trend of working with Al-Qaeda when they shared the same goals, and fighting them when war in the region was a strategic geopolitical move. Asterisk 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 asterisk. U.S. trained terrorists. It has been widely reported, thanks to revelations by ABC reporter John Cooley, that some Islamic fundamentalists were trained in the United States in the 1980s, by way of Camp Peary, the CIA spy base in Virginia, being flown in from places such as Jordan, Egypt, and even Africa. 33 It raises the question of how many such camps existed beyond the United States. Regardless, there have been some astonishing revelations of terrorists trained within the U.S. borders. One specifically alarming case is that of Egyptian Ali Muhammad. He was a part of the fundamentalist military unit that assassinated Egyptian President Anwar Sadat in 1981. In 1984, he was hired by the CIA, though they claim that the relationship was short-lived. 34 He would soon join the military and become a member of the Green Berets, and serve as a drill sergeant at Fort Bragg while providing clandestine training to jihadists such as Mahmoud Abu Halima, convicted perpetrator of the 1993 World Trade Center bombings. 35 He would take a short leave from his military duties and travel to Afghanistan in 1988 to assist the Mujahideen, returning just months later. 36 Such an act is completely unheard of, entirely unprecedented and raises all sorts of red flags. Who was allowing Muhammad to circumvent the law and what type of special privileges and protections was he receiving? In the early 1990s he would return to Afghanistan and began training jihadists with the skills he had learned at Fort Bragg. According to former FBI Special Agent Jack Clunan, in an interview with PBS, his first training session included Osama bin Laden, as well as Ayman al-Zawahiri, the current leader of al-Qaeda. 37 former directors of counterterrorism at the National Security Council have alleged that Muhammad took maps and training materials from Fort Bragg and used them to write the al-Qaeda terrorist training manual. 38 Muhammad superior at Fort Bragg, Lt. Col. Robert Anderson, has stated. I think you or I would have a better chance of winning the Powerball lottery, than an Egyptian major in the unit that assassinated Sadat would have getting a visa, getting to California, getting into the army and getting assigned to a special forces unit. That just doesn't happen. 39 Elsewhere he stated, it was unthinkable that an ordinary American GI would go unpunished after fighting in a foreign war, and that he assumed that Muhammad was sponsored by the CIA 40 in the year 2000. Muhammad plead guilty to involvement in the 1998 embassy bombings that killed 224 people including 12 Americans. 41 He admitted during the trial that he was a part of a broader plot to attack any Western target in the Middle East, as well as admitting that he helped transfer Osama bin Laden from Pakistan to Sudan. Asterisk 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 asterisk. United States and Al-Qaeda have the same agenda in 2011, NATO led by Barack Obama and the United States, initiated military action against Libya by enforcing a no-fly zone and carried out numerous air strikes, including one against Libyan state TV which killed three journalists. 42 downplayed in Western media was the fact that the rebels consisted of various factions of radical Islamists, many who had been fighting Gaddafi for decades and had their roots in the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, such as the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, whose goal is to implement an Islamic State. 43 CNN has reported on widespread abuses against civilians from these. 13. Groups after Gaddafi was ousted from power, including the use of landmines and other deadly equipment. 44 Many of the rebels have admitted links to Al-Qaeda 45, whom had declared support for the rebels in Libya. 46 The Washington Post has reported that a former Al-Qaeda member has estimated there to be 1,000 freelance jihadists that have traveled to Libya to support the rebels, many affiliated with Al-Qaeda, 
and also that Libya has one of the highest domestic Al-Qaeda populations in the Middle East, quoting a 2007 West Point study on the subject. 47 In 1999, the United States decided to support the Kosovo Liberation Army, allies of Al-Qaeda. Bill Clinton framed the intervention in humanitarian terms despite the fact that staggering atrocities were being committed on both sides. 48 French news agency AFP reported that members of the KLA had been trained by Ben Laden 49, and the Washington Times reported that the KLA bankrolled their operations with funds from the heroin trade in Afghanistan and had accepted money from Ben Laden himself. 50 The Mujahideen, many specifically members of Al-Qaeda, were also instrumental in Bosnia during the NATO intervention in 1993. Their presence is still a factor of instability today. 51 It is of significance that all of these associations occurred after the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, when Al-Qaeda first became widespread in the American lexicon. Barack Obama has been arming rebels in Syria, beginning secretly with CIA arms airlifts in 2012-52, citing many of the same reasons for intervention that Clinton did in 1999, despite domestic and foreign ally opposition. 5354 Once again, many of the rebels have been associated with Al-Qaeda and labeled terrorist organizations by the U.S. 55. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The source of radicalism. Earlier I mentioned CIA-funded madrasas being a source of Islamic radicalism in the 1980s. They have been an important factor in the radicalization of Islam ever since. As of 2008, there are 750 madrasas in Pakistan that teach jihad and radicalism, about 10% of all madrasas in the country, and I want to emphasize that this section is referring to specific radical iterations of madrasas, not simply applying a blanket generalization to the religious style of education. 56 U.S. diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks revealed that the funding for these radical schools now comes from Saudi Arabia, the United States' biggest ally in the region. 57 The radical madrasa network exploits impoverished areas by recruiting children for what essentially amounts to indoctrination camps. In exchange, families receive upwards of $6,500 per son for their sacrifice to Islam, and during schooling, contact with families is forbidden. After graduation, many are funneled into terrorist training camps in the federally administered tribal areas, the cable stated. PBS Frontline did a story on a 16-year-old who was recruited to a Pakistan Wahhabi Islam madrasa from an impoverished area in East Africa. 58 A few years later, he was instrumental in a terror plot, blowing up the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. The PBS website hosts a letter he wrote to his brother, in which he says he spent two years on a military base learning warfare, including the usage of Israeli arms. 59 Is the CIA still involved? The House of Saud has given at least $1.474 billion to the Bush family 60, and the United States sold Saudi Arabia $60 billion worth of arms in 2010, the biggest arms sale in American history. 61 Before he was president, George H.W. Bush was the director of the CIA. As recently as June 25, 2013, Secretary of State John Kerry announced that Saudi Arabia is one of our closest partners. 62 At the very least we can establish complicity. Regardless, the United States' relationship with Saudi Arabia ought to raise a lot of important questions. On November 4, 2013, Secretary of State John Kerry hailed Saudi Arabia as a very important ally to the United States. 63 How can we reconcile this stance with the 2010 cable leaks revealing that former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said that donors in the kingdom constitute the most significant source of funding to Sunni terrorist groups worldwide, and that it has been an ongoing challenge to persuade Saudi officials to treat terrorist financing emanating from Saudi Arabia as a strategic priority? 64 It is clear that the United States views their geopolitical relationship with Saudi Arabia to be much more important than combating terrorism, despite U.S. involvement in the Middle East being saturated with rhetoric about the war on terror. 
The same statement can be applied to the relationship with Pakistan, who is instrumental in the operations of the Taliban. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Double agents. The assassination of high-profile Pakistan tribal leader Kari Zainuddin was widely reported in the Western media. 65 only days before his assassination he had renounced his support of the Taliban, claiming that their actions were un-Islamic. What the Western media neglected to report but was widely reported in Pakistan and other countries was Zainuddin had previously claimed that Baitullah Mursad, the man who ended up ordering his assassination, was an American agent. 66 The claim that American agents operate in the Taliban sounds far-fetched but there have been some eye-opening reports that confirm the possibility. For example, a 2004 article in the UK publication Times Online reported that a high-ranking Al-Qaeda member had been revealed to be a double agent working for MI5. Abu Qatada boasted to MI5 that he could prevent terrorist attacks and offered to expose dangerous extremists, while all along he was setting up a haven for his terror organization in Britain 67. Abu Qatada has been imprisoned multiple times in Britain but has not been charged with any crimes. During his career he has issued fatwas justifying the killing of converts from Islam, advocated the killing of Jews, praised attacks on America, and convicted of charges of terrorism in Jordan, all while working in association with MI5. 68 A 2002 article published by French news organization AFP states that Palestine security forces had arrested a group of Palestinians who had confessed to collaborating with Israel and posing as operatives of Al-Qaeda. 69 He Palestinian Authority official said the alleged collaborators sought to discredit the Palestinian people, justify every Israeli crime and provide reasons to carry out a new, military, aggression in the Gaza Strip. The arrest came just two days after Ariel Sharon claimed that Al-Qaeda militants were operating in Gaza and Lebanon, likely in an attempt to justify future military action. BBC has also reported on this story. 70. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The official story. The official story is that bin Laden and Al-Qaeda found new enemies in the US after the Cold War when the United States began occupying military bases in Saudi Arabia. It sounds plausible, but does not stand up to deeper scrutiny. In 1993, Scott Armstrong, at the time the top investigative reporter for the Washington Post, gave some tremendously revealing interviews with PBS Frontline. In an episode titled The Arming of Saudi Arabia, he stated that the United States and Saudi Arabia had jointly conspired to covertly build $200 billion worth of military installations between the years 1979 and 1992. 71 Steve Call, eminent bin Laden biographer, states that 70 BBC, Israel faked Al-Qaeda presence, December 8th. 2002 71 PBS Frontline transcript of the episode available here. 18. The Bin Laden group received a multitude of these contracts, with the knowing intent to support and house U.S. military personnel during wars that may threaten Saudi territory. 72 This occurred during the same time that Osama Bin Laden was actively using Bin Laden group assets to build extensive infrastructure in Afghanistan. Surely he was aware of the construction of the military bases and who intended to occupy them, yet he did not have a problem then with the prospect then. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Money. During the peak of World War II, military and defense spending reached a rate of over 40% of the United States gross domestic product. 73 Even after a massive demobilization, the military-industrial complex had grown to a behemoth, averaging over 7% of GDP throughout the Cold War. According to the Cato Institute, the United States spent a total of $6 trillion on military and intelligence in just four decades during the Cold War, a staggering sum. After the Soviet Union was defeated, the military-industrial complex experienced a steady decline, accounting for just 3.7% of GDP in the year 2000. This changed on September 11 when the Mike found that they could turn their old friends into new enemies to fight, and their percentage of GDP has more than doubled in the last decade. 
74 Congress has officially authorized more than $1.3 trillion to fight the war on terror, and a Brown University study says this is just the tip of the iceberg, even if the war 72 Stephen Call, the Bin Ladens, no excerpt available. 73 math and charts available here at usgovernmentspending.com 74 more charts. 19. On terror were to begin de-escalating now, it would end up costing a total of 3.9 trillion between domestic spending, veterans costs, and interest. 75. The money comes from the taxpayers of the United States, whether directly or indirectly, and goes to the pockets of defense contractors and banks. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Al-Qaeda today. In 2003, Donald Rumsfeld wrote a memo to the Joint Chiefs of Staff where he stated that we need to stop populating Guantanamo Bay with low-level enemy combatants. 76 The memo was uncovered in 2011. Over 750 prisoners have gone through Guantanamo, most being released without charges. 77 of the 160 prisoners in Guantanamo Bay today, half have been cleared for release but are still being detained. 78 Former CIA Director Leon Panetta said in 2010 that there were less than 100 Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. 79 Asterisk 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 Conclusion After trillions of dollars spent, hundreds of thousands of deaths, repeated domestic rights infringements, we are left with only a handful of proven Al-Qaeda members, with a majority of prisoners simply being held without charges. The organization purported to be a sprawling monster after the September 11th attacks has been revealed to be a shell of an operation, financed by wealthy U.S. allies. The result is endless war, politicians, military, and media shine the light just right to make the shadow of the mouse look huge and monstrous to justify endless profits. The media is not even connecting the most basic of dots to reveal the tremendous deception. The evidence is a repeated policy of the destabilization of Central Asia and the development of Islamic radicals that spans decades. The result is a new global enemy without borders or diplomatic representation that can be fought indefinitely. Unless significant changes are made, we are looking at a future with an endless war on terrorism where more terrorists are created daily by the very policies that are meant to be fighting them, and a foreign policy dictated by the whims of war profiteering. And what kind of influence are we having in the Middle East? The rhetoric of bringing democracy to the peoples of Iraq and Afghanistan would be laughable were it not such a grandiose and destructive lie. The impact of American intervention in these two countries has been disastrous. The biggest source of corruption in Afghanistan, one American official said, was the United States. New York Times 80 The New York Times article describes how the CIA routinely funneled millions of dollars without oversight in unmarked bags to the offices of President Hamid Karzai, while simultaneously denouncing the Iranian policy of doing the exact same thing. U.S. officials are quoted as saying that instead of buying the loyalty of the Afghan president, the payments instead proliferated into a vast web of corruption while Karzai became increasingly defiant of U.S. interests. In Iraq, the country has devolved into near anarchy with monthly death tolls from terrorism sometimes reaching the 1000s. In 2004, the New York Times reported that there was a massive assassination campaign targeting intellectuals and professionals, with between 500 and 1000 urban professionals killed in just a nine-month span 81. From drive-by shootings to stealth murders in the victim's home, officials in Iraq agree that there is a massive campaign to silence the capable and educated. They are going after our brains, said L.T. C.O.L. Jabbar Abu Nadiha, head of the organized crime unit of the Baghdad police. It is a big operation. Maybe even a movement. These white-collar killings, American and Iraqi officials say, are separate from and in some ways more insidious than the settling of scores with former Ba'ath Party officials, or the singling out of police officers and others thought to be collaborating with the occupation. Hundreds of them have been attacked as well in an effort to sow insecurity and chaos. But by silencing urban professionals, said Brig. Jen. Mark Kimmett, a spokesman for the occupation forces, 
the guerrillas are waging war on Iraq's fledgling institutions and progress itself. The dead include doctors, lawyers, and judges. In other words, Iraq is being left without the very people who could have been future leaders of democracy, and whom could have established a functioning society. Shortly afterwards, a corporate-friendly government was established. Furthermore, it is not empty rhetoric to say that the Iraq invasion was based on lies. In 2012, the Iraqi defector responsible for the evidence of chemical weapon production in Iraq which was presented to the United Nations by Colin Powell, who portrayed it as facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence, confessed to BBC that his claims were entirely fabricated. 82 Clearly there is an agenda that does not mesh with the rhetoric. Will the war on terror ever end? Who truly has the incentive to scale back the operation? Not clandestine agencies or the military, who are seeing their budgets increase year by year. Certainly not any of the major influences in politics, banks, and corporations, who are seeing massive profits from government contracts and resource exploitation. And most certainly not any politician in Washington, who virtually rely on the lobbying of these organizations to keep their jobs. Journalist Glenn Greenwald put it succinctly. But what one can say for certain is that there is zero reason for U.S. officials to want an end to the war on terror, and numerous and significant reasons why they would want it to continue. It's always been the case that the power of political officials is at its greatest, its most unrestrained, in a state of war. Cicero, 2000 years ago, warned that in times of war, the law falls silent, inter arma and m silent legs. John J. In Federalist No. 4, warned that as a result of that truth, nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by 82. The independent, man whose WMD lies led to 100,000 deaths confesses all, April 1, 2012. 23. It. For the purposes and objects merely personal, such as thirst for military glory, revenge for personal affronts, ambition, or private compacts to aggrandize or support their particular families or partisans. If you were a U.S. leader, or an official of the national security state, or a beneficiary of the private military and surveillance industries, why would you possibly want the war on terror to end? That would be the worst thing that could happen. It's that war that generates limitless power, impenetrable secrecy, and unquestioning citizenry, and massive profit. Glenn Greenwald, writing for The Guardian 83 Greenwald also notes the hopelessness of combating terrorism with further violence. Indeed, virtually every person accused of plotting to target the U.S. with terrorist attacks in last several years has expressly cited increasing U.S. violence, aggression, and militarism in the Muslim world as the cause. There's no question that this war will continue indefinitely. There is no question that U.S. actions are the cause of that, the gasoline that fuels the fire. But the notion that the US government is even entertaining putting an end to any of this is a pipe dream, and the belief that they even want to is fantasy. They're preparing for more endless war, their actions are fueling that war, and they continue to reap untold benefits from its continuation. Only outside compulsion, 83 The Guardian, The War on Terror, by design, can never end, January 4th, 2013. 24. From citizens, can make an end to all of this possible. Food for thought. 1. How close of a relationship did the CIA maintain with Osama bin Laden after Operation Cyclone? 2. Why does the United States consider Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, the two largest funders of terrorism, our biggest allies in the region? 3. How closely does the CIA work with the intelligence agencies of these countries? 4. How many agents does the United States have operating in Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, and how many atrocities are they responsible for? 5. Why have Al-Qaeda and the United States fought on the same side of multiple wars? 6. Why have so few Al-Qaeda been apprehended after over a decade of fighting the war on terror and millions of dollars spent? 7. Who has a monetary stake in the proliferation of terrorism, and how much influence do they hold in official U.S. policy? 25. The one-party state. 
Perhaps the most widely proliferated truism of American patriotism is that the, the two-party system is a beacon of democracy. Surely, our system is better than that of Iran, where presidential candidates must be approved by a religious council, or perhaps that of Venezuela, where the majority of the media is state-owned and disseminates propaganda in each election. Democrats and Republicans are widely different, it seems. At least that is what their hyperpartisan bickering would imply. Bill Clinton and Barack Obama must have been unabashed liberals, otherwise why would the Republicans despise them so much? The divide between party faithfuls of different colors runs deep, with each side blaming the entirety of the country's problems on the other, often resulting in a state of pure hatred and disgust among citizens. One only needs to turn on cable news to see this as a fact. However, the reality is that Republican and Democrat presidents have closely followed the same agenda for half a century. The idea that American governance alternates as a sort of give and take between liberalism and conservatism is nothing more than a fantasy. I do not discount that there may be serious and significant differences between Democrat and Republican individuals, many of them congressmen, and certainly in state legislatures. Yet at the top of the pyramid, where the power to set agendas resides, there is only the agenda, and the primary difference between the two parties is the speed at which the agenda is advanced. It is fascinating how Bill Clinton began his presidential campaign with playing a saxophone on live television, talking about his foray into marijuana, reminiscing about his protest of the Vietnam War, and ended up with perhaps the most reactionary, e.g. maintaining the status quo, administration of any president in modern history. Later. 26. Obama entered the stage as a candidate of change, only to accelerate and consolidate the hegemony of the political elite faster than any predecessor. But let's go beyond rhetoric and examine the records of the last five presidents, and see exactly how similar their platforms were. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Crime the United States has less than 5% of the world's population. But it has almost a quarter of the world's prisoners. Indeed, the United States leads the world in producing prisoners, a reflection of a relatively recent and now entirely distinctive American approach to crime and punishment. Americans are locked up for crimes from writing bad checks to using drugs that would rarely produce prison sentences in other countries and in particular they are kept incarcerated far longer than prisoners in other nations. New York Times 84 At the end of Reagan's administration, the incarceration rate was 247 per 100,000 citizens. The demand for prison space had been steadily increasing since the war on drugs began. Under George H.W. Bush the incarceration rate had increased to 332 per 100,000. It is a common misconception that it is Republicans have the more punitive crime policies. Under Clinton, the incarceration rate skyrocketing to 476 per 100,000 over the next eight years. 85 The Clinton administration gave $30 billion to states to fund and expand their prisons 86, and championed the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act added 100,000 new police officers. 87 The bill was written by current Vice President Joe Biden. The act also expanded the death penalty to be applicable 60 more offenses including drug trafficking, and eliminated funding for inmate education. Private prisons flourished under Bill Clinton. The ACLU in 2011 published a fascinating review of the private prison system and found that since 1990, the private prison population has increased by 1,600%. 88 The number of private prison systems actually peaked in the year 2000 with 153 facilities. 89 The policy that began under Reagan and has been flourishing through both Bushes, Clinton, and Obama can only be referred to as mass incarceration. As of 2013, the United States holds more prisoners than any other country in the world, including China, as well as a larger percentage of prisoners per population than any other country. For an even more sobering comparison, consider that the United States has more people imprisoned today, as a whole and per capita, than Stalin had under his archipelago of gulags.
90 Louisiana is perhaps the best example of how corrupted the prison system can become when privatization runs amok. Louisiana has a largely private prison system, and currently has one in 86 adults incarcerated, twice the national average and three times that of Iran. Nearly two-thirds of these prisoners are serving time for nonviolent offenses. 91 Lobbying, along with an incentive of job creation, has resulted in some of the toughest penalties in the country, such as a potential 10 years in prison for writing a bad check. Over half of the prison population returns to the system in five years, without having received any rehabilitation and being returned to communities devastated largely in part by the continued extraction of the population into prison for nonviolent offenses. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Arms sales. On the campaign trail, Bill Clinton made this promise, I expect to review our arms sales policy and to take it up with the other major arms sellers of the world as a part of a long-term effort to reduce the proliferation of weapons. 92 And then, in some astounding turn of events, or predictable, for those who have been watching closely, United States arms sales doubled in Clinton's first year in office alone. 93 In 2006, the United Nations convened in order to create a comprehensive, legally binding instrument establishing common international standards for the import, export, and transfer of conventional arms. The United States was the only country to vote against the measure. 94 In 2008, Obama signaled that he would change the course from the Bush administration and take steps to limit arms sales internationally. And similar to nearly two decades earlier, United States arms sales tripled in 2011. 95 By 2012, Obama had ended negotiations on the UN Treaty. 96 Is it any surprise, considering Obama received more campaign donations from the defense industry than McCain? 97 One particularly shocking revelation was a program known as Fast and Furious, where Barack Obama oversaw the initiation and operation of a gun-running scheme where arms were sent over the Mexican border and directly into the hands of criminals. 98 Fast and Furious was an operation so cloak and dagger Mexican authorities weren't even notified that thousands of semi-automatic firearms were being sold to people in Arizona thought to have links to Mexican drug cartels. According to ATF whistleblowers, in 2009 the U.S. government began instructing gun store owners to break the law by selling firearms to suspected criminals. ATF agents then, again according to testimony by ATF agents turned whistleblowers, were ordered not to intercept the smugglers but rather to let the guns walk significantly after he began allowing, under order, massive amounts of guns to cross the border into the hands of criminals and cartels. 99 Dodson said they never did take down a drug cartels. However, when he noted that the crime rates and violence in Mexico and at the border increased he said thousands of fast and furious weapons are still out there and will be claiming victims on both sides of the border for years to come. CBS across the U.S. Mexican border and into the hands of Mexican drug trafficking organizations. Forbes senior ATF agent John Dodson, who broke the fast and furious story, was alarmed domestic spying a 1999 BBC article titled Echelon Spy Network Revealed began with the paragraph, imagine a global spying network that can eavesdrop on every single phone call, fax, or email, anywhere on the planet. It sounds like science fiction, but it's true. The network, known as Echelon, traces its roots all the way back to the John F. Kennedy presidency, and had been expanding ever since. 101 In 1992, the director of the NSA described the goal of the program in simple terms, global access. 102 The agenda for mass surveillance was institutionalized long before most Americans recognize. Then there was George Bush's illegal warrantless wire tapping. Began in 2001, the program allowed the NSA to monitor communications between United States citizens and those abroad without appropriate checks and balances. 103 Interestingly, the groundwork for warrantless wiretapping had actually been laid out by Bill Clinton. 104 During his presidency, he slowly expanded the reach of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, 
and the capability of the NSA to classify and withhold information about their activities. When the revelations about the program were made in 2006 they were controversial, but Congress repeatedly renewed the NSA's license without much of an uproar from the public. By the 2008 election, citizens were growing weary of the spying program and Barack Obama capitalized on this sentiment. He vowed to end warrantless wiretapping and during his primary campaign he went as far as to say he would filibuster the extension of the FISA legislation, responsible for allowing the expanded spying capabilities. 105 When I'm president, one of the first things I'm going to do is call in my attorney general and say to him or her, I want you to review every executive order that was issued by George Bush, whether it relates to warrantless wiretaps or detaining people or reading emails, or whatever it is. I want you to go through every single one of them and if they are unconstitutional, if they're encroaching on civil liberties unnecessarily, we are going to overturn them. We're going to change them. Barack Obama, 2007 106 He first broke this promise after winning the primary campaign, in July 2008, when he was one of 68 senators who voted to renew the NSA capabilities. 107 Less than a year later, Barack Obama would vastly broaden the legal argument the executive branch used to justify the spying, and exempted the government from the possibility of being sued thanks to a liberal interpretation of a clause in the Patriot Act. 108 In other words, beyond even the outrageously broad state secrets privilege invented by the Bush administration and now embraced fully by the Obama administration, the Obama DOJ has now invented a brand new claim of government immunity, one which literally asserts that the U.S. government is free to intercept all of your communications, calls, emails and the like, and even if what they're doing is blatantly illegal and they know it's illegal you are barred from suing them unless they willfully disclose to the public what they have learned. Glenn Greenwald on June 6, 2013, it was revealed that Barack Obama oversaw the largest infringement of the Fourth Amendment in the history of the United States with the construction of a veritable surveillance state, capable of tracking the movements and communications of every American citizen. We now know that the NSA and United Kingdom counterpart GHCQ collect the domestic metadata of both parties in a phone call. 109 set up fake internet cafes to steal data. 110 has intercepted the phone calls of at least 35 world leaders, including allies such as German Chancellor Angela Merkel. 111 can tap into the underwater fiber optic cables that carry a majority of the world's internet traffic. 112 tracks communications within media institutions such as Al Jazeera. 113 has bugged the United Nations headquarters. 114 has set up a financial database to track international banking and credit card transactions. 115 collects and stores over 200 million domestic and foreign text messages each day. 116 collects and has real-time access to browsing history, email, and social media activity. To gain access, an analyst simply needs to fill out an on-screen form with a broad justification for the search that is not reviewed by any court or NSA personnel. 117 I, sitting at my desk, could wiretap anyone, from you or your accountant, to a federal judge or even the president, if I had a personal email. Edward Snowden creates maps of the social networks of United States citizens. 118 has access to smartphone app data. 119 uses spies in embassies to collect data, often by setting up listening stations on the roofs of buildings. 120 uses fake LinkedIn profiles and other doctored web pages to secretly install surveillance software in unwitting companies and individuals. 121 tracks reservations at upscale hotels. 122 has intercepted the talking points of world leaders before meetings with Barack Obama. 123 can crack encryption codes on cell phones. 124 has implanted software on over 100,000 computers worldwide allowing them to hack data without internet connection, using radio waves. 125 has access to computers through fake wireless connections. 
126 monitors communications in online games such as World of Warcraft. 127 intercepts shipping deliveries and install backdoor devices allowing access. 128 has direct access to the data centers of Google, Yahoo, and other major companies. 129 covertly and overtly infiltrate United States and foreign IT industries to weaken or gain access to encryption, often by collaborating with software companies and Internet service providers themselves. They are also, according to an internal document, responsible for identifying, recruiting, and running covert agents in the global telecommunications industry 130. The use of honey traps, luring targets into compromising positions using sex. 131 The sharing of raw intelligence data with Israel. Only official U.S. communications are affected, and there are no legal limits on the use of the data from Israel. 132 spies on porn habits of activists to discredit them. 133 Possibly the most shocking revelation was made on February 24, 2014. Internal documents show that the NSA is attempting to manipulate and control online discourse with extreme tactics of deception and reputation destruction. 134 The documents revealed a top secret unit known as the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Unit or JTRIG. Two of the core self-identified purposes of JTRIG are to inject all sorts of false material onto the Internet in an effort to discredit a target, and to use social sciences such as psychology to manipulate online discourse and activism in order to generate a desirable outcome. The unit posts false information on the Internet and falsely attributes it to someone else, pretend to be a victim of a target they want to discredit, and posts negative information on various forums. In some instances, to discredit a target, JTRIG sends out false flag emails to family and friends. One slide describes the methods to discredit a company, leak confidential information to the press, post negative information on forums, interfere with business deals and ruin business relationships. The use of psychological techniques to fracture activist groups and to game online discourse is very interesting. One document describes creating tension in a group by exploiting personal power, pre-existing cleavages, and minor ideological differences. In online discourse, another document describes how to use mirroring of language cues, expressions, and emotions, and the adjustment of speech, patterns, and language to manipulate opinion. Consider the words of former NSA employee turned whistleblower Russ Tice. Okay. They went after and I know this because I had my hands literally on the paperwork for these sort of things, they went after high-ranking military officers, they went after members of Congress, both Senate and the House, especially on the Intelligence Committees and on the Armed Services Committees and some of the, and Judicial. But they went after other ones, too. They went after lawyers and law firms. All kinds of, heaps of lawyers and law firms. They went after judges. One of the judges is now sitting on the Supreme Court that I had his wiretap information in my hand. Two are former FISA court judges. They went after State Department officials. 37. They went after people in the executive service that were part of the White House, their own people. They went after anti-war groups. They went after U.S. International, U.S. Companies that that do international business, you know, business around the world. They went after U.S. banking firms and financial firms that do international business. They went after NGOs that, like the Red Cross, people like that that go overseas and do humanitarian work. They went after a few anti-war civil rights groups. So, you know, don't tell me that there's no abuse, because I've had this stuff in my hand and looked at it. And in some cases, I literally was involved in the technology that was going after this stuff. And you know, when I said to former MSNBC show host Keith Olbermann, I said, my particular thing is high tech and you know, what's going on is the other thing, which is the dragnet. The dragnet is what Mark Klein is talking about, the terrestrial dragnet. Well my specialty is outer space. I deal with satellites and everything that goes in and out of space. 
I did my spying via space. So that's how I found out about this. And remember we talked about that before, that I was worried that the intelligence community now has sway over what is going on. Now here's the big one. I haven't given you any names. This was a summer of 2004. One of the papers that I held in my hand was to wiretap a bunch of numbers associated with, with a 40. 38. Something year old wannabe senator from Illinois. You wouldn't happen to know where that guy lives right now, would you? It's a big White House in Washington, D.C. That's who they went after. And that's the President of the United States now. Russ Tice, NSA whistleblower 135, emphasis added, on March 5, 2014, it was revealed that the CIA, with the knowledge of Barack Obama, spied on members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, the group tasked with overseeing clandestine agency activities and preventing abuses. 136 The implications are complete subversion of oversight on domestic spying. Collectively, the evidence of the burgeoning security state under Barack Obama reveals a global information grid with real-time access that targets both domestic citizens and lawmakers in addition to foreign people and governments. Asterisk 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 asterisk. War. It is another common misconception that during Republican presidencies we have periods of war, and during Democratic presidencies we have periods of peace. Of official wars it is certainly the case that the Gulf War, Afghanistan, and Iraq War were begun by H.W. and W. Bush. Though it is important to quantify official because there has not been a true declaration of war since World War II. After all, Bill Clinton dropped bombs on no less than four sovereign countries, Iraq, Serbia, Afghanistan, and Sudan. 39. America Soiled History the full-force economic sanctions against Iraq that began with the first Gulf War and ended after Saddam's fall in 2003. The sanctions killed 567,000 children according to the British Medical Society's Lancet. 137, later studies have argued the number 350,000 children to be more accurate. The total number of deaths including adults is thought to be much higher. United Nations Ambassador Madeleine Albright, when asked about these numbers, coldly stated the price is worth it. This statement truly illuminates the attitude of those who set the agenda, cold indifference to life on the grand chessboard of geopolitics. Obama's first major act of war was a no-fly zone over Libya which resulted in the removal of Muammar Gaddafi. The media had a well-orchestrated propaganda campaign that garnered significant public support. His second major act of war was the arming of Syrian rebels, undoubtedly prolonging the horrific civil war. Some of the groups that form the opposition are terrorist organizations, which mirrors the policies of Carter and Reagan arming terrorist groups in Afghanistan under Operation Cyclone. 138 But the true depths of Obama's warmongering resides in his constant and silent drone war. A policy that started under W. Bush, Obama has expanded the use of drones extensively. He has allowed the usage of signature strikes, whereby drone operators bomb people they do not know, based on movements they find suspicious. 139 Worst of all is the policy of double T and hell papping, bombing the same scene twice after rescuers have come to try their fellow citizens. 140 Obama's drones have even bombed funerals. 141 While the death toll of the drone war may not be as high as the conventional wars of the Bush family, the moral depravity certainly gives them a run for their money. The argument that drones are an alternative method to direct personnel involvement leaves out these cold facts. It is important to note the presence of blowback, the concept that bombing funerals and responders to attacks will create a whole new generation of terrorists. It is almost a forbidden word in the mainstream media. For example, Ron Paul was ridiculed by pundits across the political spectrum on cable television when he insisted that blowback was a reality. While they deny it in public, many groups secretly relish the idea that their intangible enemy will only grow stronger while their profits grow larger. Drones are helping usher in the era of endless war. Another aspect of Barack Obama's capacity to wage war lies in his secretive kill list, 
which is a collection of singled out individuals deemed to pose a threat to the United States and have been selected for targeted killing. 142 The list is known to include American citizens such as Anwar al Alwaki, raising serious questions regarding human rights and legality. 143 Asterisk 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 Private military and intelligence contractors It has always been hard to tell exactly how many private contractors are employed by the federal government, and how many of those are under the umbrella of the defense industry. It was under Reagan that the Pentagon's privatization agenda began, and it has continued ever since. An NYU study on the size of government shows that the use of private contractors increased under the Clinton administration by about 25%. 144 It is known that Clinton hired KBR, at the time owned by Halliburton, to build military bases and support troops in Kosovo. 145 It was under the administration of George W. Bush, with the Iraq War, when the use of private contractors skyrocketed. By 2008, the number of private contractors in use in Iraq was 155,000, more than the number of troops, a degree of privatization unprecedented in modern warfare. 146 The public became acquainted with the likes of Blackwater under the Bush administration, with events such as the unprovoked massacres in Baghdad and Fallujah. 147 During his campaign, Obama promised to cut federal spending on private contractors. 148 It soon became clear, however, that much of the stimulus money would go straight to their pockets. His Afghanistan surge was primarily accomplished through contractors, which made up half of the military forces in the country by 2009. 149 The total number of contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan quickly reached 250,000. 150 Security contractors, e.g. private military forces, increased by over 400% under Obama and represent a quarter of all contractors employed by the Pentagon. 151 The most shocking use of contractors has only recently been revealed. It turns out that they represent a significant amount of the NSA workforce. 483,000 people are employed by private contractors that work with the NSA and have top secret access. 152 The potential for illicit spying and extortion represented by these numbers is so high as to reach certainty. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Renditions. The CIA has an official policy of rendition, where they send suspected terrorists to be interrogated in foreign countries, bypassing United States torture laws. The process was used extensively during George W. Bush's administration. But did you know that the process began under Clinton? This PBS Frontline report confirms that the rendition process began in 1995. 153 In 2007, Obama wrote an article in the Foreign Affairs Journal stating, To build a better, freer world, we must first behave in ways that reflect the decency and aspirations of the American people. This means ending the practices of shipping away prisoners in the dead of night to be tortured in far-off countries, of detaining thousands without charge or trial, of maintaining a network of secret prisons to jail people beyond the reach of the law. 154 Yet by 2013 it has become clear that the process of rendition has continued. The Washington Post has reported that the Obama administration has embraced rendition and has consistently resisted lawmakers' efforts to reform the policy. 155. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Police militarization. Under President Bill Clinton, a provision was added to the Defense Appropriations Bill that allowed the Pentagon to transfer unused military assets to local police departments around the country. 156 The program continued through President Bush and has been expanding throughout the Obama presidency. Fiscal year 11 has been a historic year for the program. We reutilized more than $500 million, that is million with an M, worth of property in FI 11. This passes the previous mark by several hundred million dollars. 
Disposition Services 157 The equipment gifted to police departments range from assault rifles and bayonets to massive vehicles such as the MRAP, which stands for Mine Resistant Ambush Protected, of which 500 municipalities received for free from the Department of Defense in 2013. 158 There is also the troubling trend of the growth of asset forfeiture, the process by which, having granted itself the power to do so, the government seizes any cash, cars, property and more it can reasonably connect to a crime. This ability incentives sending out specialized, militarized police such as SWAT teams to serve drug warrants, as the teams themselves are expensive to maintain. This program started long before the Obama presidency, but recently it has swelled, with the Justice Department Forfeiture Fund reaching $1.8 billion in 2011, with nearly half of a billion being returned to the local police departments that led the raid. 159. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Globalization. A key process in globalization involves removing national sovereignty in favor of trade agreements that favor the rights of corporations. Bill Clinton championed the NAFTA agreement, which among other issues superseded articles in the Mexican Constitution, water rights in Canada, and allows corporations to sue nations when they are in violation of the Trade Act. 160 Regardless of your opinion on NAFTA and other trade agreements, Obama has taken the concept of corporate power over national sovereignty to a whole new mind-blowing level with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, a trade proposal that only recently became public knowledge when the documents were leaked, check the footnote to read the whole document. 161 Why the secrecy? The TPP agreement would bestow radical new powers on corporations, including establishing an international tribunal that would override domestic law and would have the power to issue sanctions against governments for failing to abide by their ruling. The TPP runs contrary to Obama's statement during his 2008 presidential campaign. We will not negotiate bilateral trade agreements that stop the government from protecting the environment, food safety, or the health of its citizens, give greater rights to foreign investors than services, or prevent developing country governments from adopting humanitarian licensing policies to improve access to life-saving medications. 162 Congressman Alan Grayson summed it up nicely, it's all about tying the hands of democratically elected governments, and shunting authority over to the non-elected for the benefit of multinational corporations. It's an assault on democratic government. 163 The TPP has what is called an investor state dispute settlement mechanism which allow companies and investors to sue governments for losses of profits due to the government's policies. 164 The deliberations would be undertaken by an international group of corporate lawyers and threatens to overrule democracies and threaten our legal rights. It is not an exaggeration to say that in many instances this agreement gives more power to corporations than governments. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conclusion. The one-party state is the result of special interests, economic and military intelligence having gained a strong enough foothold in Washington to subvert the political process. The saying that power is in guns and money has never been truer. The corruption has been heavily and cleverly obfuscated behind a wall of relentless partisan rhetoric that magnify the small differences between presidential candidates. Consider the major initiatives of the Obama presidency. His Affordable Care Act has 46 been championed as a bastion of liberal reform, but in reality it is simply forcing Americans to purchase health plans from private corporations. His raising of the top tax bracket is proffered as proof of a liberal agenda, however the tax burden is still squarely on the middle class. In addition, the wealthiest Americans are virtually unaffected, as their wealth resides in assets and investments, not income. We are left with a platform that is nearly indistinguishable from his predecessors, from which Obama promised significant change. When George Bush bombs a foreign country, liberals cry foul and protest in droves. When Obama does the same thing, the previous protesters become supporters of the policy. The same phenomenon can be seen on the other side of the aisle. Conservatives are quick to criticize the expansion of programs under Democratic presidents, 
but stand silent while Reagan and the Bush family oversaw many of the largest expansions of the federal government and budget in the history of the United States. It should be clear after even a cursory inspection of the legacies of presidencies from the last 30 years that there is very little tangible differences between the two parties. The shockingly establishment-oriented agenda of Barack Obama ought to be waking up millions of people to this truth. Can we work within the system to change the one-party state? How do we approach the 2016 elections knowing that there are no real alternatives to be found within the two parties? Even candidates with exceptionally favorable rhetoric cannot be trusted to translate their platform into actual policies. It is possible to dismiss the previous two chapters as a result of market forces, that endless war and the one-party state are the result of uncoordinated actors in a free market. Even if this was the case, the implications and subsequent need for reform would be tremendous. The result can accurately be described as the dirty F-word, fascism. I understand that there will be a lot who disagree with this designation, I argue that the term 47 has many different meanings and many prominent people have used it in different ways. If you feel that another term best describes the phenomenon, that is okay, ultimately it is not important what semantics we apply. Fascism, or whichever term you prefer, is appropriate because the system has evolved into collusion between the military and economic entities to mutually ensure each other's entrenchment. It has grown out of control, and perhaps no evidence is stronger than the fact that the media absolutely refuses to indicate something might be wrong, as they have been enveloped by the system. Food for thought. 1. What is responsible for the massive disconnect between lack of differences between presidential candidates and the vitriolic rhetoric in the media and on Capitol Hill? 2. Why has Barack Obama reversed his position on so much of his campaign platform? 3. What forces are the driving factors in the constant overseas military and economic hegemony? 4. Who is driving the creation of agreements such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership and where does the order of secrecy come from? 5. Which covered institutions could be influencing the policy of elected officials? 48. Psychopathy, power and politics There is no such thing, in the psychopathic universe, as the merely weak. Whoever is weak is also a sucker, that is, someone who demands to be exploited Psychologist Robert Reber 165 Psychopathy What exactly does the word mean? Entertainment media bombards us with a particular version of the psychopath, one that is irrational, dangerous, and violent. Someone who doesn't fit in, who just doesn't seem right. Is this an accurate description? Dr. Robert D. Hare, an eminent psychologist on the subject of psychopathy, portrays the disorder in a drastically different light. In his book Without Conscience, he describes psychopaths as being conscienceless yet rational, not suffering from any insanity or debilitation, instead they are logical, manipulative, predisposed to crime, selfish and without guilt, shame, remorse, or empathy. 166 In other words, these men and women are not mentally ill in the sense that we traditionally imagine. Psychopathy is surely an illness, but it is not a neurosis that will manifest symptoms others can easily perceive. Often, the psychopath will be aware of his condition and completely conceal his aberrant traits. In Without Conscience, Dr. Hare presents numerous case studies and statistics to 165 profess illuminate the world of the psychopath, the evidence points towards a world full of people programmed for evil. Dr. Hare stresses multiple times that the psychopath is someone who has a strong desire for power and the need to manipulate others, not for personal gain but simply for the sake of manipulation. While some psychopaths are erratic, others have the ability to completely conceal their condition behind a carefully constructed social persona. Dr. Hare's list of psychopathic personality traits include displaying glibness and superficial charm being in constant need of stimulation and prone to excessive boredom acting in a conning or manipulative way showing shallow emotional responses acting out promiscuous sexual behavior behaving irresponsibly avoiding long-term relationships feeling a grandiose sense of self-worth lying repeatedly without remorse lacking any remorse or guilt. 50. 
lacking empathy for others having poor behavioral controls displaying behavioral problems early on in life behaving impulsively failing to accept responsibility for actions displaying signs criminal diversity Dr. Hare's predecessor Harvey Cleckley, perhaps the first psychologist to study the psychopathic phenomenon decades earlier, compiled a similar list. Superficial charm and average intelligence. Absence of delusions and other signs of irrational thinking. Absence of nervousness or neurotic manifestations. Unreliability. Untruthfulness and insincerity. Lack of remorse or shame. Antisocial behavior without apparent compunction. 51. Poor judgment and failure to learn from experience. Pathological egocentricity and incapacity to love. General poverty in major affective reactions. Specific loss of insight. Unresponsiveness in general interpersonal relations. Fantastic and uninviting behavior with drink, and sometimes without. Sex life impersonal, trivial, and poorly integrated. Most of the case studies Dr. Hare presents in his book are from the prison population and anecdotal accounts from those who have been abused. This is a natural, structural problem in the study of psychopathy, the study is limited for the most part to the unsuccessful psychopath, those who could not conceal their traits or whose social circumstances led to blue-collar crime. Yet Dr. Hare also spends some significant time devoted to the subdeviant criminal, the psychopath who has control over his deviance and the ability to hide it from the populace. Instead of the petty criminal, these men and women occupy positions in business, government, industry, and law. Their condition goes entirely unnoticed by the populace, their employers, peers, even their family and those who love them are fooled. How can such deception be possible? Consider that psychopathy is not an acquired. 52. Illness. Instead, it has strong genetic components and manifests itself in early childhood. 167 168 169 170 From an early age, the psychopath recognizes that to fit into society in any manner they need to develop to ability to lie extensively. Over time, they become exceptionally good at it. Their entire public persona becomes one complex act, a web of lies to hide their deviant personality. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Sadism. A recent series of studies published in Psychological Science highlights the pleasure that persons with psychopathic tendencies derive from abusing others, by revealing that certain people will often take great pleasure in sadistic behavior suggesting that in these subjects there is an intrinsic motivation to inflict suffering on innocent others, even at a personal cost. 171 in one experiment, researcher Aaron Buckles, from the University of British Columbia, found that there is a certain subset of people who chose to intensify the discomfort of others through directed white noise once they found that there would be no consequences for their actions. They were also willing to expend extra time and energy to be able to amplify the discomfort they were causing their opponent. Some find it hard to reconcile sadism with the concept of normal psychological functioning, but our findings show that sadistic tendencies among otherwise well-adjusted people must be acknowledged, Aaron Buckles, emphasis added, the researchers hope that these new findings will help to broaden people's view of sadism as an aspect of personality that manifests in everyday life helping to dispel the notion that sadism is limited to sexual deviance and criminals, association for psychological science Erin Buckles concludes that her research may offer valuable insights into domestic abuse, animal abuse, and military and police brutality, through the understanding that disposition to sadism and abuse is a personality trait that manifests itself in everyday life. The true insights which can be derived from her work and those of other psychopathy researchers go much deeper than police brutality, they shed much needed light on the widespread relationship between evil and power. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Secondary psychopathy. 54. Understanding the nature of psychopathy does not reveal the full picture. Numerous researchers have differentiated between primary psychopathy, that which is genetic, and secondary psychopathy, that which is acquired through environment. 
172, 173, 174 Unlike the primary psychopath, who is born with their condition and lacks entirely the capacity for empathy and other higher human emotions, the secondary psychopath occasionally manifests these traits. In other words, non-psychopathic individuals can exhibit psychopathic behaviors through the conditioning of their environment. Two well-known studies in psychology underscore this. The first is the Milgram experiment. A volunteer would be placed at a booth with an apparatus that sends an electric shock to a person in another room. The volunteer believes the man in the other room is a fellow volunteer, in reality he is an actor that is not actually receiving electric shocks. The volunteer asks the actor a series of questions, a wrong answer means the use of an increasingly high voltage of shocking. The volunteer would be prompted by a man in a lab coat to continue administering the shocks long after it had become unsafe. The verbal prodding would range between please continue and you have no other choice, you must continue. After the shock reached 300 volts, the actor would stop answering, but the man in the lab coat would continue insisting on shocks. Dr. Stanley Milgram repeatedly found that nearly 2-3 RDS of people would continue to the maximum voltage of 450, long after they had believed their peer to be incapacitated. Regarding the experiment, Milgram wrote, Ordinary people, simply doing their jobs, and without any particular hostility on their part, can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Moreover, even when the destructive effects of their work become patently clear, and they are asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality, relatively few people have the resources needed to resist authority. The second experiment is the Stanford Prison Experiment. Volunteers were asked to simulate a prison in Stanford Psychology Hall, half of the participants simulated prisoners and the other half guards. The guards were told to make the prisoners feel powerless though not resort to violence. Zimbardo, the lead experimenter, found that many of the guards stepped far beyond the boundaries of what had been predicted, leading to dangerous and psychologically damaging situations. A third of the guards had displayed genuine sadistic tendencies. Some prisoners were emotionally traumatized and had to leave the experiment early. Zimbardo argued that his experiment shows that people internalize authority and submission. Though the nature of the Stanford prison experiment does not lend itself to empiricism, it does give some credence to the idea that power corrupts and changes people. Furthermore, an experiment published in August 2012 by the Journal of Experimental Psychology showed definite psychological changes associated with power. It found that people who considered themselves in positions of power literally perceived the we would like to think that humanity has evolved since these experiments took place, and since the atrocities that were revealed after World War II. Unfortunately, this is not the case. In 2008, the Stanley Milgram study was reproduced, with only slight alterations to conform to modern ethical standards, and found the exact same results a vast majority of participants were willing to inflict significant pain on another human if pressured to do so by perceived authority. 176 We do not need to rely on psychological studies to see the power of perceived authority causing abuses, we have tangible evidence of the relationship emerging frequently from the war on terror. Most recently, it was revealed that the CIA made doctors and psychologists working at various Department of Defense institutions violate the ethical codes of their profession in order to become involved with the torture and degrading treatment of terror suspects. 177 medical professionals were in effect told that their ethical mantra of first do no harm did not apply, because they were not treating people who were ill. The Guardian the report, compiled by the Task Force on Preserving Medical Professionalism in National Security Detention Centers, supported by the Institute on Medicine as a Profession, IMAP, found that doctors working with the Department of Defense and CIA routinely participated in waterboarding, sleep deprivation and force feeding, the latter being against the rules of World Medical Association and the American Medical Association, while gathering and sharing intelligence. Its physicians to follow professional ethical expectations is firm regardless of where they serve. It's clear that in the name of national security the military trumped that covenant, 
and physicians were transformed into agents of the military and performed acts that were contrary to medical ethics and practice. We have a responsibility to make sure this never happens again. Dr. Gerald Thompson, Professor of Medicine Emeritus at Columbia University and member of the task force. While participation in waterboarding and force feeding may not be shocking to the desensitized public sensibilities, it is still very revealing that physicians and psychologists who would otherwise balk at the suggestion that they would violate their profession's ethical codes, do so without hesitation when it is done in the name of war. And after all, the United States did sentence Japanese war criminals to death for the act of waterboarding during the International Military Tribunal for the Far East following World War II. 178 Armed with this context, it is easy to understand the ease with which psychopaths can manipulate institutions and societies. A majority of people do not even have the psychological capacity to refuse authority, at least under situations of pressure. Putting the average citizen in positions of minor authority such as a police officer can cause behavioral and physiological changes in that person, disposing them to abuse. Therefore a psychopath in a position of power essentially has a vast pool of tools at their disposal to act out their twisted desires of manipulation and control. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The pathocracy. Psychopathy is not a rare phenomenon, Dr. Hare estimates that psychopaths consist of 1% of the population, other psychologists have estimates as high as 4%. 179 that represents between 3 and 12 million Americans, millions of which are the subdeviant criminals of Dr. Hare's lexicon, residing in positions of power with a psychological need to control and manipulate others. They are drawn to certain occupations that allow them to wield power over others, such as police, military, intelligence, and finance. Over time, they begin to saturate important institutions, being more ruthless and willing to cause more destruction in their rise up the ladder of power than their competition. In the exact same manner that you and I naturally exclude deviants from our social groups, psychopaths naturally exclude those of us who allow conscience and morality to influence our decisions and perceptions. The result is a web of mutual conditioning of evil, where goals and actions become increasingly removed from the institution's original intention. This process has been occurring for centuries in banks, clandestine agencies, military, police departments, and governments, in nearly every instance hiding behind rhetoric and ideology that masks their true nature. The rise of this process over decades results in a phenomenon known as pathocracy. Pathocracy, N. A system of government created by a small pathological minority that takes control over a society. 180 pathocracies have existed throughout history and many exist in the present. Unfortunately, there is a considerable amount of evidence that the United States has evolved into such a system of government, where clandestine and financial institutions saturated with psychopaths have gained enough influence to subvert the democratic process. Their rise to power coincided with the draping of a veil over their existence, through powerful propaganda and subtlety in action. This book is the history of the modern American psychopath in a position of power, and the goal is to lift the veil. 60. Operation Paperclip What you were made to feel was that the country was in desperate peril and we had to do whatever it took to save it. Hugh Cunningham, CIA official 181 As the Western theater of World War II came to a close, there was a mad rush between the Soviet Union and the United States to be the first army to enter and secure Germany. It was not for consideration of land, that would be meted out later during the Yalta and Potsdam conferences. Nor was it to capture the Nazi leadership and bring them to trial for their heinous crimes against humanity. In fact, the goal was the opposite. The rush to secure Germany was much more about securing Germany's infrastructure, their leadership and the best minds in intelligence, science and industry. NationalArchives.gov hosts a list of over 1,500 Nazis that were transferred into America, many of them rampant war criminals. 182 It has been released to the public only recently thanks to the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. 
The project that oversaw this endeavor is known as Operation Paperclip and was undertaken by the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA. President Harry Truman formally ordered the operation in August 1945, but it had covertly began months earlier, in May. Truman's orders expressly forbid the transfer of any person known to have been a member of the Nazi Party, and more than a nominal participant in its activities, or an active supporter of Nazi militarism. 183 This directive was not followed, for it would have prevented the acquisition of a lot of prominent Nazis such as Arthur Rudolph, who endorsed the usage of slave labor from concentration camps for the building of the V-2 rocket 184 and later became a prominent figure in NASA. 185 more people would die building the V-2 rocket a number estimated at 60,000 than were killed by it in combat. 186 The dossiers of prominent Nazis brought into the United States such as Wernher von Braun cannot be found on the National Archives sheet, we can conclude that either identities were faked and whitewashed during the process, or the 1,500 names is an incomplete tally. Regardless, we can conclude that the order of Truman was not heeded, and many former Nazis became entrenched within the United States science, intelligence and industrial industries, undoubtedly contributing to a web of psychopathic conditioning. There are many interesting profiles of war criminals who found employment in the United States after the war. Krunislav Draganovic, for example, was a Franciscan priest who actively served the Nazi satellite regime in Croatia, where they were responsible for over 350,000 deaths. He also facilitated the escape of numerous Croatian war criminals through the assets of the clergy. After the war, he was hired as a U.S. spy. 187 Kurt Blom was the director of the Nazi biological warfare program and former SS officer. He oversaw nerve gas experimentation on prisoners at Auschwitz, and established the bioweapons research center for Heinrich Himmler. One of his experiments involved 1. Inoculating prisoners with the plague and recording its progression. 188 He was hired by the U.S. Army Chemical Corps in 1951 to work on chemical warfare research. 189 The most interesting case study is that of Reinhard Gellin, a major general in the German Wehrmacht, close confidant of Hitler, and head of the German Army Intelligence on the Eastern Front. The OSS found that Gellin's knowledge of the Soviets that he had gained during World War II was so important that not only did they let him keep his job, he was able to maintain a vast majority of his infrastructure. What became known as the Gellin Organization functioned as a semi-autonomous intelligence unit for the United States and West Berlin, and employed over 100 former Gestapo and SS officers. 190 The Gellin Organization was the one group that did have networks inside Eastern Europe, and that is why we hired them. Hiring Gellin was the biggest mistake the US ever made. Our allies said, you are putting Nazis at the senior levels of your intelligence, and they were right. The Gellin organization was the primary source of intelligence that claimed that, the Soviets were about to attack West Germany, that was the biggest bunch of baloney then and it is still a bunch of baloney today. Gellin had to make his money by creating a threat that we were afraid of, so we would give him more money to tell us about it. In my opinion, the Gellin organization provided nothing worthwhile for understanding or estimating Soviet military or political capabilities in Eastern Europe or anywhere else. The Gellin organization had been penetrated by Soviet intelligence and many of the US Nazi assets were now double agents, taking CIA wages and turning around and selling information to the enemy. Victor Marchetti, CIA veteran and former chief of Soviet strategic war plans 191 The lack of internal security in the Gellin organization was egregious. One former Army Counterintelligence Corps officer lamented. Recruiting methods then employed were so loose that former German officers and non-coms were blindly being approached to work for American intelligence in espionage activity directed against the USSR. 192 Not only did this mean that the Gellin organization became saturated with radical Nazis and other fascist elements, it also served as an easy entry of infiltration by the Soviet Union. 
the organization functioned semi-autonomously so strict controls over their operations was impossible. The Soviet press did not hesitate to use the Gelen organization as an effective was responsible for a long series of crimes against humanity along the eastern front of the war. Future director of Central Intelligence Richard Helm stated that the reports in the Soviet-dominated press in Germany concerning the use of former German staff and intelligence is such that there is no question that the Russians know this operation is going on even though they got some of the details wrong. Certainly the fact that so much publicity has been given to this indicates serious flaws in the operation. 193 One official CIA document titled Forging an Intelligence Partnership, The CIA and the Origins of the BND, 1945-49, noted that the Gelen organization would take CIA assets that they received and then sell them on the black market for more funds. 194 The reference is vague but likely refers to selling arms and ammunition to various underground right-wing elements. Consider this, at the end of the war, the Office of Strategic Services was a small organization of 13,000 members 195, and the Gelen organization consisted of at least 4,000 members by the year 1949. 196 Can we accurately say that United States intelligence absorbed the Nazi infrastructure without considering how much of an influence it had on the beginnings of these clandestine institutions? Further complicity Although the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act has been a wealth of information regarding the early relationships between the CIA and former Nazis, there is still a lot that we do not know. The Central Intelligence Agency is refusing to provide hundreds of thousands of pages of documents sought by a government working group under a 1998 law that requires full disclosure of classified records related to Nazi war criminals, say congressional officials from both parties. New York Times 197 The New York Times article goes on to describe how the CIA has interpreted the Nazi War Crimes Act in an exceptionally narrow fashion, refusing to release many more documents. Historians who have studied the documents made public so far have said that at least five associates of the Nazi leader Adolf Eichmann, the architect of Hitler's campaign to exterminate Jews, had worked for the CIA. 197 New York Times, C.I.A. Said to rebuff Congress on Nazi files, January 30, 2005. 66. Though we can only speculate, it is possible that some of these suppressed files contain collaboration with other elements who assisted in protecting Nazis during and after the fall of the Third Reich. For example, the Red Cross and the Vatican collaborated to smuggle thousands of war criminals to safety immediately after the fall of Nazi Germany. 198 They used underground passages known as ratlins to keep the men out of sight. The Red Cross issued legitimate travel documents to many Nazi members, it is estimated that over 8,000 SS members ended up in Britain and Canada alone. These revelations shed light on how prominent Nazis such as Adolf Eichmann and Dr. Joseph Menschel were able to escape from Germany and hide from Allied authorities and hide out for decades. Food for thought. 1. What effect did the influx of Nazis have on the agenda of the CIA and other institutions that they inhabited? 2. Why was OSS leadership so interested in providing safety for high-profile Nazis, despite the wishes of the president? 3. Is it possible that the friendly post-war relationship between the Gelen organization and the CIA indicates a form of relationship during and before the war as well? 198. The Guardian, Red Cross and Vatican helped thousands of Nazis to escape, May 25, 2011. 67. For what type of influence has the Gelen organization had on the development of Western Germany? 68. MK Ultra In the 1950s and early 1960s, the agency gave mind-altering drugs to hundreds of unsuspecting Americans in an effort to explore the possibilities of controlling human consciousness. Many of the human guinea pigs were mental patients, prisoners, drug addicts, and prostitutes people who could not fight back, as one agency officer put it. In one case, a mental patient in Kentucky was dosed with LSD continuously for 174 days. New York Times 199 MK Ultra is the codename given to a CIA research operation into biological behavioral engineering, 
also known as mind control. Many people are familiar with the operation but incorrectly assume that it was limited to LSD research. While there were plenty of resources devoted to LSD research, it was only one area of a vast field of mind control operations. MK Ultra researcher Ike Feldman said himself that the LSD, that was just the tip of the iceberg. Espionage. Assassinations. Dirty tricks. Drug experiments. Sexual encounters and the study of prostitutes for clandestine use. That is what I was doing when I worked for George White and the CIA. 200. 69. MK Ultra had several precursors. There was Project Chatter in 1947, which tested drugs such as the infamous Scopalmine during interrogations. 201 There was Project Bluebird in 1949, which began studies into hypnosis. 202 The document describing the initiation of Project Bluebird outlines these special problems, among many others, that they were hoping to address. Can we in a matter of an hour, two hours, one day, etc., induce an hypnotic condition in an unwilling subject to such an extent that he will perform an act for our benefit? Can we create by post-hypnotic control an action contrary to an individual's basic moral principles? Can we guarantee total amnesia under any and all conditions? Can we alter a person's personality? How long will it hold? Can we devise a system for making unwilling subjects into willing agents and then transfer that control to untrained agency agents in the field by use of codes or identifying signs or credentials? 203 Project Artichoke began in 1951, with the scope of Can we get control of an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against fundamental laws of nature, such as self-preservation? 204 All of the above projects were shuttled into MK Ultra in 1953, under the Technical Services Division, combining over 150 sub-projects 205, undertaken at over 80 institutions 206 such as universities, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies. Many of the projects were covertly ran through front organizations without the knowledge of the institution that hosted them. The experiments and operations under MKUltra have been shrouded in extreme secrecy. When it was enacted, then-CIA Director Alan Dulles exempted the program from normal financial controls, allowed the technical services staff to begin experiments without contracts or written agreements with leadership, and ordered the financial office to pay any cost blindly on the signature of Sidney Gottlieb. 207 CIA document 17748 states that There are just two individuals in TSD who have full substantial knowledge of the program and most of that knowledge is unrecorded. Both are highly skilled, highly motivated, professionally competent individuals. Part of their competence lies in their command of intelligence tradecraft. In protecting the sensitive nature of the American intelligence capability to manipulate human behavior, they apply need-to-know doctrine to their professional associates and their clerical assistants to a maximum degree. TSD has pursued a policy of minimum documentation in keeping with the high sensitivity of some of the projects. The lack of consistent records precludes use of routine inspection procedures and raised a variety of questions regarding management and fiscal controls. 208 The two individuals the document refers to are likely Sidney Gottlieb, the director of MK Ultra, and Richard Helms, the deputy director of the CIA. In 1973, when Richard Helms became the director of the CIA, he ordered all of the available MK Ultra files to be destroyed. 209 Thanks to a clerical error, about 20,000 files survived the destruction order. However, not only were most of the files destroyed, but many experiments were so sensitive that they were never recorded in the first place, so we must understand that as brutal and astonishing as the recorded experimentation is, we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Another file, MK Ultra Document 87624, states. 6% of the projects are of such an ultra-sensitive nature that they cannot and should not be handled by means of contracts which would associate CIA or the government with the work in question. 
This 6% of the current research effort now lies entirely within two well-defined fields of endeavor. As present this results in ridiculous contracts, often with cutouts, which do not spell out the scope or intent of the work. 210 The first well-defined field of endeavor described by the document is developing the capability of biological and chemical weapons for the purpose of mind control. The second field of endeavor is entirely redacted from the document. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Ewan Cameron. Dr. Ewan Cameron was a Scottish-born psychiatrist who worked in the United States since World War II and subsequently accepted an invitation to contract for the CIA. He would commute to the McGill University system in Canada to conduct experiments on brainwashing, psychic driving and other forms of psychological torture. Cameron had a theory that a person with a psychological illness such as schizophrenia would benefit from having their brain essentially wiped clean, presuming the patient would redevelop their cognitive functions without the disorder. The CIA felt that brainwashing had obvious 210 document available here. 73. Intelligence Applications 211 Dr. Cameron had a depatering program he used to erase the minds of his patients that began with 15 to 30 days of sleep therapy, sometimes lasting as long as 65 days, where the patient would sleep all day and night, with the exception of three brief periods where a sleep-inducing drug cocktail and electroshock therapy would be administered. Cameron's electroshock therapy has been documented to be between 20 to 40 times more intense than the professional standard at the time. Instead of 110 volts at a fraction of a second, Cameron used 150 volts for an initial shock lasting one full second, and then between 5 and 9 additional shocks during the convulsions of the patient, using a muscle relaxant to prevent permanent damage. The next step was to play taped messages to a patient 16 hours a day for multiple months in an attempt to program the desired behavior. 212 Over half of his patients have suffered permanent amnesia of their lives before their depatering. They were not told that they would be participating in experiments prior to their admittance. A large group of Cameron's victims brought a lawsuit against the CIA in 1988 which was settled out of court, so the agency would not have to admit any official wrongdoing. Why the interest in electroshock? CIA document 190885 reveals that the CIA was interested in the guaranteed amnesia that electric shock often resulted in. 213. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Front organizations The CIA used a front organization called the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology to help pay for the work of Dr. Cameron, a psychiatrist who directed the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal. Dr. Cameron died in 1967. The money was provided to Dr. Cameron as part of the C.I.A.S. effort in the 1950s and 60s to develop drugs or techniques that could control human behavior. Patients of Dr. Cameron were subjected to a regimen that included heavy doses of LSD and barbiturates, the application of powerful electric shocks two or three times a day, and prolonged periods of drug-induced sleep. According to government records, the patients and their relatives were not told they were taking part in experiments. Joseph Raw, another lawyer for the plaintiffs, said many of Dr. Cameron's patients were very greatly damaged by the experiments. New York Times 214 The use of fronts, meaning a private enterprise secretly owned by the CIA to conceal affiliations with the agency, is standard practice and widespread through MKU with Stanford and considered to be relatively prestigious in the field. It would often award cover grants to conceal that the bulk of its research had military intelligence applications. 215. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Unwitting testing. The CIA had an official policy of terminal experiments, which essentially meant surreptitious administration of drugs to discover how subjects would react when they were not aware they were being experimented on. The justification was that it was the only way to truly discover the reactions of the mind under stress and exposed to various mind control chemicals. The policy was upheld even after it led to deaths. One high-profile fatality was that of Dr. Frank Olson, a scientist from the Army Chemical Corps Special Operations Division. 
During a joint Army-CIA gathering at Deep Creek Lodge in the woods of Northern Maryland, Sidney Gottlieb added LSD to the drinks of the few men in attendance, and did not inform them until the effects started to begin. Dr. Frank Olson was one of these men, and unlike his peers, he was not able to handle the effects of the psychedelic. His colleagues described his reaction as psychotic. He survived the trip, but entered a deep depression and ended up jumping out a window of the window of a New York hotel a week later. 215 document available here. 76. The death of Dr. Olson prompted an internal review by the CIA of surreptitious testing, but the policy was resumed just a few months later. One CIA document, issued nearly a decade after Olson's death, affirmed the internal consensus of unwitting administration of drugs, officers, argued for the continuation of unwitting testing, using as the principal point that controlled testing cannot be depended upon for accurate results. General Carter, Mr. Kirkpatrick, and I do not disagree with this point. 216 Another aspect of unwitting testing involves experimentation of children. Although most of MK Ultra experiments on minors has been covered up, a New York Times article from 1995 reveals a disturbing glimpse, stating that about 9,000 Americans, including children and newborns, were used in 154 radiation tests sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission, the Energy Department's Cold War predecessor, government officials said today. Some participated with little or no knowledge of risks they faced. 217. Asterisk 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 asterisk. One program uncovered during the internal CIA review by centered around George White, a CIA associate who formally worked for the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. The CIA considered White's position ideal, as it gave him unrestricted access to a variety of drugs without suspicion. Under CIA auspices, George White set up safe houses in New York and later San Francisco, fully equipped with covert video and audio surveillance equipment. The goal was to study the use of prostitutes for covert intelligence. 218 TSS officials wanted to find out everything they could about how to apply sex to spying, and the prostitute project became a general learning and then training ground for CIA carnal operations. After all, states one TSS official, we did quite a study of prostitutes and their behavior. At first nobody really knew how to use them. How do you train them? How do you work them? How do you take a woman who is willing to use her body to get money out of a guy to get things which are much more important, like state secrets? I don't care how beautiful she is educating the ordinary prostitute up to that level is not a simple task. John Marks in addition to studying the use of prostitutes for clandestine use, the safe houses were used to administer drugs to the unwitting solicitors, after which the various effects would be recorded. At least a couple CIA veterans were willing to discuss the use of these safe houses for a more sinister operation, entrapment. John Mark's research of the over 20,000 declassified documents into MKUltra shortly after their release in the mid-70s revealed the following shocking information. Gottlieb did not limit his interest to drugs. He and other TSS officials wanted to try out surveillance equipment. CIA technicians quickly installed see-through mirrors and microphones through which eavesdroppers could film, photograph, and record the action. Things go wrong with listening devices and two-way mirrors, so you build these things to find out what works and what doesn't, says a TSS source. If you are going to entrap, you've got to give the guy pictures flagranti delicto and voice recordings. Once you learn how to do it so that the whole thing looks comfortable, cozy, and safe, then you can transport the technology overseas and use it. This TSS man notes that the agency put to work in the bedrooms of Europe some of the techniques developed in the George White Safe House operation. 219 James Keener, a former CIA psychologist, recalled his involvement in one entrapment case, in which he analyzed a nurse who had offered her body for her country. We wanted her to sleep with this Russian. Either the Russian would fall in love with her and defect, or we'd blackmail him. I had to see if she could sleep with him over a period of time and not get involved emotionally. Boy, was she tough, 220. 
Keener noted that he became disillusioned with entrapment cases, but that other officers got their jollies from this type of work. Regarding his typical assignment, Keener stated, I was sent to deal with the most negative aspects of the human condition. It was planned destructiveness. First, you'd check to see if you could destroy a man's marriage. If you could, then that would be enough to put a lot of stress on the individual, to break him down. Then you might start a minor rumor campaign against him. Harass him constantly. Bump his car in traffic. A lot of it is ridiculous, but it may have a cumulative effect. Knowing that some officers got their jollies from entrapment operations, and that safe houses were installed in the United States, the question were entrapment techniques ever used against United States officials or other domestic people of importance, is logically raised. Personality Assessment Although MK Ultra was originally devoted to biological mind control, it quickly evolved into a program dedicated to understanding all aspects of the human psyche. George White's experiments tested how people reacted to entrapment, and other experiments tested how different types of people responded to alcohol. It is with this context that the CIA contacted psychologist John Gittinger to become an instrumental part of MKUltra. Gittinger had developed the Personality Assessment System, a test which would be administered to give fascinating insights into a person's personality and had distinct variables that separated his work from other known personality tests at the time such as the famous Wessler exam. Like you and Cameron, Gittinger received funding through the Human Ecology Society to research what type of personality would be likely to defect from their country, both to target foreign agents and to weed out domestic ones. At one point, Gittinger traveled to work with George White to use his test on prostitutes and homosexuals to refine his assessment test to figure out what type of sexual orientation someone likely had, and to figure out who had sexually deviant tendencies. One of Gittinger's colleagues stated that he knew of cases where the personality assessment system was used to identify targets for entrapment, both heterosexual and homosexual. 221 One particularly useful application of the personality assessment system was to identify people who would be easily hypnotized. It has likely been used extensively to handpick subjects and employees on sensitive projects within and beyond MKUltra, assessing people's personalities to discover who would retain secrecy and loyalty. Interestingly, Gittinger was familiar enough with his test that he was able to observe someone's behavior and then retroactively apply the attributes to determine their personality type. By observing how a man held his cigarette, handled his alcohol, or interacted with women, Gittinger could profile that person and determine their weaknesses and propensity for exploitation through entrapment or other means. One logical application of the personality assessment system is the ability to assign certain people to a program that required secrecy, by determining how loyal an agent or asset would be to the agency. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Hypnotism. In mainstream culture, hypnotism is viewed as a type of science fiction, confined to the realm of magic tricks and entertainment. The truth is that hypnotism is very real and used both in mainstream psychology and in military intelligence. Hypnotism was used by the United States military before the creation of the CIA. 82. During World War II. Psychologist Dr. George H. Estabrooks recalled his involvement in the clandestine program to Science Digest in 1971, in an article titled Hypnotism Comes of Age. One of the most fascinating but dangerous applications of hypnosis is its use in military intelligence. This is a field with which I am familiar through formulating guidelines for the techniques used by the United States in two world wars. Communication in war is always a headache. Codes can be broken. A professional spy may or may not stay bought. Your own man may have unquestionable loyalty but his judgment is always open to question. The hypnotic courier, on the other hand, provides a unique solution. I was involved in preparing many subjects for this work during World War II. One successful case involved an Army Service Corps captain whom we'll call George Smith. Captain Smith had undergone months of training. He was an excellent subject but did not realize it. I had removed from him, by post-hypnotic suggestion, 
all recollection of ever having been hypnotized. First I had the service corps call the captain to Washington and tell him they needed a report on the mechanical equipment of Division X headquartered in Tokyo. Smith was ordered to leave. 83. By jet next morning, pick up the report and return at once. These orders were given him in the waking state. Consciously, that was all he knew, and it was the story he gave his wife and friends. Then I put him under deep hypnosis, and gave him orally a vital message to be delivered directly on his arrival in Japan to a certain colonel let's say his name was Brown of military intelligence. Outside of myself, Colonel Brown was the only person who could hypnotize Captain Smith. This is locking. I performed it by saying to the hypnotized captain, until further orders from me, only Colonel Brown and I can hypnotize you. We will use the signal phrase the moon is clear. Whenever you hear this phrase from Brown or myself you will pass instantly into deep hypnosis. When Captain Smith reawakened, he had no conscious memory of what happened in trance. All that he was aware of was that he must head for Tokyo to pick up the division report. On arrival there, Smith reported to Brown, who hypnotized him with the signal phrase. Under hypnosis, Smith delivered my message and received one to bring back. Awakened, he was given the division report and returned home by jet. There I hypnotized him once more with the signal phrase, and he spieled off Brown's answer that had been dutifully tucked away in his unconscious mind. The system is virtually foolproof. As exemplified by the case, the 84. Information literally was locked in Smith's unconscious for retrieval by the only two people who knew the combination. The subject had no conscious memory of what happened, so couldn't spill the beans. No one else could hypnotize him even if they might know the signal phrase. The potential for military intelligence has been nightmarish. During World War II, one worked this technique with a vulnerable Marine Lieutenant I'll call Jones. Under the watchful eye of Marine Intelligence I split his personality into Jones A and Jones B. Jones A, once a normal working Marine, became entirely different. He talked communist doctrine and meant it. He was welcomed enthusiastically by communist cells, and was deliberately given a dishonorable discharge by the Corps, which was in on the plot, and became a card-carrying party member. The Joker was Jones B, the second personality, formerly apparent in the conscious Marine. Under hypnosis, this Jones had been carefully coached by suggestion. Jones B was the deeper personality, knew all the thoughts of Jones A, was a loyal American and was imprinted to say nothing during conscious phases. All I had to do was hypnotize the whole man, get in touch with Jones B, the loyal American, and I had a pipeline straight into the communist camp. It worked beautifully for months with this subject, but the technique backfired. While there was no way for 85. An enemy to expose Jones' dual personality, they suspected it and played the same trick on us later. Science Digest, April It is pretty shocking to see that Estabrooks was willing to completely destroy the life of a Marine by relegating his primary personality to an alternate that would only appear when accessed through hypnosis. It is more shocking that such an application of hypnotism is even possible. He noted that the potential for military intelligence was nightmarish but felt content that his knowledge was being used for the United States instead of the Nazis or the Russians. Unfortunately, corrupt elements in the United States, namely the CIA, would capitalize on this knowledge for illicit means in the near future. There are a variety of CIA documents released through the Freedom of Information Act that shed light on their hypnotism activities. One particularly disturbing example is MK Ultra Document 190691. It describes an experiment where an unnamed CIA official hypnotized two subjects, both 19-year-old women. In an awakened state, they expressed deep disgust in the idea of holding a gun, yet when hypnotized, one was willing to grab it and fire at her peer, the gun was unloaded and no one was hurt. It states, 223 redacted was then instructed, having previously expressed a fear of firearms in any fashion, that she would use every method at her disposal to awaken redacted, now in a deep hypnotic sleep, 
and failing in this, she would pick up a pistol nearby and fire it at Redacted. She was instructed that her rage would be so great she would not hesitate to kill Redacted for failing to awake. Redacted carried out these suggestions to the letter, including firing the, unloaded pneumatic, pistol at Redacted and then proceeding to fall into a deep sleep. After proper suggestions were made, both were awakened and expressed complete amnesia for the entire sequence. Not only was the CIA officer able to coerce otherwise peaceful subjects into violence, he was able to remove any memories of the event after they woke up from the hypnotism. Reveals that through hypnotic suggestion, one subject was coerced into setting up an incendiary bomb and leaving the device in a bathroom. 224 The document states that even with unforeseen problems in location availability during the hypnotic state, the experiment was carried off without any difficulty or hesitation on the part of either of the girls. Throughout, their movements were easy and natural, and, bystanders, were, to all intents and purposes, completely unaware of what was taking place although they could clearly observe the movements of redacted and redacted. Dr. Estabrooks once noted that only one in five people were susceptible to hypnotism in this manner. True to form, the CIA researched ways to improve to hypnotic susceptibility in their subjects, and found some success by combining techniques with administering drugs. A document titled Continuation of Studies on Hypnosis and Suggestibility states, Preliminary clinical research during 1955-56 has yielded promising leads in terms of knowledge of how hypnotizability can be influenced by pharmacological means. Several drugs have been identified that apparently are effective in speeding the induction of a hypnotic state, 225 The two-sided CIA documents describe the unwitting hypnosis of two young women for the use of experimentation. What is the possibility that psychopaths would use this knowledge to exploit women sexually? Perhaps the most disturbing CIA document I have come across is numbered 140,393 and details a CIA interview with a professional hypnotist who was asked to give an instructional course in hypnotism to CIA agents. It states, On July 2, 1951 approximately 1 p.m. the instruction began with Redacted relating to the student some of his sexual experiences. Redacted stated that he constantly used hypnotism as a means of inducing young girls to engage in sexual intercourse with him. Redacted, a performer in Redacted Orchestra was forced to engage in sexual intercourse with Redacted while under the influence of hypnotism. Redacted stated that he first put her into a hypnotic trance and then suggested to her that he was her husband and she desired sexual intercourse with him. Redacted further stated that many times while going home he would use hypnotic suggestion to have a girl turn around and talk to him and suggest sexual intercourse to him and that as a result of these suggestions he spent approximately five nights a week away from his home engaging in sexual intercourse. 226 It is nothing short of terrifying to read how interested the CIA was in methods of rape. The fact that this was beyond any application to intelligence is an afterthought. The document finishes by describing how the student of the hypnotism instructor was able to successfully use his newly learned techniques on new subjects, indicating that hypnotism was able to spread throughout the ranks of the CIA relatively effortlessly. When Operation Bluebird first began, Marking the beginnings of research into 226. 90. Hypnosis, one early document revealed a surprising goal. Can we condition by post-hypnotic suggestion agency employees, or persons of interest to this agency, to prevent them from giving information to any unauthorized source or for committing any act on behalf of a foreign or domestic enemy? 227 This raises the distinct and disturbing possibility that the act of hypnotizing agency members for the purpose of altering their behavior became a common practice at the CIA under MKUltra, with the power of what suggestions to induce at the hands of only two psychopathic men. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conclusion Upon MKUltra becoming public knowledge in 1971, the CIA was quick to claim that the program was halted due to a lack of production. The available evidence clearly shows that this is a lie. From the documents that survived Director Helm's destruction order, we can already see the potential for a Manchurian candidate, 
a mind-controlled assassin. So what happened to MK Ultra? 14-year CIA veteran Victor Marchetti has stated in numerous interviews that the claim MK Ultra was halted was merely a cover story, and that the operation went completely black, in other words, research continued at the highest level of secrecy. 228 Is it possible that academic research into hypnosis and other organic forms of mind control have been deliberately marginalized from mainstream entertainment, media, and academics in order to keep its potential use within a military-industrial complex a secret? After all, MK Ultra researcher Dr. Ewan Cameron became the president of the World Psychiatric Association in 1961 and also served as presidents of the Canadian and American Psychiatric Associations. 229 It is important to reiterate that not only does the available evidence of MK Ultra comprise a portion of the documents that were created, but many of the experiments were never recorded in the first place. The operation was presided over by only two individuals who had a complete knowledge of the operations. Not even the director of the CIA had full access. When John F. Kennedy appointed John McCone as the new director in the wake of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, Richard Helms declined to inform him about the more sensitive MK Ultra operations, such as George White's safe houses. 230 Ultimately, the goal of MK Ultra was not to find the holy grail of mind control but to map out a complete knowledge of human nature and the human mind, and then find ways to exploit it. This was done on both individual and group levels. We have no idea how much was accomplished towards this goal or how much more developed the mind control research has gotten in the 50 years that have passed since the available documents were last issued. After all, if this is what the CIA was able to accomplish in the 1950s, what are they capable of today? Food for thought. 1. What kind of experiments were detailed in the documents that were destroyed after Director Helm's orders? 2. What kind of experiments were never recorded and why did they require such a high level of secrecy? 3. Do any recent instances of terrorism or assassination sound similar to the documented instances of hypnotically induced susceptibility to carry out acts of violence? 4. What kind of power does mind control represent in the hands of a psychopath? 5. How widespread was the entrapment program and is it possible that it ended up? 93. Targeting U.S. politicians. Military leaders. Businessmen. 6. What is responsible for the complete lack of knowledge of MK Ultra among the public? 7. What was the purpose of associating trauma through electroshock and other means with mind control? 8. What new means of mind control have emerged with new technology? 94. Operation Gladio in Europe's new order, they are the spies who never quite came in from the cold, foot soldiers in an underground guerrilla network with one stated mission, to fight an enemy that most Europeans believe no longer exists. Theirs is a tale of secret arms caches and exotic code names, of military stratagems and political intrigues. At best, their tale is no more than a curious footnote to the Cold War. The question is if, at worst, it could be the key to unsolved terrorism dating back two decades. The focus of the inquiry is a clandestine operation code named Gladio, created decades ago to arm and train resistance fighters in case the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies invaded. All this week, there have been disclosures of similar organizations in virtually all Western European countries, including those that do not belong to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. New York Times 231 How far would the United States go to prevent the spread of communism in Western Europe? especially considering the constant false information provided by Reinhard Gellin and his organization indicating that a Soviet invasion was imminent. The answer is Operation Gladio, the CIA and NATO campaign to create, arm and fund radical right-wing stay behind organizations that would fight communism to the death. When the Soviet invasion never happened, these organizations created networks with politicians and within the black market, and turned their goals towards preventing the rise of leftist political movements, often resorting to terrorism to create domestic tension, causing citizens to turn towards increasingly fascist governments to provide protection. Today, this process is known as the strategy of tension. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Italy.
it was Judge Felice Kassin who first dredged up the evidence for state-sponsored terrorism, while browsing the archives of the Italian Military Secret Service. 232 In a BBC documentary on Operation Gladio, Kassin described the operations as an effort to create tension within the country to promote conservative, reactionary social and political tendencies. While this strategy was being implemented, it was necessary to protect those behind it because evidence implicating them was being discovered. Witnesses withheld information to cover right-wing extremists. 233 Kassin points to a 1972 car bombing in Petiano that killed three paramilitary police and was blamed on leftists, after which 200 communists were immediately arrested. He found that there were no police investigations of the scene, and the official report was a forgery 234. In fact, it was perpetrated by a right-wing terrorist named Vincenzo Vinci Guerra 235, operating under Gladio orders, who later confessed to the crime. Vinci Guerra's testimony reveals that it was easy to escape and remain hidden because everyone in the Italian security apparatus shared his anti-communist convictions. 236 His testimony further revealed a secret organization, a super organization with a network of communications, arms, and explosives, and men trained to use them. 237 years later, in prison, he would claim I say that every single outrage that followed from 1969 fitted into a single organized matrix. 238 Nearly 2,000 people would die from political murder or acts of terrorism over this period of time. When ex-Prime Minister Andriotti finally testified in 1990, he revealed that arms and equipment were provided by the CIA and placed in 139 underground caches across the country. General Giandalio Malati, a former head of Italian counterintelligence, in March 2001 confirmed the CIA involvement. He stated that after the Piazza Fontana bombing in 1969, pieces of a bomb were planted in a leftist editor's villa in order to blame the 233 Operation Gladio, a 1992 BBC production, watch it here. 234 Historian Daniel Ganser, eminent Gladio researcher, in his book NATO's Secret Armies, page 3, available in PDF here. Ganser is the eminent authority on Operation Gladio and has done tremendous work in synthesizing the various evidence from nearly a dozen different languages into one source. This book is a must-read to gain a full understanding of Operation Gladio. 235 Vincenzo Vinciguerra's Wikipedia article 236 Daniel Ganser, in a paper published in the Whitehead Journal of Diplomacy and International Relations, page 72, available in PDF here. 237 Ibid 238 Ganser's NATO Secret Armies page 8. 97. Communists. He stated. The CIA, following the directives of its government, wanted to create an Italian nationalism capable of halting what it saw as a slide to the left, and, for this purpose, it may have made use of right-wing terrorism. 239. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Turkey. Another Gladio hotspot was Turkey. During the Cold War, Turkey shared a third of the total borders with the Soviet bloc and maintained the largest standing army in Europe, and the second in NATO after the United States. In 1952, a stay behind army was organized under the codename Counter Guerrilla. On November 3, 1996, a truck crashed into a Mercedes Benz in Susurluk. 90 miles south of Istanbul, and killed three Turkish passengers, a fugitive heroin smuggler and hitman, a former high-ranking police officer, and a former Miss Cinema. The lone survivor was a right-wing member of parliament. In the car's trunk, police found a forged passport, police identification, papers, ammunition, silencers, and machine guns. Abdullah Kadli, the fugitive heroin smuggler, had escaped from a Swiss prison. The dead beauty queen, Ganka Uz, was his girlfriend. The police officer was Hüseyin Kokadag, head of a Turkish police academy and a former Istanbul deputy police chief who reportedly organized hit squads in the southeast that kill Kurdish guerrillas and their supporters. The survivor, Sedat Bukak, 
a member of parliament from the conservative True Path Party, is reportedly in charge of 2,000 Kurdish mercenaries paid by the government to fight Kurdish guerrillas. The car crash has created a sensation in Turkey and has led parliament to hold hearings on the ties linking the True Path Party, the police, and thugs like Abdullah Kadli. Newspapers in Turkey are making connections between what they are calling the state gang and a secret paramilitary force that for decades has attacked the left. The United States funded these stay-behind groups for decades. Even though there was no Soviet occupation, some of the groups did take up arms against left-wing dissidents in their own countries. Some descendants of these groups are still at it, especially in Turkey. 99. Abdullah Kadli was one of those. The accident unveiled the dark liaisons within the state, former Prime Minister Bülent Esevit told Parliament in December. Now leader of a small opposition Social Democratic Party, Esevit knows a lot about those liaisons. He first told me about them and the American connection back in 1990, when I interviewed him in his Ankara office. The progressive 240 Bülent Esevit, five-time Turkish Prime Minister, who is cited in the above quote, declared that the Taksim Square massacre was a gladio operation, where half a million citizens had rallied. It was organized by trade unions, and the shooting lasted for 20 minutes while a thousand policemen in attendance did not intervene. About 40 people were killed, and though none of the perpetrators were caught, 500 demonstrators were detained. The massacre occurred during a broader wave of political violence. 241 The U.S. State Department in its 1995 Human Rights Report noted that Prominent credible human rights organizations, Kurdish leaders and local Kurds asserted that the government acquiesces in, or even carries out, the murder of civilians. Human rights groups reported the widespread and credible belief that a counter-guerrilla group associated with the security forces had carried out at least some mystery killings. 242 American journalist Lucy Commissar, when asking U.S. officials about investigating the human rights reports, was told that's classified. The Turkish military would likewise block all investigations in their country. 243 There is evidence of Gladio operatives extensively operating torture campaigns for political purposes. For example, Talhat Turhan, former Turkey general, survived torture at the hands of special forces. He was told, I was now in the hands of a counter-guerrilla unit operating under the high command of the army outside the constitution and the laws. They told me that they considered me as their prisoner of war and that I was sentenced to death. 244 Much of the violence was directed at the Kurdish minority. In 1984 the counter-guerrillas were behind the brutal crackdown that would kill and torture thousands over the next five years. Among other operations, counter-guerrillas would dress up as PKK members, a Kurdish political party, and attack villages, raping and executing people randomly. 245 The political violence in Turkey, with Gladio operatives responsible to at least a moderate extent, paved the way for the series of military coups that have occurred in the country. A 1996 New York Times article notes that Evidence suggests that officially sanctioned criminality may have reached levels that few had imagined. One of Turkey's most prominent pro-Kurdish politicians, Govan Ozata, said the car crash and its aftermath had convinced him that state-sponsored death squads were behind many of the estimated 3,500 unsolved killings that have been committed in the southeastern part of the country in the last decade. Most of the victims had been suspected of sympathizing with separatist Kurdish causes. These gangs have a direct link with mystery killings, Mr. Ozata said at a news conference. This is no longer a hypothesis or a guess. It is a reality acknowledged by government officials several politicians and others who are calling for investigations into the government's relationship with criminal gangs believe that the gangs used their official ties as cover for involvement in Turkey's lucrative heroin smuggling trade. They suspect that senior officials were engaged in the trade or tolerated it as a way of repaying gangs that killed at their behest. New York Times 246 The evidence of Gladio operations in Turkey reveal another important link, the collusion between paramilitary forces and drug traffickers. At the time, and to this day, 
Turkey served as a major hub in the smuggling of drugs into Western Europe, from the Southeast Asian Golden Triangle and later the Middle East. It is likely that drugs served as a significant source of funding for these decentralized operations and was the catalyst for a bond between the state and the criminal underworld that ensured massive corruption in the country that exists to this day. After all, we know that the Gelen organization was involved in the black market in the area to raise extra funds for their intelligence operations. It seems that this practice spread throughout the web of stay behind armies financed and armed by the CIA and NATO. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Greece. One of the countries that suffered the most from the Cold War terrorism groups was Greece, the country with perhaps the most significant propensity for the rise of a natural leftist coalition. Former CIA agent and Gladio whistleblower Philip A.G. claimed that the Greek-American CIA officer recruited several groups of Greek citizens for what the CIA called the nucleus for rallying a citizen army against the threat of a leftist coup. Each of the several groups was trained and equipped to act as an autonomous guerrilla unit, capable of mobilizing and carrying on guerrilla warfare with minimal or no outside direction. 247. These groups were equipped with automatic weapons and small mountain mortars stashed in underground caches throughout the country. 248 The group was involved with the 1967 coup, where leftists were widely reported to have large leads in the polls. As NATO orders were to prevent any type of leftist insurgency, the group took over the Greece Defense Ministry, rolled into Athens, took control of communication centers, parliament, the royal palace, and arrested over 10,000 people, many of whom were tortured. 249. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conclusion. Although the CIA and NATO have steadfastly refused to acknowledge the existence of Gladio, giving them deniability from ever having to disclose documents related to the operation, the existence of these fascist and violent underground networks has been acknowledged by the governments of nearly every NATO country. Furthermore, official documents in German, Dutch, French and Italian confirming the network, its organization and practices have been declassified. 250 Operation Gladio is not just some ancient history. Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti confirmed that the last coordination meeting he was aware of was held in 1990. 251 It has to be noted that this was a period of time where terrorism was evolving, moving towards the widespread radical Islamic terror that bombards our television. Screens daily just three years before the first World Trade Center bombing and two years after the creation of Al-Qaeda. At the same time the geopolitical strategies of the United States were moving away from Europe and towards the Middle East. Unfortunately, the available information on Operation Gladio raises more questions than it answers. Food for thought, 1. Knowing that the last Gladio meeting was in 1990, can we say with any certainty that the program ever ended? 2. How many people involved with Gladio are still operating in the CIA and other agencies? 3. Seeing that the strategy of tension proved to be an effective tool, in what other instances has it been implemented? 4. Is there currently a Gladio B in operation in the Middle East, as former FBI agent Sybil Edmonds asserts? 5. Are the criminal alliances that formed during Gladio in places such as Turkey still in effect today? 6. How did the stay-behind organizations affect domestic politics in ways other than? 105. Terrorism. 7. Is the ongoing assassination campaign in Iraq, discussed in the chapter The War on Terror is a Fraud, a part of an evolved Gladio campaign? 106. Operation Mockingbird about a third of the whole CIA budget went to media propaganda operations. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars a year just for that, close to a billion dollars are being spent every year by the United States on secret propaganda. Testimony of William Schaap to Congress 252 in 1948, the United States began the Marshall Plan, an initiative to help the devastated Europe recover from the war. The CIA decided to siphon funds to create the Office of Policy Coordination, which would become the covert action branch of the agency. 
253 It was under this program that Operation Mockingbird, a domestic propaganda campaign aimed at promoting the views of the CIA within the media, began. From the onset, Operation Mockingbird was one of the most sensitive of the CIA's operations, with recruitment of journalists and training of intelligence officers for propaganda purposes usually undertaken by Director Alan Dulles himself or his direct peers. 254 It is a false belief that the CIA infiltrated unwitting media institutions. The recruitment of journalists was frequently done with complicity from top management and ownership. Former CIA Director William Colby claimed during the Church Committee investigative hearings, let's go to the managements. They were witting. Among the organizations that would lend their help to the propaganda efforts was the New York Times, Newsweek, Associated Press, and the Miami Herald. Providing cover to CIA agents was a part of the New York Times policy, set by their late publisher, Arthur Hayes Salzberger. 255 The Investigative Committee of Frank Church, officially titled Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, uncovered a lot of evidence concerning Operation Mockingbird and came to the conclusion that the CIA currently maintains a network of several hundred foreign individuals around the world who provide intelligence for the CIA and at times attempt to influence opinion through the use of covert propaganda. These individuals provide the CIA with direct access to a large number of newspapers and periodicals, scores of press services and news agencies, radio and television stations, commercial book publishers, and other foreign media outlets. 256. Carl Bernstein, the reporter famous for his excellent investigation into the Watergate scandal, wrote that Joseph Alsop is one of more than 400 American journalists who in the past 25 years have secretly carried out assignments for the Central Intelligence Agency, according to documents on file at CIA headquarters. Some of these journalists' relationships with the agency were tacit, some were explicit. There was cooperation, accommodation, and overlap. Journalists provided a full range of clandestine services from simple intelligence gathering to serving as go-betweens with spies in communist countries. Reporters shared their notebooks with the CIA. Editors shared their staffs. Some of the journalists were Pulitzer Prize winners, distinguished reporters who considered themselves ambassadors without portfolio for their country. Most were less exalted, foreign correspondents who found that their association with the agency helped their work, stringers and freelancers who were as interested in the daring do of the spy business as in filing articles, and, the smallest category, full-time CIA employees masquerading as journalists abroad. In many instances, CIA documents show, journalists were engaged to perform tasks for the CIA with the consent of the managements of America's leading news organizations. 257 While a majority of Mockingbird operations were overseas, the goal was to have important, hard-hitting stories to be circulated in the American press. Relationships with major United States media institutions certainly helped with this goal. Bernstein lists the New York Times, CBS, and Time Inc. as the most productive relationships the agency cultivated. They also created front organizations overseas who publicly maintained an Appearance of free press but privately were operated by the agency. An example of this is the Rome Daily American, which was 40% owned by the CIA for three decades. 258 Another strategy was developing relationships with major media owners who were known to harbor right-wing views, such as William Paley of CBS, and then passing on information of journalists, actors, and screenwriters who harbored left-wing views. Information was also passed on to friendly congressmen such as Joseph McCarthy. These men and women would then be blacklisted from the industry. Lee Jacob was one such actor who was blacklisted, and recalled his experience. When the facilities of the government of the United States are drawn on an individual it can be terrifying. The blacklist is just the opening gambit, being deprived of work. Your passport is confiscated. That's minor. But not being able to move without being tailed is something else. After a certain point it grows to implied as well as articulated threats, and people succumb. My wife did, and she was institutionalized. 
In 1953 the HCUA, House Un-American Activities Committee, did a deal with me. I was pretty much worn down. I had no money. I couldn't borrow. I had the expenses of taking care of the children. Why am I subjecting my loved ones to this? If it's worth dying for, and I am just as idealistic as the next fellow. But I decided it wasn't worth dying for, and if this gesture was the way of getting out of the penitentiary I'd do it. I had to be employable again. 259. The CIA went as far as to write scripts for Hollywood. One interesting example is the funding of the movie version of Animal Farm in 1954, a book written just less than a decade earlier by George Orwell which enjoyed large commercial success. The problem for the CIA was that Orwell was a socialist, and his book attacked both capitalism and communism. To avoid this conflict, the CIA changed the ending of the Hollywood version to portray capitalism in a more positive light. 260 domestic surveillance was also used on journalists who had published classified material. In one example, a physical surveillance post was set up at a Hilton hotel in view of the office of Washington Post writer Michael Gettler. 261 The operation defied the CIA's charter, which specifically prohibits domestic spying. The operation was directed towards numerous members of the Washington Press Corp., and was signed off by John F. Kennedy himself, in coordination with CIA Director John McCone. 262 One CIA document states, get books published or distributed abroad without revealing any U.S. influence, by covertly subsidizing foreign publicans or booksellers. Get books published for operational reasons, regardless of commercial viability. The Church Committee concluded that over 1,000 books were published under this directive. 263 Some investigative journalists have claimed that Operation Mockingbird did not end in 1976 as the CIA claims. For example, in 1998, researcher Steve Kangas claimed that conservative billionaire Richard Mellon Scaife, who ran Forum World Features, a foreign news organization, was a CIA asset and used the organization to disseminate propaganda for circulation in the United States. 264 Kangas ended up dead with a bullet hole in his head, in the office of Richard Scaife. It was ruled a suicide, although there were discrepancies in the police report and the autopsy. 265 The Church Committee's conclusion accurately reflects the problems associated with Operation Mockingbird. In examining the CIA's past and present use of the U.S. media, the committee finds two reasons for concern. The first is the potential, inherent in covert media operations, for manipulating or incidentally misleading the American public. The second is the damage to the credibility and independence of a free press which may be caused by covert relationships with the U.S. journalists and media organizations. 266 While it is deplorable for citizens of countries to be subjected to a state-owned media, at least they can be aware of the biases and filter information accordingly. We have been taught the lie from birth that the U.S. press is free from government meddling. In a situation where the manipulation is completely covered, the American public has been left unaware of the propaganda they have been ingesting for decades. Food for Thought, 1. Why were the owners and management of large media institutions so willing to participate in a program that violated their journalistic integrity? 2. Has the increasingly consolidated media industry made it easier for news to be manipulated to fit the agenda discussed in the one-party state? 3. Have MK Ultra entrapment or mind control techniques ever been used to target the press? 113. COINTELPRO Between 1965 and 1975, the FBI opened more than 500,000 intelligence files on more than 1 million Americans, according to a congressional report. Among the Bureau's targets, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam war groups, and the underground press. Center for Investigative Reporting 267 Purpose of counterintelligence action is to disrupt the BPP Black Panther Party and it is immaterial whether facts exist to substantiate the charge. J. Edgar Hoover 268 J. Edgar Hoover issued directives for COINTELPRO, 
a codename for counterintelligence program, in 1956. The original intent was to monitor the Communist Party USA but quickly expanded its scope to infiltrate and marginalize a variety of groups such as the American Indian Movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Black Panthers, as well as targeting high-profile individuals such as Martin Luther King, Jr. The FBI's stated motivation was protecting national security, preventing violence, and maintaining the existing social and political order 269. Emphasis added. 267 context available here. 268 from a 1970 FBI document, available here. 269 excerpt from the Church Committee, available here page 3. 114. They used harassment, wiretapping, psychological warfare, propaganda, and assassinations among other techniques to achieve their goals. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Fred Hampton. On December 4, 1969, the Chicago Police Department and FBI raided an apartment housing members of the Black Panther Party. At 4.45 a.m., the heavily armed police stormed the apartment, killing Panther member Mark Clark immediately, who was serving a security duty. Clark fired his shotgun, the only shot fired by the Panthers that day while the police and FBI would end up shooting over 98 times. 270 forensics and firearms experts determined that Clark's shot was fired from very near the floor, indicating that Clark had already sustained grave injuries. The raid team would then assault the room of Fred Hampton, a rising leader in the Panther movement. Police would fire twice at Hampton, who was lying next to his pregnant girlfriend, hitting his shoulder. Court transcripts revealed the following conversation took place, 271 that's Fred Hampton. Is he dead? Bring him out. He's barely alive. He'll make it. Two more shots were fired, point blank at Hampton's head. He's good and dead now. Over a dozen more Panthers residing in the apartment would be wounded, beaten, crime scene from Fred Hampton's bedroom. 116 and then charged with attempted murder of police officers. The next day, the media largely defended the FBI's actions. The Chicago Tribune published photos showing holes purported to be from bullets fired by the Panthers, but forensics would later reveal these holes to have been made by nails. 272 documents released by the Freedom of Information Act include a sketch of Hampton's apartment drawn by an FBI informant, used by police and FBI in the assassination. The informant received $300 from the FBI for providing the information. 273 The FBI had tried other methods before resorting to assassination, including sending a bogus letter to a rival Chicago gang leader in hopes of provoking a violent retaliation which read, Brother Jeff, I've spent some time with some Panther friends on the West Side lately and I know what's been going on. The brothers that run the Panthers blame you for blocking their thing and there's supposed to be a hit out for you. I'm not a Panther, or a Ranger, just black. From what I see these Panthers are out for themselves, not black people. I think you ought to know what they're, sick, up to, I know what I'd do if I was you. You might hear from me again. Signed, a black brother you don't know. 274 The use of bogus letters for sabotage and attempting to provoke violence was widely used by the FBI throughout COINTELPRO. Why was Fred Hampton targeted? He was a rising leader in the Black Panther Party and was in the process of uniting various gang, including the Puerto Rican Young Lords and the Caucasian Young Patriots into a political coalition. He had the potential to drastically change the political landscape of Chicago by channeling the youth unrest that had previously been directed against other gangs and instead directed at the political establishment to fight against police corruption and to generate socially constructive energies. This type of action was directly antagonistic to one of the primary directives of COINTELPRO put forth by J. Edgar Hoover himself, which read, 275. 1 prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups. The same document also contained another relevant directive, 
276 prevent the rise of a messiah Fred Hampton had the charisma to unite large groups of young men and the attitude of social welfare and community development that had the potential to gain the support of the broader progressive community. His assassination prevented his career from escalating to these heights. Asterisk 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 Subverting the Black Panther Party the FBI waged a wildly successful campaign against the Black Panther Party throughout the 60s and 70s. By the late 60s, the Black Panther Party was the most prominent African-American political force in the United States. They advocated a 10-point socialist program for black self-determination, provided free food and health care to communities, fought against hard drugs, and formed legal armed street patrols to deter violence from the KKK and other antagonistic organizations. They also advocated for community control of police, schools, and other institutions. Today, these points are largely ignored in favor of the racist caricature promoted by the Bureau. The operations the FBI took to subvert the Panthers is truly astounding. For example, there is the Black Panther coloring book, created by the FBI and distributed by bureau informants to black children in an attempt to marginalize the party within the black community. 277 It is directly related to Hoover's directive. 4. Prevent militant black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability The goal was not to influence the children of these communities, but to marginalize the Panthers within the white community. The coloring book aimed to do just that, and would certainly be shocking to anyone who saw it. Once marginalized, the public would support increasingly repressive policies against the Panthers and their leadership, such as the Fred Hampton assassination. To J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, it did not matter what the activities of the Black Panther Party consisted of. In 1969, an FBI special agent sent Hoover a memo detailing how his investigation of the Panthers has only turned up pacifist activities such as feeding breakfast to children. 278 Hoover shot back a memo saying that the agent's career ambitions were directly related to supplying Hoover with information supporting his view that the Panthers were, a violence-prone organization seeking to overthrow the government by revolutionary means 279. To prevent the unification of the Black Panther Party and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, popularly known as SNCC, the FBI resorted to fostering splits between the leadership of the two organizations. The FBI targeted Stokely Carmichael by using a technique known as Bad Jacket, they forged documents indicating that Carmichael was a CIA informant. 280 It worked. The FBI also had the policy of arresting Panther members for any reason, even just on suspicion of crime without evidence, for the purpose of exhausting the party's funds to pay bonds. The Panthers' attorney said in 1970. In a period of two years December, 1967 to December, 1969 the Black Panther Party has expended in bail bond premiums alone just the premiums, that is, money that will never be returned a sum in excess of $200,000. How many breakfasts or lunches for hungry children, how much medical attention sorely needed in the ghetto communities would that $200,000? have furnished, in the same two-year period, 28 Panthers were killed. 281 In instances where dozens of Panthers were arrested, the bond requirements were too high to pay and members sat in jail for weeks, or even months, a common Countel Pro tactic used against other groups as well. By 1974, the Black Panther Party had essentially collapsed under the weight of ruthless harassment. Asterisk 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 Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In 1957, the FBI targeted the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as a likely target for communist infiltration. 282 The nature of the group was entirely nonviolent and focused on organizing the Southern black vote. It was founded by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and several other Southern black ministers. By 1964, Dr. King had given his I Have a Dream speech and had emerged as a preeminent civil rights leader and had also began to address social change that transcended racial issues. At this point, the FBI had marked King as a clear threat to the established order. 
Agent William C. Sullivan committed to writing. We must mark King now, if we have not before, as the most dangerous Negro in the future of this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro, and national security, it may be unrealistic to limit our actions against King to legalistic proofs. 123. That would stand up in court or before congressional committees. 283. When it was announced that King would win the Nobel Prize, the FBI compiled an audio tape consisting of various fragments of conversations from King's tapped phones, bugged offices and hotel rooms. It was purported to demonstrate that King was a sexual deviant. It was sent to King with an anonymous note stating that it would be released to the press unless he committed suicide prior to receiving the award. 284 When King failed to reply, FBI Associate Director Cartha Deloach offered the contents of the tape to various news institutions, including Newsweek, but the reporters nearly universally declined to report on the story. On April 24, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. Although public memory has largely forgotten, King was in the process of organizing the Poor People's Campaign, aimed at uniting poor people of all races to rally for social change. It is likely that if King had not died, the campaign would have been wildly successful. The campaign also represented everything that COINTELPRO had been dedicated to prevent. Although there is no complete proof that the FBI was involved with the assassination, the jury of a 1999 Memphis civil trial came to the conclusion that James Earl Ray did not kill King, and that the real culprit was government agencies. 285 Asterisk 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 American Indian movement They the Indians are a conquered nation, and when you are conquered, the people you are conquered by dictate your future. This is a basic philosophy of mine. If I'm part of a conquered nation, I've got to yield to authority. The FBI must function as a colonial police force. Assistant Special Agent in Charge Norman Zagrosi 286 AIM, the American Indian Movement, began in the 60s as activism focused on preventing the further depredation of Indian lands and resources. As the movement rose to prominence, the FBI marked them as an extremist organization to target. 287 One document released under the Freedom of Information Act advocates that, local police put AIM leaders under dose scrutiny, and arrest them on every possible charge until they could no longer make bail. 288 During a presentation by members of the Congressional Black Caucus to the UN Human Rights Commissioner, it was alleged that virtually every known leader of AIM has been imprisoned in state or federal prisons, some repeatedly. Russell Means, for example, was charged with 37 counts but not one has held up in court. 289 It was later revealed that the FBI had infiltrated Means defense team but was still unable to pin their charges against him. In 1973, thousands of Native Americans from reservations across the West had gathered at Wounded Knee at the Pine Ridge Reservation to simultaneously commemorate the 1890 massacre and protest the political corruption of tribal president Dick Wilson, who had received $62,000 from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and was using it to fund a private force that suppressed opposition and often resorted to murder. 290 The force designated themselves Guardians of the Oglala Nation, abbreviated as goons. Attempts to impeach Wilson, who was responsible for years of political violence, had failed. The FBI considered the occupation an act of treason and began a siege of AIM members, in coordination with U.S. Marshals, agents from the BIA and the goons of Dick Wilson. Wilson bluntly declared in a speech that AIM will die at Wounded Knee. 291 According to historian Rex Whaler, who obtained documents subpoenaed from the Pentagon, the U.S. Marshal Service directed the employment of 17 APCs armored personnel carriers, 130,000 rounds of M16 ammunition, 41,000 rounds of M40 high explosive, as well as helicopters, phantom jets, and personnel. Military officers, supply sergeants, maintenance technicians, chemical officers, and medical teams remained on duty throughout the 71-day siege, 
all working in civilian clothes to conceal their unconstitutional involvement in this civil disorder 292 all of this was on site at Pine Ridge during the 71 day standoff, during which AIM demanded the removal of Wilson from office, the goons disbanded, and the military presence removed. By the end, hundreds of thousands of rounds were fired at AIM positions, two AIM members were killed, 14 seriously injured, and 8 disappeared. In the 36 months that preceded the end of the Pine Ridge standoff, more than 60 AIM members died violently on or near Pine Ridge. 293 The Civil Rights Commission revealed that AIM was right to feel aggrieved during the occupation of Pine Ridge, the FBI had been complicit in rigging the 1974 Pine Ridge elections against AIM members. 294 Asterisk 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 Conclusion the Church Committee investigated COINTELPRO and concluded. Too many people have been spied upon by too many government agencies and too much information has been collected. The government has often undertaken the secret surveillance of citizens on the basis of their political beliefs, even when those beliefs posed no threat of violence or illegal acts on behalf of a hostile foreign power. The government, operating primarily through secret informants, but also using other intrusive techniques such as wiretaps, microphone bugs, surreptitious mail opening, and break-ins, has swept in vast amounts of information about the personal lives, views, and associations of American citizens. Investigations of groups deemed potentially dangerous and even of groups suspected of associating with potentially dangerous organizations have continued for decades, despite the fact that those groups did not engage in unlawful activity. The constitutional system of checks and balances has not adequately controlled intelligence activities. Until recently the executive branch has neither delineated the scope of permissible activities nor established procedures for supervising intelligence agencies. Congress has failed to exercise sufficient oversight, seldom questioning the use to which its appropriations were being put. 128. Simply put, the committee's conclusions are correct but fall short. It is clear that for a period of nearly three decades, the FBI waged a literal domestic war on largely peaceful activists who sought to bring about social and political change. During the time of the Vietnam War, MK Ultra, the struggles of various civil rights movements, Watergate, and other criminal acts in the executive branch, the United States drastically needed effective leaders and organizations to effect change yet the FBI successfully suppressed any serious movements that arose. Food for thought. 1. How responsible is COINTELPRO for the fall of the American left in the 1970s? 2. How likely is it that other high-profile assassinations similar to Fred Hampton, such as Martin Luther King Jr., actions undertake by the FBI under COINTELPRO orders? 3. What movements are currently being subverted by the FBI today? 4. Did J. Edgar Hoover leave a corrupt infrastructure when he retired in 1972, after 37 years of being the FBI director? 129. The Phoenix Program Thanks to the New York Times and 60 Minutes, most people are now aware that former senator and presidential candidate Bob Kerry once led a raid on the peasant village of Tong Phong during his service in Vietnam, and murdered nearly two dozen villagers in cold blood. His team disemboweled women, children, and infants and shot dead whole families. What most people don't know, is that Kerry was operating on orders from a CIA program known as Operation Phoenix the program that oversaw some of the most horrific war crimes ever unleashed on Earth. 295 It was in 1964, under CIA Station Chief Pierre de Silva, that the Phoenix program was initiated. De Silva was a proponent of the belief of counter-terrorism, CIA doublespeak for the idea that terror was a legitimate tactic in unconventional warfare. 296 Historian Douglas Valentine summarizes the concept of Operation Phoenix as follows. Central to Phoenix is the fact that it targeted civilians, not soldiers. Under Phoenix, due process was totally non-existent. South Vietnamese civilians whose names appeared on blacklists could be kidnapped, tortured, detained for two years without trial, or even murdered simply on the word of an anonymous informer. At its height, 
Phoenix managers imposed a quota of 1,800 neutralizations per month on the people running the program in the field, opening up the program to abuses by corrupt security officers, policemen, politicians, and racketeers, all of whom extorted innocent civilians as well as VCI Viet Cong infrastructure. Legendary CIA officer Lucy Anconian described Phoenix as, a very good blackmail scheme for the central government, if you don't do what I want, you're VC. Indeed, Phoenix was, among other things, an instrument of counter-terror, the psychological warfare tactic in which members of the VCI were brutally murdered along with their families or neighbors as a means of terrorizing the entire population into a state of submission. Such horrendous acts were, for propaganda purposes, often made to look as if they had been committed by the enemy. 297 This is the intellectual context under which Bob Carey massacred the hamlet of civilians, for which he was subsequently awarded the Bronze Star. Pierre de Silva quickly expanded Phoenix to cover all 40 provinces in South Vietnam, each equipped with an intelligence coordinating committee and its own prison. Torture techniques such as electric shock, beatings, and rape were commonplace. 298. The Central Intelligence Agency originally had trouble finding Americans who were willing to murder and mutilate, so the counter-terror squads were composed of ex-convicts, Viet Cong defectors, and mercenaries. 299 They then employed special forces, Navy SEALs and other highly trained Americans such as Bob Carey, who had essentially been indoctrinated by the military into killing machines, to oversee the program. Former Lt. Col. Anthony Herbert, who was involved in Operation Phoenix, described his experience in his autobiography Soldier, they wanted me to take charge of execution teams that wiped out entire families and tried to make it look as though the VC themselves had done the killing. 300 Former CIA agent Ralph McGee, speaking to PBS's Bill Moyers for the fantastic documentary The Secret Government, stated that We were murdering these people, incinerating them. My efforts had resulted in the deaths of many people, and I just, for me it was a period when I guess I was, I considered myself nearly insane, I just couldn't reconcile what I had been and what I was at the time becoming 301. McGee was operating under Phoenix helping to set up the South Vietnam secret police, and has since become one of the most outspoken critics on the CIA. He recalls that the program cost billions of dollars, and CIA Director William Colby refused an investigative audit before a congressional committee. 302. The agency's website describes how the entire South Vietnamese population was mapped out with census grievance teams in conjunction with national data. 303. They determined which villages were more likely to be friendly to the Viet Cong through interviews, and color-coded maps based on that information, specifically noting that these maps would often contain the names of family members who were VCI members or sympathetic to the communists. I think it's common knowledge what goes on at the interrogation center. It was common knowledge that when someone was picked up their lives were about at an end because the Americans most likely felt that, if they were to turn someone like that back into the countryside it would just be like multiplying NLF followers. Jeff Stein, author and former military intelligence, Vietnam veteran 304 The 1971 congressional inquiry revealed that the blacklists created by these maps and census data was not thoroughly vetted, as opposed to claims by agency officials. One member of the Phoenix program described to Congress that It was my experience that the majority of people classified as VC were captured as a result of sweeping tactical operations. In effect, a huge dragnet was cast out in our area of operation, AR, and whatever looked good in the catch, regardless of evidence. Lt. Vincent Akamato, Army Combat Officer and recipient of the Distinguished Service Cross, testified on his experiences with using blacklists as a means of neutralizing Viet Cong. The problem was, how do you find the people on the blacklist? It's not like you had their address and telephone number. The normal procedure would be to go into a village and just grab someone and say, where's and when so and so. Half the time the people were so afraid they would say anything. Then a Phoenix team would take the informant, put a sandbag over his head, poke out two holes so he could see, 
put Kamo wire around his neck like a long leash, and walk him through the village and say, when we go by Nguyen's house scratch your head. Then that night Phoenix would come back, knock on the door, and say, April fool, motherfucker. Whoever answered the door would get wasted. As far as they were concerned whoever answered was a communist, including family members. Sometimes they'd come back to camp with ears to prove that they killed people. Psychological warfare against civilians was an integral part of Phoenix. Soldiers would leave pamphlets on dead bodies, or on doors indicating that recipients were marked. For death. Attention villagers, one dot your village was bombed because you harbored Viet Cong in your village. Two. Your village was bombed because you gave help to the Viet Cong in your area. Three. Your village was bombed because you gave food to the Viet Cong. USMC leaflet 306 Phoenix officer Bart Osborne testified before Congress in 1971. I never knew in the course of all those operations any detainee to live through his interrogation. They all died. There was never any reasonable establishment of the fact that any one of those individuals was, in fact, cooperating with the VC, but they all died and the majority were either tortured to death or things like thrown out of helicopters. It became a sterile depersonalized murder program 307. Throwing victims out of a helicopter, for example, served a psychological warfare purpose as well, terrorizing those on the ground. The intelligence that the CIA received was often flawed. Anyone in the South Vietnam infrastructure could report intelligence, and it was often not verified, which led to Abuses such as South Vietnam politicians feeding intelligence to kill their political rivals. 308 We had no way of determining the background of these sources, nor their motivation for providing American units with information. No American in the team spoke or understood Vietnamese well enough to independently debrief any contact. None of us were sufficiently sensitive to nor knowledgeable of the law, the culture, the customs, the history, etc. Our paid sources could easily have been either provocateurs or opportunists with a score to settle. Every information report, IR, we wrote based on our sources information was classified as, 1, unverifiable and, 2, usually reliable source. As to the first, it speaks for itself, the second, in most cases was pure rationale for the existence of the program. Michael J. Orr, first lieutenant involved with Phoenix. 309 historian Marvin Get Lehman described in his book Vietnam and America, a documented history, how intelligence gathered during interrogation was often used to direct search and destroy missions aimed at wiping out whole villages or groups of villages 310. All told, documents show that Phoenix led to the neutralizing of over 80,000 people, about a third of them killed, between the years of 1968 and 1972. 311 One Pentagon contract study of Phoenix's operations found that only 3% of those neutralized were full party members above the district level between 1970 and 1971, and that over half were not even party members. 312. A Saigon government document lists the number of assassinated at over 40,000, nearly double that of other documents, highlighting potential disparity between record keeping and reality. 313 The program supposedly ended in 1972, though it has been revealed that at least certain aspects continued until the fall of Saigon in 1975. Understanding that official documents don't cover the full scope of Phoenix, and the history of records destruction by the agency, it is unlikely that the full extent of Phoenix will ever be known. So what about the infamous My Lai massacre that resulted in the rape and mutilation of around 400 civilians? Historian Daniel Valentine argues it was most certainly a Phoenix operation. He cites a known blacklist of names to be neutralized in my lie, multiple accounts of military personnel referring to the entire village as Viet Cong sympathizers, using the logic that only sympathizers could survive in the area, and a Vietnamese colonel who said himself that my lie was a Phoenix operation, among other evidence. 314 Marvin Get Lehman concurs. By late 1967, before the Tet Offensive, 
70% of the villages in Kwanggai province had already been destroyed. In response to Tet, this slaughter was intensified literally with a vengeance. In mid-March on 1968, Kwanggai province was the scene of what was to become the most notorious example, the massacre of villagers in my life war. There the killing of hundreds of villagers, almost all unarmed women and children, and old men, so successfully swelled the body count that General Westmoreland sent a personal message of congratulations to officers and men of Charlie Company for outstanding action that dealt the enemy a heavy blow. When the carnage finally came to light, evidence poured in showing that this massacre was not an aberration but just an especially appalling instance of a systematic strategy. Get Lehman, page 411 315 Project Phoenix would first come to the public in 1971 with a congressional inquiry. William Colby, CIA chief and director of the Phoenix program, testified that the agency didn't distinguish between Viet Cong members and civilians. 316 Colby would later defend the program, citing it as the toughest opposition the Viet Cong faced. 317 Food for Thought, 1. In what other wars has terrorism been used as a tactic? 2. Is it possible that the multitude of abuses in Latin America in the decades that preceded the Vietnam War were Phoenix offshoots? 3. Why has there been such little discussion about the Phoenix program both in the mainstream media and in academia after its revelations came to light? 139. Iran slash Contra The common ingredients of the Iran and Contra policies were secrecy, deception, and disdain for the law, the United States simultaneously pursued two contradictory foreign policies a public one and a secret one report of the Congressional Committees investigating the Iran-Contra affair 318 in spite of the wildly speculative and false stories of arms for hostages and alleged ransom payments, we did not repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. Ronald Reagan, November 1986 a few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and evidence tell me it is not. Ronald Reagan, March 1987 Iran slash Contra isn't one singular historical conspiracy, but rather comprised of various illicit activities which revolved around a core group of subversive actors and a covert war in Nicaragua. The core of subversive actors consisted of members and associates of the National Security Council, created under the National Security Act of July 26, 1947. Since the act was passed, the NSC has steadily grown in power and scope under various presidencies. During Dwight D. Eisenhower's administration in the 50s, the NSC became a virtual adjunct of the president, and started reporting directly to the executive branch. John F. Kennedy, skeptical of the CIA and other agencies after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, allowed the NSC to begin functioning operationally, evolving from its traditional role as a planning committee. 319 Under Ronald Reagan, the NSC expanded with increased staff and scope of operations. Under Eisenhower, it had been tasked with creating a virtual Cold War machine against communism, and to create and exploit troublesome problems for international communism, reduce international communist control over any areas of the world, and develop underground resistance and facilitate covert and guerrilla operations. 320 This directive would be the rational and motivation for the group conducting subversive actions in Nicaragua under the Reagan administration. Asterisk 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 asterisk. United States intervention in Nicaragua is nothing new. The U.S. had landed troops numerous times in the country during the 19th century and as recently as 1912, during a period known as the Banana Wars, used military force to directly quell rebellions against American-supported leadership. In 1936 the American-trained head of the Nicaraguan National Guard, Samaza Garcia, forcefully took power in the country by murdering and disposing the former leader Augusto César Sandino, marking the beginning of a lengthy U.S.-supported dictatorship. 321 trouble arose in the 1970s, when a revolutionary communist party called the Sandinistas, named after the disposed Sandino,
began mounting a series of attacks and sabotage against the right-wing Samiza dynasty, including the high-profile kidnapping of Nicaraguan elite at a Christmas party in 1974. The Sandinistas enjoyed wide support from much of the disenfranchised Nicaraguan population, who had become tired of the heavy-handed Samiza rule. One striking example is the 1972 earthquake that struck the Nicaraguan capital Manuga, where Anastasia de Bale, son of Samiza Garcia, exercised emergency powers that allowed him to confiscate most of the international aid that had been directed towards rebuilding the city, instead ending enriching de Bale's personal coffers. 322 in 1979, the Sandinista uprising culminated in their gaining full power in Nicaragua. They were helped by the policies of Jimmy Carter, who had withdrawn aid to the Samiza regime after a series of revelations of human rights abuses. Carter originally hoped to remain on good terms with the Sandinistas, who had constructed a de facto socialist government in Nicaragua, and responded by sending them $99 million in aid. After they solidified a pact with the Soviet bloc in 1980, Carter changed his tune and authorized the CIA to begin subversive acts in the country including propaganda efforts but prohibiting direct conflict. In 1980, right-wing elements in Nicaragua created the Nicaraguan Democratic Force, FDN, which would become the largest and most organized member of the group that would become known as the Contras. When Reagan was inaugurated in 1981, he stepped up support of the group and expanded the scope of covert action in the country, allowing the CIA to directly arm, fund, and train the Contras. In 1983, he signed the National Security Decision Directive 77, entitled Management of Public Diplomacy Relative to National Security, Institutionalizing Public Diplomacy. In effect, it was a special planning group within the NSC to coordinate public diplomacy campaigns, the most institutionalized public propaganda ministry in United States history. 324 The group used extensive media propaganda and control efforts, with one 14-page memorandum written by Oliver North detailing over 80 specific publicity stunts designed to influence congressional and public opinion before upcoming contra-aid votes. 325 When the covert war in Nicaragua became public knowledge in 1982, a group of congressmen led by Massachusetts Representative Edward P. Boland tried to end all covert efforts in the country. This was with good reason, as news of the human rights abuses of the Contras became public knowledge. For example, a 1987 Chicago Tribune article noted that the Contras engaged repeatedly in kidnappings, torture and murder of unarmed civilians. 326 The Guardian would delve deeper into the atrocities of the Contras, describing a particular attack where Rosa had her breasts cut off. Then they cut into her chest and took out her heart. The men had their arms broken, their testicles cut off. They were killed by slitting their throats and pulling the tongue out through the slit 327. America's Watch, a human rights group, accused the Contras of 328, targeting health care clinics and health care workers for assassination kidnapping civilians torturing civilians executing civilians, including children who were captured in combat raping women indiscriminately attacking civilians and civilian houses seizing civilian property burning civilian houses in captured towns. These were the principal means of waging war. Meanwhile, Reagan called the Contras the moral equivalent of the Founding Fathers. 329 The terrorism of the Contras was not simply collateral damage of supporting subversive groups. Rather, Evidence shows that it was a deliberate campaign led by the CIA in the vein of Phoenix. In fact, the CIA wrote the training manual for the Contras titled Psychological Operations in Guerrilla Warfare which, among other activities, advocated for assassinating judges and priests, blackmailing citizens, blowing up public buildings, and firing on dissenting citizens. 330 from various English-language newspapers this particular quote is cited as coming from The Guardian. 328 Wikipedia article on the Contras 329 PBS, The Iran-Contra Affair 330 document hosted here at FAS.org. 144. 
Congressman Boland submitted legislation on December 21, 1982 which would become known as the Boland Amendment. It specifically barred the use of funds for the purpose of overthrowing the government of Nicaragua or provoking a war between Nicaragua and Honduras. 331 open defiance was impossible, but the CIA, NSC, and the Reagan administration were dedicated to supporting the Contras at all costs, so they chose various methods of covert defiance by exploiting loopholes in the amendment. As long as the funds going to the Contras were not tagged as being used for overthrowing the Sandinista government, then they could be delivered under the guise of international aid. The use of soliciting third-party funding was also left out of the Boland Amendment. Ultimately, the Boland Amendment had no tangible impact on the covert war in Nicaragua. During the period preceding the Boland Amendment, the CIA directly assisted the Contra's subversive efforts. One example is the use of airstrikes against an airport near Managua. They also placed mines in Nicaraguan harbors in 1984, damaging several ships. The Wall Street Journal, which exposed these covert actions, also revealed the role of Oliver North, a Marine colonel working on assignment with the NSC, in coordinating the actions, one of the first mentions of a name which would become notorious to the public just a few years later. 332 Congress soon realized the ineffectiveness of the Boland Amendment and responded with new legislation that toughened the restrictions on funding the support, known as the Boland Amendment II. It read. During fiscal year 1985, no funds available to the Central Intelligence Agency, the Department of Defense, or any other agency or entity of the United States involved in intelligence activities may be obligated or expended for the purpose or which would have the effect of supporting directly or indirectly military or paramilitary operations in Nicaragua by any nation, group, organization, movement, or individual. 333 This legislation left two loopholes, first, was the use of third-party funds to fund the Contras, and the second was that the text explicitly referred to the actions of the CIA, but failed to mention the NSC, using the logic that it was not an intelligence agency, under the Department of Defense, or even covered under the provision of any, entity of the United States. This was based on the idea that the NSC was the President's Principal Forum for Considering National Security and Foreign Policy Matters with his senior National Security Advisors and Cabinet officials and thus exempt. 334 This transition of techniques led Oliver North to take on a primary role in Contra assistance. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Israel and Iran. Barred from using direct agency funds for the Contra operations, Oliver North and the NSC began to get creative. One result is the infamous diversion memo, written by North, detailing a plan to sell arms to Iran, overcharge the country and funnel excess funds 333 The 1984 Boland Amendment, PDF Warning, 334 Brown University. 146. To the Contras. This plan was blatantly illegal under Operation Staunch, a U.S.-led arms embargo against Iran during the Iran-Iraq War which lasted from 80 to 90. At the outset of the war, the U.S. began arming Iraq, first with $200 million in helicopters, and later escalating to several billion dollars worth of economic aid, the sale of dual-use technology, non-U.S. origin weaponry, military intelligence, special operations training, and direct involvement in warfare against Iran. 335 The Diversion Memo detailed a plan to work with a retired Air Force general and an Iranian businessman to sell arms to Iran, through the cover of Israel, in exchange for the release of American hostages held by Lebanese militants. Initially, the plan worked relatively well, Israel provided Iran with hundreds of tow anti-tank missiles and multiple American hostages were released. 336 The deal was completed just months after Ronald Reagan famously said, The United States gives terrorists no rewards. We make no concessions, we make no deals. 337 Although North estimated that $12 million would be raised for the Contras in this manner, only $2 million ever made it to the group, likely because the private actors involved in the operation were acting with a motivation of profit. 
as is thematic with American covert operations, the funds were funneled through a front organization called Stanford Technology Trading Group International, as well as using proprietary airlines to transfer the missiles, aircraft owned by the CIA and used in normal operations until needed by the agency for covert operations. 338 The story unraveled in 1986 when two Lebanon reporters broke the story of the secret arms transfer. The revelations sparked the widely publicized hearings in the United States to find the truth of the operations. In 1987 hearings, Oliver North was given immunization from self-incrimination before Congress. Regarding the destruction of documents, he humorously noted, I would prefer to say that I shredded documents that day like I did on all other days, but perhaps with increased intensity, that's correct. 339 The hearing's majority report concluded that North's testimony demonstrates that he also lied to members of the executive branch, including the Attorney General, and officials of the State Department, CIA, and NSC. And also that other officials lied repeatedly to Congress and to the American people about the Contra covert action and Iran arms sales, and that he altered and destroyed official documents. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Rex 84. The most shocking revelation of the Contra hearings, which the mainstream media nearly universally failed to report on, was the existence of an emergency preparedness plan known as Rex 84. The only public mention of the plan, known officially as Readiness Exercise 1984, was as follows. Congressman Jack Brooks, Colonel North, in your work at the NSC were you not assigned, at one time, to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? 339 Ibid. 148. Brendan Sullivan North's lawyer, agitatedly, Mr. Chairman? Senator Daniel Inouye, I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area so may I request that you not touch upon that. Brooks, I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers, and several others, that there had been a plan developed, by that same agency, a contingency plan in the event of emergency, that would suspend the American Constitution and I was deeply concerned about it and wondered if that was an area in which he had worked. I believe that it was and I wanted to get his confirmation. Inuyu, may I most respectfully request that that matter not be touched upon at this stage. If we wish to get into this, I'm certain arrangements can be made for an executive session. Luckily, the media was able to get more details on the program which was too sensitive to discuss in a public forum. The Miami Herald, in a July 5, 1987 expose, published the following. Some of President Reagan's top advisors have operated a virtual parallel government outside the traditional cabinet departments and agencies almost from the day Reagan took. 149. Office, congressional investigators and administration officials have concluded. Investigators believe that the advisor's activities extended well beyond the secret arms sales to Iran and aid to the Contras now under investigation. Lt. Col. Oliver North, for example, helped draw up a controversial plan to suspend the Constitution in the event of a national crisis, such as a nuclear war, violent and widespread internal dissent or national opposition to a U.S. military invasion abroad. The Miami Herald 340, emphasis added. Implementation of Rex 84 would have turned control over the United States to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which would act as an emergency czar, and turn control of state and local governments to appointed military commanders, and also included mention of assembly centers and relocation camps to house dissidents. Attorney General William Smith correctly protested that the plan exceeded its proper function as a coordinating agency for emergency preparedness. 341 It doesn't take reading between the lines to see the immediate intent of Rex 84. The NSA, CIA, and other U.S. institutions believed that an invasion of Nicaragua might have been necessary to prevent the spread of communism so close to their borders. Such an idea isn't far-fetched 
Sandinista policies and their agreements with the Soviet Union indicate that they believed an American invasion was imminent. 342 being just a decade removed from the massively unpopular Vietnam War, an invasion would have prompted widespread dissent, and Rex 84 was the NSC's plan to deal with a domestic anti-war movement. The investigation described by the Miami Herald had interesting revelations of other activities. For example, it revealed that the secret government stole President Carter's briefing book used in campaign speeches and presidential debates with Reagan, indicating that the structure was in existence before Reagan's inauguration. It noted meetings with Iranian officials to discuss the release the delay of the release of U.S. embassy hostages until after the election. Lastly, it discussed how certain officials orchestrated leaks to paint Reagan in a positive light, such as the November 4, 1984 Election Day announcement that Soviet jet fighters were on their way to Nicaragua, orchestrated by Oliver North himself. 343. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conclusions. Chief Counsel of the Investigative Senate Committee, Arthur Lyman, wrote in a memo to panel leader Senator Daniel Inwoyo. This is the part of the story that reveals the whole secret. Government within a government operated from the executive office building by a LT. Colonel with its own army, air force, diplomatic agents, intelligence operatives appropriations capacity. 344 As the report of the Congressional Committees investigating the Iran-Contra affair noted, the United States had an actual foreign policy that vastly differed from their public discourse, and was executed in secret without checks and balances. When Congress tried to stop the covert operations, the agencies involved simply found loopholes to subvert their legislation, going as far as to arm two sides fighting against each other in a war, and to use private actors to conduct illicit activities. Furthermore, Rex 84 shows just how serious the secret government was in exerting hegemony in Latin America. The term secret government is not an exaggeration. Various investigations, public and private, noted that Ronald Reagan himself may not have been aware of many activities the group undertook. These facts were all revealed in the mainstream media in a short period preceding the Iran arms sales revelations, yet the public was never able to fully inform itself of the depths of the scandal. Food for thought, 1. Why was the American public so complacent when the facts of a veritable shadow government were thoroughly revealed in the media? Two. Why was there no significant drive for reform of the CIA originating from within Congress? 344 Miami Herald 152 3 How often does the CIA disregard domestic and international law when it interferes with their agenda? 4 Why did the CIA find hegemony in Nicaragua to be so important? What threat, if any, did the country pose to the United States? 5. Does a modern version of Rex 84 exist today? 6. How far will the United States go to suppress domestic dissent the next time they deem a foreign invasion necessary? Continuity of government. The definition of continuity of government is a set of contingency plans to ensure that essential government functions remain in place after a disaster such as nuclear war. In the United States, Continuity of government plans have been on the books since at least the Eisenhower administration. The plans involved building intricate hidden command centers such as the Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center built in 1959, nestled away in the Blue Ridge Mountains. While the government officially classifies MT Weather as a bunker, many sources claim that it is essentially a full-blown city. According to globalsecurity.org, a respected institution in the intelligence community, Mount Weather contains a hospital, sewer treatment system, reservoirs, a power plant, an emergency television studio, and a thorough system of dormitories and office buildings. 345 None of this is out of the ordinary, so to speak. It is reasonable for the government to have such plans in place. However, on September 11, 2001, the continuity of operations plan was officially activated and has been live ever since, meaning that MT weather and similar installations are likely in operation today.
a national emergency exists by reason of the terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center, New York, New York, and the Pentagon, and the continuing and immediate threat of further attacks on the United States, President George W. Bush proclaimed on September 14, 2001. Dick Cheney officially enacted the continuation of government plans shortly after the World Trade Center attacks, although the Bush administration would not confirm that this took place until March, 2002. 346 A simultaneous state of emergency was declared and is also in effect today, extended each year by George Bush and then Barack Obama. 347 CBS reported. A shadow government consisting of 75 or more senior officials has been living and working secretly outside Washington since September 11 in case the nation's capital is crippled by terrorist attack. This is serious business, President Bush said of plans to ensure the continuity of government. Such an operation was conceived as a Cold War precaution against nuclear attack during the Eisenhower administration but never used until now. It went into effect in the first hours after the terror attacks and has evolved over time, said senior government officials who provided details of the plan. Under the Classified Continuity of Operations Plan, which was first reported by the Washington Post in its Friday editions, high-ranking officials representing their departments have begun rotating in and out of the assignment at one of two fortified locations along the East Coast. The Post said the first rotations were made in late October or early November, a fact confirmed by a senior government official late Thursday. Officials who are activated for the duty live and work underground 24 hours a day, away from their families, according to the Post. The shadow government has sent home most of the first wave of deployed personnel, replacing them most commonly at 90-day intervals. The government in waiting is an extension of a policy that has kept Vice President Dick Cheney in secure, undisclosed locations away from Washington. Cheney has moved in and out of public view as threat levels have fluctuated. 348 Serious Business Indeed There have been instances where congressmen have been stonewalled when trying to learn more about the secret operations. One example is Oregon Congressman Peter DeFazio, a key member of the Homeland Security Committee, pushed to review the classified portion of the continuity plan in a secure setting in 2007 but his access was denied. 349 What can we know about the continuity of operations plan currently in effect? Patrick Thronson, editor-in-chief of the University of Michigan Journal of Law Reform, has put together the most comprehensive publicly available paper detailing the states of Emergencies and powers granted to the executive branch. 350 available knowledge is naturally incomplete because many powers and documents are still classified. Some highlights include, Congress is required by statute to vote on the continuation of a state of national emergency every six months. Since September 11, 2001, it has only happened once. There are currently 30 simultaneous declared states of emergency. The executive branch can freeze the assets and prevent financial transactions of individuals. This extends to even basic life necessities. They can go as far as to prohibit donations of food to said person. The president can unilaterally order the inspection and seizure of commercial vessels. The president is authorized to suspend or alter rules for broadcast stations, or authorize control of said station. Provisions to suspend or control internet traffic. Thus, the only apparent legal obstacle standing between present conditions and this degree of government control over mass media and telecommunications is a presidential order. Thrones in the ability to seize property. The delegation of maintaining law and order to the Department of Defense. Extend military tours of duty beyond contractually agreed termination dates. A nation under 30 states of national emergency can hardly claim that emergency laws are the exception to rather than the rule of normal governance. Thronson like every other case study of covert activities highlighted in this book, continuity of operations has a friendly face but the actual workings of the secret government are strictly secret. Suffice it to say that the powers behind the Iran-slash-Contra activities have become fully institutionalized. The implications are that the workings of Congress, 
the Justice Department and other institutions have become merely a show to distract from the reality that a secret government which does not respond to civilian rule and has granted itself sweeping, unchecked powers and is certainly directly operating in the realm of foreign policy, covert activities and likely domestic espionage, among other potential activities. Food for thought, 1. Is there any limit to the powers that the shadow government has granted itself? 2. Why has there been nearly zero coverage of the continuity of government in the 158. Media. Why have only one or two congressmen openly questioned its existence? 3. Who is in control of the continuity of government operations? What is their agenda? 159. The Pedophocracy. Authors note, the next three chapters contain triggers for those who have suffered sexual abuse. Laura Lederer, a senior State Department advisor on trafficking, told me, we're not finding victims in the United States because we're not looking for them, New York Times 351 What you have to understand, John DeCamp, is that sometimes there are forces and events too big, too powerful, with so much at stake for other people or institutions, that you cannot do anything about them, not matter how evil or wrong they are and no matter how dedicated or sincere you are or how much evidence you have. That is simply one of the hard facts of life you have to face. You have done your part. You have tried to expose the evil and wrongdoing. It has hurt you terribly. But it has not killed you up to this point. I am telling you, get out of this before it does. Sometimes things are just too big for us to deal with, and we have to step aside and let history take its course. For you, John, this is one of those times. Former CIA Director William Colby 352 Asterisk 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 From Washington, D.C. Homosexual Prostitution Inquiry Ensnares VIPs with Reagan, Bush 353 This article was published in the Washington Times and was written by award-winning, 353 full text can be read here. 161 Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist Paul Rodriguez After years of research, Rodriguez had compiled the radical evidence necessary to publish such claims. He had uncovered a homosexual prostitution ring tied to the White House. One central figure, Craig Spence, a Republican power broker, had the political clout to bring prostitutes on midnight tours of the White House. The report names multiple White House insiders, military personnel and members of major media institutions as clients, based on credit card records procured by Rodriguez. Among the client names contained in the vouchers, and identified by prostitutes and escort operators, are government officials, locally based U.S. military officers, businessmen, lawyers, bankers, congressional aides, and other professionals. Although the confiscated material was turned over to district police on the scene, witnesses and law enforcement agents say the Secret Service kept one box containing names and other information about high-level government officials who were clients of the mail escort business. District police officials say that, to their knowledge, this is the first time the Secret Service has ever become involved in such a raid in this area. Washington Times Craig Spence would throw extravagant parties for the Washington, D.C. elite, with call boys freely available for interested party goers. Various associates, including multiple of Spence's bodyguards, came forward and admitted that his house, where the parties were located, was thoroughly bugged with audio and video recording equipment, with the intent of extortion and blackmail of those who ended up in compromising positions. 354 Spence was somewhat of a mystery man. What type of employment did he have? No one knew for sure, though Spence himself would often boast of his important connections. One of his associates told the Times. He described Mr. Spence as strange, saying he often boasted that he was working for the CIA, and on one occasion said he was going to disappear for a while because he had an important CIA assignment. According to the businessman, Mr. Spence told him that the CIA might double-cross him, however, and kill him instead and then make it look like a suicide. 
Washington Times 355 Indeed, Spence would die just months after the interview, of an apparent suicide, but not after admitting that his parties were bugged by friendly intelligence assets which he refused to name. 356 The investigation by Paul Rodriguez and his associates would also screech to a halt after all of the evidence was either classified by the Secret Service or tied up in red tape. Someone in a high position of power clearly did not want the full extent of the revelations to become public. Homosexual prostitution on its own isn't shocking, and depending on your conceptions of morality, no different than the heterosexual prostitution that is likewise. Rampant in Washington, D.C. with the only tangible difference being the repercussions of entrapment, especially for Republicans. However, one particular part of the investigation leads us down a shocking rabbit hole. In addition to credit card fraud, the investigation is said to be focused on illegal interstate prostitution, abduction and use of minors for sexual perversion, extortion, larceny and related illicit drug trafficking and use by prostitutes and their clients. Washington Times, Emphasis Mine 357 In fact, the name Craig Spence would appear repeatedly in another major prostitution inquiry, this one centered around children, known today as the Franklin Scandal, one of the darkest stains in the history of the United States. Asterisk 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 To Franklin, Nebraska the story of the Franklin Scandal begins with Lawrence E. King, one of the fastest rising Republican stars of the 1980s. He was a public figure in Franklin, Nebraska who ran the Franklin Federal Credit Union, along with a series of restaurants and bars. These various businesses apparently furnished King's lavish lifestyle of private jets, extravagant parties and an entourage of assistants and bodyguards. Larry King, as he was known, was accused by seven children of child abuse and prostitution before he sang the national anthem at the 1988 Republican National Convention but despite various petitions to local police and the FBI, no official investigations were ever undertaken. 358 One of the allegations began from the serious abuse of children at the hands of Jarrett and Barbara Webb, the former a member of the Franklin Credit Union board the latter a cousin of King, who adopted various foster children and would proceed to subject them to horrific physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. The girls housed at the Webbs told of being taken to various parties in the Franklin area where Larry King and other important local figures sexually abused them. One of the girls, Ulysses Washington, recalled being flown on King's private jets to be abused across the country. Among the first accusers was Ulysses Washington, who claimed King flew her to out-of-state pedophilic orgies. She had been adopted by relatives of King's in the 1970s. Her new mother was King's cousin Barbara Webb, and her new father was husband Jared Webb, who sat on the board of the Franklin Federal Credit Union. To Ulysses Washington, King had been Uncle Larry. Larry King set up the pedophile ring, says Ulysses. From my knowledge and from what I saw go down, he was the man who got it moving and rolling. Everything went through him. He loves boys. He loves them like he shouldn't. The Franklin Scandal, a story of power brokes, child abuse, and betrayal 359 Despite Ulysses passing various lie detector tests, charges were never pressed against. The Webs. 360 The Foster Care Review Board was the first organization to come across various cases of abuse, from Ulysses Washington and others. They wrote numerous letters to Nebraska's Attorney General Robert Speyer urging an investigation, but their pleas were ignored. The FCRB testified to the state legislature's Investigative Executive Review Board subcommittee in 1988 that, FCRB Chairman Dennis Carlson, the nature of these allegations are something that is going to shock the committee. They deal with cult activities, they deal with sexual abuse, and there's a correlation between these two different reports. We have, the Boys Town Report, prepared by a worker from Boys Town named Julie Walters, which, contains the allegations of the children that were in the Webb Foster home, Nellie primarily. Years later, well, two years later, 
we have Loretta Smith in Richard Young Hospital who's making allegations against Larry King and as far as we know there is no relationship between Nellie and Loretta Smith. Both reports talk about the Omaha Girls Club, both reports mention a specific individual who is the superintendent of schools. State Senator Remmers, the question that came into mind, it's been in my mind since you've been testifying and I think you've answered part of it just now, is you're talking about about these abuses from children from Boys Town and Girls Club and so 360 IBID. 166. Fourth, now is there a common thread that goes over here to the credit union deal that we are investigating? In other words to the Franklin Credit Union? Is there a common thread there that kind of leads to that? FCRB member Carol Stitt, well, the common thread is Larry King. Remmers, yes, that's what I mean. It all goes back to him. Okay. Stitt, yes, he seems to be more the organizer, or the high-class pimp, I mean if that helps fit this together. 361 Larry King would also be linked to embezzlement before he sang the national anthem at the 1988 Republican National Convention, but again avoided an investigation. The facade unraveled in November 1988, when an IRS investigation revealed that King had stolen over $40 million from the coffers of the Franklin Federal Credit Union. The financial corruption alone shocked the city, but soon reports started circulating that in addition to various fraudulent accounting documents, investigators found a huge stash of child pornography as well. 362 more rumors of sexual abuse began to arise, with multiple allegations that Larry King was using children from Boys Town, the nearby Catholic charitable institution for orphaned youth. 363 His yellow sports car was notorious on the Boys Town campus, where he would drive around and pick up minors for his pedophilic activities. The Catholic management denied any connection to King, but financial records showed that Boys Town had a close-knit relationship to the Franklin Federal Credit Union. 364 federal and local authorities immediately moved to close the investigation and seal evidence, claiming that allegations of child abuse were unfounded. 365 The authorities backtracked and stated that they had done everything in their power to investigate these claims. Attorney General Robert Speyer said, We did receive some sensitive information in July. My office acted promptly and professionally and nothing was set on. However, it would later be revealed that no authorities ever interviewed Ulysses Washington and other children noted by the FCRB until three years later after they made their report public. 366 Despite this, Omaha Chief of Police Robert Wadman stated to the press that every step that should have been taken, was taken. 367 However, Wadman would later confess that he had never contacted Ulysses Washington, one of the children abused at the hands of Webb, nor the Child Protective Services Department that handled Washington's claims. 368 Wadman would later be identified as a child abuser at King's parties by four different victims. 369. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Obstruction, threats, and murder. In an early police investigation, low-level police officers attempted to keep their inquiries a secret from Wadman, seemingly knowing that he would be adamant about shutting down their investigation. Nebraska Foster Care Review Board official Dennis Carlson related Omaha Police Officer Carmian's testimony to the legislature's executive board hearing. Officer Carmian told me some things which I found to be somewhat startling. I asked if he was interested in information regarding Larry King and he said, yes we are, we're conducting what he called a super sensitive investigation of Larry King and he said this investigation was so super sensitive that they were not even using the steno pool in the Omaha Police Department. They were handwriting their police reports, and he also told me that Chief Wadman had come to their unit and directly asked if they were investigating Larry King. Investigator Carmian told me, we lied to the chief and we said, no, we are not investigating Larry King. Okay. So that conversation took place on July 20 of 1988 370 shortly afterward, Officer Carmian was transferred out of the robbery and sex unit and the investigation stalled. 
on July 5, 1989, in a lengthy inter-office communication to Omaha Public Safety Director Pete Foxall, a cousin of Larry King, Wadman announced that Carmian needed a mental health evaluation. 371 many were not convinced of the police department's conclusion that there was no substance to the abuse allegations, including a group of 12 state senators who decided to create their own parallel commission to investigate the charges, lead by Senator Lauren Schmidt. Following the money trail, Schmidt and his team quickly found that it could be traced directly to the sex parties and child abuse. It became clear to Schmidt that he was uncovering some serious dirty laundry. I received a phone call on the floor of the legislature. The caller would not identify himself, but he said, Lauren, you do not want to have an investigation of the Franklin Federal Credit Union, and I asked, who am I speaking to? And they said, that doesn't matter, but you shouldn't have that investigation. And I said, well, why not? And he said, it will reach to the highest levels of the Republican Party, and we're both good Republicans. Lauren Schmidt 372 Schmidt wasn't the only one to receive threats. The lead investigator of the state senator's committee, Gary Caridori, had also specified that he had received a series of threats, such as obvious tampering with his vehicle, as to send a message. In early July 1990, Caridori made a trip to Chicago to meet with a secret informant who had evidence which would blow the lid off the case, and reportedly confided to a friend that he was one step ahead of those who wanted to squash the investigation, saying that if they knew what information he had, he would be killed. 373 Upon returning from Chicago, Caridori's plane crashed, killing him and his son. The National Transportation Safety Board investigation found that the wreckage was scattered over a radius between three-fourths to one mile, indicating without a doubt that the plane broke up in the air, instead of upon impact. Certain items were missing from the crash, most notably Caridora's briefcase. Within 24 hours, all of the evidence was collected by the FBI and sealed. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Paul Bonaxi trial. What information was so important that the pedophile network would kill the lead investigator in what looked like a blatant assassination? It turns out he was meeting with Russell Rusty Nelson, a photographer for Larry King, who attended King's parties with the intention of photographing powerful men in compromising positions with minors, in order to blackmail them later. 375 Like Craig Spence, King was known to throw lavish parties for the Republican elite, with underage prostitutes allegedly in attendance. Rusty Nelson was in hiding for an entire decade after the Franklin scandal broke but ended his silence under oath during a court hearing in 1999, in order to set the record straight. He revealed that he had a very close relationship with King and kept hundreds of thousands of photographs of King's business dealings and parties in various locations. Most of the evidence had been confiscated, and more had been destroyed in Gary Caradora's plane crash. Rusty's testimony to the district court was very interesting. Among other events, he revealed that he personally saw Larry King place a direct call to then-President Ronald Reagan when other associates could not resolve a specific problem. He also claimed to have seen and taken pictures of the chief of police of Omaha Robert Wadman at various parties, engaged in various sexual acts with minors, and had once seen Wadman accept a large envelope full of bearer bonds from King. While most of Rusty's evidence was confiscated, he was able to provide the court with photographs that corroborated his close 374 conspiracy of silence. 375 Court Transcripts, Paul Bonax IVS Lawrence E. King 171 relationship to King, such as photographs of King inside his private jet and limousine, and alongside male strippers. 376 The district court hearing was not about Rusty Nelson, but rather for compensation for one of the victims, Paul Bonaxi, who had first made accusations of abuse against Larry King in 1986, two years before there was even a Franklin scandal. The testimony given was so convincing that the judge awarded Bonaxi with $1 million. 
The plan was to donate the proceeds to charitable organizations dealing with child abuse, but King has never paid. Paul Bonaxi suffered from multiple personality disorder, a diagnosis confirmed by three different state-appointed psychiatrists, from extreme abuse he had received beginning at the age of three. At the age of eight, he became associated with Larry King and began attending his parties as a child prostitute. The type of abuse Bonaxi underwent at the hands of Larry King is shocking. Bonaxi, they put guns up to my head, they put guns in my mouth. Larry King sent out boys, men, to jump me, he had them pretty well beat the tar out of me from the waist down so no one would see the marks, I had my fingers broken. I can remember them burning me with hot instruments, placing stuff inside me. Almost what I would call a cattle prod. Judge Urbom done by Larry King at his direction. Bonaxi, at his direction. Later on in the trial he would claim. If they wanted to get something passed in the legislature, he would put some people that were against it in a compromising position, by using us boys and girls. 377 One of the men in Washington that Paul Bonaxi claimed abused him is Democratic Senator Barney Frank. Bonaxi was also taken on the very same midnight tours of the White House hosted by Craig Spence that journalist Paul Rodriguez wrote about in the Washington Times, as a child. He claimed that immediately after the tours of the White House, he was taken to another place to be sexually abused. 378 Asterisk 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 The Grand Jury Cover-Up Before his untimely death, Gary Caridori had compiled a leads list of 271 victims of sexual abuse in the Franklin area, though his death precluded interviewing most, and others recanted their stories under pressure from federal authorities, often accompanied by the threat of jail time for perjury. Along with Paul Bonaxi, the investigation proceeded with three other primary witnesses, Troy Boner, Danny King, no relation to Larry, and Alicia Owens. Both Boner and Owens recounted tales, after passing multiple state-sponsored lie detector tests, 379 of attending hundreds of parties hosted by Larry King where they were abused by King and other prominent men in Lincoln and Omaha. The three would repeatedly corroborate each other in interviews taken under oath by Gary Caridori, initially without knowledge of each other's participation in the investigation. 380 Most of the victims claimed that they were used to transport drugs across state lines, at the demand of Larry King and Alan Baer, a prominent Omaha millionaire. Gary Caridori once followed a lead of Alicia Owens where she claimed that she was often abused at the French Café in Omaha. He talked to the former manager on the telephone, Sheila McGuire, who told Gary that We had parties in my apartment above the French Café. Larry King would wine and dine potential investors downstairs at the café. When the French café closed about 1 a.m., King and his man called parking lot Bob who worked for him, and was our coke connection, would bring people upstairs to my place. If Larry King investors wanted drugs, booze, children, or hookers, male or female, we'd get them. While these guests of King's took their pleasures with the kids or whoever King would sit and watch while he drank, did coke and played with his young boys. One time, when this guy IRV from NYC wanted Sandra who was about 12 or 13 years old and getting her first period, Larry intervened when Sandra refused. King pulled out a roll of $100 bills and gave Sandra five of them. King then pulled out a small gram of coke and gave that to Sandra. Sandra finally agreed. And went off to bed with IRV. King took good care of the local and out-of-town high rollers. If you had the money to invest at Franklin, King would cater to your most deranged perversion. And, let me tell you another thing. The boys in the boardrooms around Omaha are shitting in their brogans. If this case gets cracked open the list of involved will read like who's who. King and his crew have ruined a lot of children's lives. 381 The New York Times confirmed that both federal and state investigators were given thousands of files regarding sexual abuse from children and testimonies from people involved in the foster care and education system. 382 What happened next is amazing. 
instead of indictments of the accused perpetrators to develop cases against them, both Douglas County and federal grand juries ordered the thousands of files to be sealed, declined to interview dozens of witnesses, and then brought charges of perjury against Alicia Owens. 383 Both grand juries concluded that Troy Boner and Alicia Owens had indeed been abused, but claimed that the adults they testified against were innocent. Alicia Owens was later found guilty of perjury, and sentenced to between 9 and 15 years. She ended up spending two years in solitary confinement, more than any other woman in Nebraska history, and a clear message to other victims, stay silent. 384 This is unprecedented, probably in the history of the United States. If the children are not telling the truth, particularly if they have been abused, they need help, medical attention. You don't throw them in jail. Dr. Judy Ann Denson Gerber, a lawyer, psychiatrist, and nationally prominent specialist on child abuse, during her visit to Nebraska in December 1990. 385 On the same day that Alicia Owens was convicted of perjury, the charges against Paul Bonaxi, who told a very similar story, were dropped. 386 Perhaps they did not want certain testimony to come to trial, such as Bonaxi's claim that Larry King would send limousines to Offutt Air Force Base and pick up CIA agents for his parties. 387 The grand jury trial was a mockery of justice, where the state-appointed attorney Samuel Van Pelt vigorously attacked the charges and mocked the allegations of the defendants. It has to be noted that a grand jury is a special type of proceeding where the attorney chooses all of the witnesses and what evidence is presented, there is no presentation of the defense or cross-examination. A former chief judge of New York State once quipped that a special prosecutor could persuade a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich 388. There are shocking irregularities with the grand jury proceedings. First, it never called Larry King to testify. In fact, the evidence of child abuse and child pornography has never been presented against King in any court of law. One member of the Douglas County Grand Jury claimed that the Van Pelt helped write the final report, which is illegal. The report contains some very peculiar statements, such as children do have the right to expect that if they exhibit reasonable behavior, they will not be abused. Emphasis added. It also contained blatant lies, such as the claim that Paul Bonaxi's doctor said that Bonaxi was not capable of the truth, even though not only was the doctor not called to testify, he said elsewhere that he believed Bonaxi's story. 389 Owens' attorney, Henry Rosenthal, found that the evidence shown to the grand jury was deliberately tampered with. The video testimony taken by Gary Caradori was edited to remove sections where Troy Boner and Alicia Owens corroborated each other's claims. 390 The lawyer representing originally Owens, Boner and, Danny, King originally claimed to have had over 100 clients who had suffered sexual abuse in relation to King and Boys Town, but then later claimed that their testimonies were all fabrications, only months before admitting she had an affair with an FBI agent who had bullied Troy Boner into temporarily recanting his testimony. 391 There is also the curious trend of upward mobility for a group of men who were instrumental in rigging the grand juries. 391 U.S. Magistrate Richard Kopf, who deposited Lawrence King in a federal psychiatric hospital so he wouldn't have to appear before the grand juries, and signed off on the FBI's federal search warrant of Alicia Owens' prison cell, is now a U.S. District Court judge. 2. Thomas Thicken, Assistant U.S. Attorney for District of Nebraska, who prosecuted the federal grand jury in Nebraska is now a U.S. Magistrate. 3. Gerald Moran, who was the Douglas County Deputy Attorney who prosecuted the Alicia Owen trial, is now a Douglas County District Judge. 4. Robert Sigler, who was the Douglas County Deputy Attorney who prosecuted Alicia Owen throughout her multiple appeals, is now an Assistant U.S. Attorney for the District of Nebraska. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Troy Boner. Troy Boner had recounted his testimony during this period, after receiving threats that he himself would become the victim of perjury charges. However, 
in 1993 he submitted an affidavit detailing his intimidation and stating unequivocally that his testimony as well as those of his peers were truthful. I lied because I truly believed and still do believe that it was a situation where I must either, lie or die and at the insistence primarily of the Federal Bureau of Investigation officials who were dealing with me at that time, Troy Boner's affidavit 393 Boner repeated the allegations that the Chief of Police Robert Wadman and the Omaha Herald editor Harold Anderson were primary players in his abuse and the abuse of his peers. He recounts the various tactics the FBI used in his intimidation, including alluding to harm that may come about to a family member if he persisted in telling his story. Shortly after these threats, Troy's brother Sean was found dead from a gunshot wound. The official story was a game of Russian roulette. 394 Troy cites this as a primary motivating factor in coming forward with the truth in his affidavit. But, maybe the most important thing any honest investigator should do is to ask me, Troy Boner, or any of the other kids such as Alicia or Paul Bonaxi, to take polygraph, lie detector tests side by side on the same questions with the people with the people we are accusing of these things. Example, ask Alan Bear if he shot mainline drugs into me and if he is a major drug dealer and if he had sex with me. Ask Eugene Mahoney if he met me at a bookstore in Council Bluffs and used to regularly pay me to have sex with him as a boy. Ask Redacted to take a polygraph test on whether he is a big-time drug dealer. Troy Boner's affidavit, emphasis retained, the polygraph tests never happened. In 2004, Troy Boner entered an Omaha hospital visibly shaken and adamant that he was being targeted because of his testimony. The next day, he was found in a hospital room dead, drugged and beaten. 395 The timing might be related to the re-election campaign of George W. Bush, who multiple victims claimed had attended Larry King's parties. Troy would round out a suspicious death list that had recently reached 15 names, including, 396 1. Troy Boner 2. Sean Boner, Troy's brother, found shot in the head shortly after Troy was to testify before court. The official explanation of his death was ruled to be a game of Russian roulette. 3. Bill Baker, associate of Larry King and alleged to be involved in the production of child pornography. 395 to Camp 396 Ibid. 179. 4. Gary Caridori and his 8-year-old son, Andrew, killed in a plane crash. 5. Newt Koppel, a primary informant of Caridori, was 70 when he died in his sleep but exhibited no health problems before his death. 6. Claire Howard, the secretary of Alan Bear, the wealthy Omaha businessman who was alleged to be a prime member of the child abuse ring. Also died in her sleep. 7. Mike Lewis, former caregiver of victim witness Loretta Smith. Death attributed to severe diabetic reaction at the age of 32. 8. Joe Malek, associate of King, died from a gunshot which was ruled a suicide. 9. Aaron Owen, the brother of victim witness Alicia Owen, died in his jail cell hours before Alicia was supposed to testify, ruled a suicide. 10. Charlie Rogers, alleged sexual partner of Larry King, died of a shotgun wound to the head, ruled a suicide. 11. Bill Skolsky, Omaha police officer said to be secretly keeping a file on Larry King, died of a heart attack. 12. Kathleen Sorensen, foster parent of children who had escaped the Webb family, an outspoken activist on raising awareness of the abuse of the children she cared for. 13. Curtis Tucker, an associate of Larry King, who allegedly jumped out the window of a Holiday Inn in Omaha. 14. Harmon Tucker, a school superintendent in Omaha. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conspiracy of Silence. In 1993, a television station in Yorkshire, England traveled to Franklin to uncover. 180. The Truth About the Tale of Child Abuse in Franklin, Working in Tandem with the Discovery Channel. It was called Conspiracy of Silence and the very day it was set to air, it was pulled. No explanation has ever been given, though there are rumors that an anonymous person paid the Discovery Channel $500,000 to revoke the television rights to the film. 
it would only be unofficially released two years later, when someone who helped produce the video and felt it was so important it needed to be public, leaked a rough draft from the copy room to attorney and former state senator John DeCamp. It is now widely available for viewing online. Overall, eight high-profile Omaha figures would be accused of sexual assault, with testimonies corroborated between victims. They were, 397 1. Larry King 2. Robert Wadman, Omaha Chief of Police 3. Harold Anderson, recently retired editor of the Omaha World Herald 4. Alan Bear, wealthy businessman 5. Dewood Finch, Superintendent of Schools. 6. Peter Citron, Media Personality. 7. Judge Theodore Carson. 8. P.J. Morgan, Mayor of Omaha of these men, only one would be convicted of child abuse, Peter Citron, on an unrelated breakout of pedophilia claims which launched a separate investigation. Before the allegations leading to Citron's arrest broke, he was threatening to sue John DeCamp for naming him as a child abuser in a memo sent to the Omaha press. How could such a massive and orchestrated cover-up take place? It involved the FBI 397 conspiracy of silence. 181. Withholding all sensitive files, including explicit videos and pictures of the relationships between King and his associates and young children. It involved a campaign of denial by the Omaha Police Department, whose chief was a primary member of the child abuse ring, and a disinformation campaign by Nebraska's media, who also had important members implicated in the ring. It involved zealous FBI agents who were self-expressed good friends with Robert Wadman. And it involved a campaign of suspicious deaths designed to silence testimony. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, it involved an American public unwilling to believe that powerful men could be implicated in child abuse, child prostitution, and drug running. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Dutru Affair. In the summer of 1995, a wave of disappearances of young girls in Belgium grabbed national headlines. The series of kidnappings would continue through the next year, with the Belgium Bob, FBI equivalent, unable to develop any leads. Then in the summer of 96, an anonymous tip about a suspicious white van led investigators to the doorsteps of Mark Dutru, a known pedophile who had only recently been released from prison after serving three years of a 13-year sentence, despite warnings from various professionals and even his own mother that he was likely to be a repeat offender. 398 The man who let Dutru out of prison, Justice Minister Melchior Wadelet, would soon be promoted to serve as a judge at the European Court of Justice at The Hague. 399 Various stories soon emerged in the press regarding how the Bob had repeatedly, and suspiciously, failed to implicate Dutru during the previous years. For example, Bob officer René Michaud once searched Dutru's house, but failed to investigate screams he heard, instead believing the tale that the voices were coming from children outside. Nor did he find the odd construction of Dutrua's basement, shaped in an L with one wall much newer than the others, reason for inquiry. 400 at the time, Dutru, though unemployed and receiving welfare from the state, owned seven homes and lived quite lavishly from his involvement in selling children and child porn. 401 Michaud ignored reports from an informant who claimed to have been made an offer by Dutru to kidnap young girls in exchange for about 4,000 euros. 402 He once had in his possession a videotape of Dutru constructing his makeshift basement dungeon, and raping a 14-year-old girl, but the tape was returned to Dutru's wife, apparently unviewed. 403 Michaud's failures likely directly led to the death of two girls who were held captive by Dutru at the time of the investigation and reportedly died of starvation. The arrest of Dutru did not come until a new lead investigator, Jean-Marc Connoret, was assigned to the case. For the first time, many victims of child abuse and trafficking in Belgium felt that they had someone they could trust, and began to come forward with their stories. The case quickly spiraled to the point where Dutra was no longer the focus. During the investigation, these victims were each assigned a number, appended after an X. For example, X1 was first sexually abused at the age of 2, 
at the hands of her grandmother, who owned a hotel frequented by pedophiles. At the age of four, she was introduced to a pimp who would take her out to other locations for abuse and torture. She was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder, now known as dissociative identity disorder. Even after getting married and moving away at the age of 19, she was never able to fully leave the network. Occasionally, when her husband was out of town, her old pimp would show up and take her back to places she was abused as a child, and would be raped. 404 she named and described in great detail, to a specially assembled police team, the people and places involved in the pedophile ring. Senior judges, one of the country's most powerful politicians, now dead, and a very influential banker were included. 405 The sessions not only involved sex, they included sadism, torture and murder, and again, she described in detail, the place, the victims, and how they were killed. BBC 406 X1 and other witnesses recounted being raped by dogs and snakes, and being forced to witness the murders of other children which were captured on videotape. 407 X1 was quoted as saying. In Brussels there was a villa in which a room was set up with built-in cameras. Even in the 1970s these cameras were so discreet that only the people who maintained them and the child prostitutes knew where they were located. Why did I had to get those guys clearly in the picture, why was I supposed to get them to hit me and brutally rape me? Why was regular sex often not enough? Blackmail, the word that was never mentioned, I only started to really understand when I was 13, 14 years old, the other victims told similar stories, all independent of one another. Most had developed multiple personality disorder, and had been turned over to the network by family members. Many accurately and independently verified locations and members of the network who were their abusers. 409 Perhaps most importantly, they all claimed that high-profile members of society were involved. 410 X1 also corroborated that one of Dutrua's associates, Jean-Michel Nihal, was instrumental in the abuse parties. Nihal had significant connections among Belgian political and financial elite, and later confessed to organizing an orgy at a Belgian chateau attended by government officials, described by the press as a policeman's orgy. 411 It emerged that Tutru and Nihal were part of a long-distance child trafficking ring that imported children from Slovakia, among other places. Nihal would later be found not guilty, a decision made by the judges who overruled a guilty verdict by the jury. Just as the investigation was heating up and began to show promise, it was completely dismantled from higher powers. Jean-Marc Konorit was dismissed from the case, which drew huge criticism from across the nation. 412 It prompted the event known as the White March, in which 300,000 Belgians from the nation of just 10 million took to the streets to protest the dismissal. 413,414 Connor Et would later break down in tears in court while describing the death threats he received when he was still involved with the investigation. 415 A second change that greatly affected the proceedings was the introduction of a strict hierarchy to the examinations of the witnesses, which was previously undertaken by Bob officers working independently, overseen by Gendarmerie Commandant Jean-Luc Duterm. Duterm would conduct abusive interrogations which emotionally devastated the witnesses who were suffering from multiple personality disorder. In addition, the prosecutor that replaced Connor at Jacques Langlois, deliberately obfuscated the investigation. He sent police out on false tips and helped spread disinformation in the media. Jean-Marc Connord once described how he felt about the leads that Langlois would end up investigating. I regularly and much earlier complained about those terrible circumstances in which I had to work in the Dutra case. We continually received information about all kinds of bizarre leads. Those then received a lot of media attention, but to us meant nothing but time loss. Just think about the Abrazax case and the digs in Jumit. If I remember correctly, the first leads in those two cases were already put under my nose in the very beginning of the investigation. 
Afterwards precisely Abrazax and Jumit were used by the media as an argument to say that the whole investigation was manipulated and pointed towards false leads. I experienced the same thing in the Cools case, in which the police began to manipulate and was wholeheartedly supported by the media. Humo, Belgian publication, 416 fuel to the fire would be added when a highly regarded children's activist, Marie France Bot, claimed that prosecutors were sitting on a politically sensitive list of high-profile customers of Dutrua's thousands of videotapes. Mark Verwilgen, the Flemish parliamentarian who became the most popular politician in the country after leading the inquiry into Dutrua, claimed that many in the Belgian establishment, including heads of government, refused to cooperate, and sought to stifle and ridicule his report. He claimed that magistrates and police were officially told to not answer certain questions, in what he described as a characteristic smothering operation. He was further quoted as saying for me, the Dutru affair is a question of organized crime. 418A parliamentary panel revealed the names of 30 government officials it said were complicit in the hiding of Dutrua's misdeeds, none have been punished. 419 As the trial came to an end in 2004 and faded from the public spotlight, Dutru adamantly claimed that he was not a lone pedophile but instead was acting on behalf of a large pedophile ring. 420 Mark Dutru insisted yesterday that he was not a lone predator who kidnapped and raped young girls but part of a wider pedophile ring. Dutru portrayed himself as a victim a puppet in a show trial who had to be put away to hide the truth and serve the interests of organized corruption. Only 10% of the case had been examined, he said, asking why independent-minded policemen had been removed from the investigating team. He urged police to follow up clues he said would prove he was working for a network which kidnapped girls to be sold into prostitution. Today, many Belgians have expressed sorrow that most of the details of the evidence will never be known. The files are sealed, with the presiding judge claiming he saw no reason to reopen them. The Dutru affair follows a shockingly similar pattern to the events in Franklin, Nebraska. The local police have no interest in uncovering the child abuse ring and even go to seemingly absurd lengths to keep it a secret. The courts are hostile towards the witnesses and the trials are deliberately obfuscated. Charges of perjury are brought against those who refuse to recant their stories. The federal investigators withheld proof of the claims of the witnesses, including the names of high-profile members of the child abuse ring and visual evidence of their crimes. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The British aristocracy pedophocracy officers in London were inquiring into allegations made by a teenage rent boy that a cabinet minister had been abusing him. The youth claimed to be one of a number of boys regularly having sex with rich and powerful men in the 1980s, some of whom would fly to the illegal orgies from Europe. As well as the cabinet minister, who is still alive, he pointed the finger at judges, European bigwigs and senior civil servants. He told his story to detectives, who are understood to have received other allegations against the minister. But a former detective who worked on the case revealed they were suddenly told to halt the probe. The furious ex-policeman said, it wasn't that we ran out of leads but it reached a point where a warning to stop came. It was a case of get rid of everything, never say a word to anyone. It was made very clear to me that to continue asking questions would jeopardize my career. The Sunday Daily Star 421 The passing of Sir Jimmy Seville in October 2011, entertainer, socialite and personal friend of the royal family, opened the floodgates of a myriad of revelations, with hundreds of victims coming forward claiming they were abused at the hands of Seville in esteemed institutions such as BBC and various hospitals. It seemed that many people were aware of the transgressions, but no one acted. Years later, new revelations are coming to light on a weekly basis. One interesting story was published in January of 2013 which read, Jimmy Seville was part of Satanic Ring. 422 Dr. Sinizan told the Sunday Express she first spoke to the victim in 1992. She had been a patient at Stoke Mandeville in 1975 when Seville was a regular visitor. She recalled being led into a room that was filled with candles on the lowest level of the hospital, somewhere that was not regularly used by staff. 
Several adults were there, including Jimmy Seville who, like the others, was wearing a robe and a mask. She recognized him because of his distinctive voice and the fact that his blonde hair was protruding from the side of the mask. He was not the leader but he was seen as important because of his fame. She was molested, raped and beaten and heard words that sounded like Ave Satanas, a Latinese version of Hail Satan, being chanted. There was no mention of any other child being there and she cannot remember how long the attack lasted but she was left extremely frightened and shaken. Allegations of powerful pedophile rings in Britain were nothing new. Over 30 years ago, in 1981, Tory MP Geoffrey Dickens warned Parliament against a pedophile ring he had uncovered, claiming that the network involved big, big names, people in positions of power, influence and responsibility and threatened to expose them in Parliament. 423 Dickens made waves regarding the pedophile ring and dossiers he received for four years in Parliament before backing down in the face of harassment and death threats. It seems that no one took him seriously at the time, but new evidence shows that his claims had merit. In January 2013, Scotland Yard reopened their investigation. Last month Metropolitan Police began Operation Fernbridge into allegations that residents of a children's home in Richmond, West London, were taken to the nearby Elm Guest House in Barnes, where they were abused. Pornography involving adults Having sex with children was allegedly shot at the property and then circulated commercially. Sir Peter was among the visitors to the property. Others, according to a list seized by Scotland Yard last month, were the late Liberal MP Cyril Smith, the former Russian spy Sir Anthony Blunt, a Sinn Féin politician, a Labour MP, and several Conservative politicians. After neighbours complained about the arrival of children, the police raided the guest house in 1982 but the operation was mysteriously cut short. A 2003 investigation also failed. The Independent 424 over 30 years later, the very first man that Dickens accused, Sir Peter Heyman, MI6 operative, was arrested. The new inquiry was prompted by MP Tom Watson, who has requested the original dossier collected by Dickens, but Scotland Yard has been unable to produce it. Child abuse and pedophilia is rampant among the British elite, and the revelations of Jimmy Seville has opened new opportunities for investigations of former cases. After all, by December 12, 2012, the number of victims who had come forward claiming abuse at the hands of Jimmy Seville had reached 450, spanning dozens of children's homes and hospitals. 425 two famous children's homes who were each subject to their own vast child. Abuse scandals in the last decade, Haute de la Garen on Jersey Island, and Bryn S. N. Boys Home in Wrexham, North Wales, have had a series of fresh allegations in the wake of the Seville revelations. In Wrexham, North Wales, the tale is a familiar one. Boys from the Bryn S. Inn home would be taken to parties throughout the city where they acted as child prostitutes for socialites and were severely sexually abused. Over the years, 27 police inquiries failed to disclose the scale of the alleged abuse. 13 reports by social services went unpublished. Several journalists reached out for the truth and ended up scorched by libel actions. When police finally launched a major inquiry, in 1991, they secured the conviction of only four care workers and concluded that there was no evidence of a pedophile ring. CLWYD County Council then commissioned its own independent inquiry but decreed that its report could not be published. The Guardian 426 celebrated investigative journalist Nick Davies, writing for The Guardian, nails the concept and motivation behind these various sex abuse scandals with the following statement. Power is the fabric of a pedophile ring, essential first to subjugate the children, whose passivity is essential for the adults. Indulgence, and second, where possible, to neutralize the authorities who might otherwise frustrate its activities. Writing about a new tribunal launched into the Wrexham case in 1997, Davies noted that over 300 men and women had come forward, naming 148 different abusers. 
the official Wrexham inquiry concluded that widespread abuse of boys did indeed occur at Bryn Essen and other nearby children's homes, and that dozens of potential inquiries were completely suppressed by administrators. During the period under review there was a pedophile ring in the Wrexham and Chester areas in the sense that there were a number of male persons, many of them known to each other, who were engaged in pedophile activities and were targeting young males in their middle teens. The evidence does not establish that they were solely or mainly interested in persons in care but such youngsters were particularly vulnerable to their approaches. 427 After the Seville revelations, 76 new victims came forward in North Wales, and the investigation has been reopened. The victims claimed that the 1997 inquiry only examined a small fraction of the abuse allegations. 428 The Independent revealed in 2012 further details of a cover-up. A damning report that laid bare the North Wales child abuse scandal might have aired the issue of sex attacks on children in care nearly half a decade before an official judicial inquiry in 2000. Instead copies of the report were ordered to be destroyed because the council that commissioned it feared it might be sued, the Independent on Sunday can reveal. Only a handful remain including one obtained by this newspaper. The Independent they claim the following details, the then newly appointed North Wales Chief Constable, who was uncontactable yesterday, refused to meet them or help with access to the police major incident database. We were disappointed at the apparent impossibility of obtaining a breakdown of data. We are unable to identify the overall extent of the allegations received by the police in the many witness statements which they took some 130 boxes of material handed over by the council to the police were not made available to the panel. The council did not allow the inquiry to place a notice in the local press seeking information. This was considered to be unacceptable to the insurers, says the report. There were numerous claims and suggestions that senior public figures including the police and political figures might have been involved in the abuse of young people, the report said. The Independent 429 after his death, Jimmy Seville would be repeatedly linked to the North Wales home. One victim claimed to have been repeatedly raped by the deputy head of the home, Peter Howarth, while Seville watched for entertainment. 430 Howarth pulled down my pajama bottoms in front of Seville. I was helpless as Jimmy watched. He thought it funny entertainment. This happened to a number of boys. According to Ben, Seville would ask him, What do you want me to do? Can I fix it for you? The victim added, He kept on looking at me and smiling and laughing. Then he started rubbing my leg. After that I went to bed but he had other children brought up to him. The Telegraph the phrase can I fix it for you is a sick play on Jimmy Seville's popular TV show, Jim will fix it, where Seville would put underprivileged or sick kids into contact with celebrities, or take them on trips, as a pseudo charitable charade. This put Seville in contact with hundreds of vulnerable children. Peter Howarth was one of the few people convicted during the original North Wales child abuse inquiries. Another victim of Bryn Essen was Steve Messsham, who claims he was repeatedly abused as a child by a senior member of the Conservative Party, as well as others. Yesterday he told Channel 4 News that he passed photographs of children being abused, including himself, to the police but they failed to act. He also said the men who abused him as a teenager frequently threatened him, saying, If you tell anyone, I'll have you killed. The Telegraph The Ode de la Guerine Children's Home in Jersey has similar evidence of a massive cover-up. Jersey, not subject to European Union regulations, has long been a haven of tax dodgers and secrecy. In 2008, more than 200 victims came forward with tales of rape and torture. 431 It soon became clear that many of the accused were Tory officials and aides, prompting a swift response by Prime Minister David Cameron to address the claims. 432 After his death, it was revealed that Jimmy Seville was a regular visitor of the children's home. 433 In 2008, after being replaced as the lead of the investigation, Police Chief Lenny Harper blasted the roadblocks he encountered during his tenure and accused an old boys network of obstructing his investigation. 
In his most outspoken criticism of the Jersey authorities, Mr. Harper told The Telegraph, I can quite clearly say that the investigation is being held up. There are people on the island who just don't want us going down the route of this inquiry. Mr. Harper, who handed over the reins of the investigation to his successor on Thursday and officially leaves the Jersey force at the end of the month, also revealed fresh details of why he is so convinced that someone deliberately concealed the bones and teeth of five children, perhaps after murdering them. Mr. Harper has repeatedly said that because some of the 100 bone fragments had been cut, and because the 65 milk teeth found at the home had roots on them, meaning they did not come out naturally, children were either murdered or their bodies were illegally concealed. The Telegraph 434 Jimmy Seville was also linked to Haute de la Garen. It was revealed in October, 2012 that his name had come up numerous times in a police investigation four years earlier but he was not investigated further. 435 Lenny Harper, the lead investigator into the Garen home, told The Telegraph in 2012. Seville chose his victims with great care, vulnerable and often troubled youngsters many in care homes. If they complained they were labeled troublemakers, or brutally put down. We know from court cases and statements made to my team during the 2008 inquiry that children in Jersey care homes were loaned out to members of the yachting fraternity and other prominent citizens on the pretense of recreational trips but during which they were savagely abused and often raped. When these children complained they were beaten and locked in cellars at Haute de la Garen, which the Jersey authorities denied existed in 2008, but which can still be seen on YouTube footage. What chance did they have? This would have been the perfect hunting ground for Seville. The great and good of Jersey fawn over anyone with even loose connections to British royalty. Seville would have been a VIP to them and children would not have stood a dog's chance of complaining about him. It would have been so easy for him. The Telegraph 436 regarding the statement about the yachting fraternity, Rupert Murdoch's famous tabloid News of the World launched an investigation and found that children were loaned out to rich pedophile yachtsmen. 437 They alleged that Jimmy Seville personally delivered the boys to the club. Jimmy Seville is certainly a weird character. He once gave an interview to Esquire magazine where he stated, I guess I am like Forrest Gump. I am like a sewing machine needle that goes in here and goes in there but I am also the eminence grice, the grey, shadowy figure in the background. The thing about me is I get things done and I work undercover 438. Perhaps he is referring to his close connections with the United Kingdom's royalty. He was known to have acted as a marriage counselor between Prince Charles and Princess Diana in the 80s. His weird behavior was noted by the press, where he was reported to greet Prince Charles's assistants by taking their hands and rubbing his lips all the way up their arms. 439 Jimmy Seville had numerous private meetings with former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, documents released in 2012 revealed. They detailed how Seville had petitioned Thatcher to change a law that would allow easier tax deductions for Seville's involvement with the Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where Seville was alleged to have abused girls during satanic rituals. BBC explained that the documents showed that Thatcher was favorable to Seville's petition, and had several private meetings including lunch, though she was adamant that his name never be mentioned. 440 later it was revealed that Prince Charles himself signed on to be the patron of the appeal. 441 as of January 2013, police have confirmed that at least 22 sexual abuse offenses by Jimmy Seville had taken place at the Stoke Mandeville Hospital. 442 A 2009 police interview with Seville shows that all he had to do was threaten legal action against the police, and the claims of abuse against him were dropped. At one point he told the officers, in reference to the Stoke Mandeville Hospital, I own it. 443 The connections between Seville and the UK elite are certainly cause for suspicion. In 2007, Prince Charles sent Seville a Christmas card which read, Jimmy, with affectionate greetings from Charles. Give my love to your ladies in Scotland. 
444 Perhaps the most disturbing part of the Seville tale is that everyone knew. One senior police officer told BBC that we know Jimmy likes them young, he's got friends in high places. 445 A retired Leeds policeman has claimed that there wasn't a copper in the city who didn't know Seville was a pervert. 446 BBC television and radio legend Sir Terry Wagon claimed that Seville's abuse was an open secret and that it was common knowledge in the industry what he was up to. David Nicholson, 67, said he reported the incident to his bosses at the corporation in 1988 but was rebuffed and simply told, that's Jimmy. He told the Sun newspaper, I was revolted by his behavior. They just shrugged it off, saying, yeah, yeah that's the way it goes. Everyone knew what was going on. That includes senior BBC people chiefs at the highest levels. There were always girls in Jimmy's dressing room. Everyone would have known about it all the hair and makeup people, the wardrobe, show directors, producers. The Telegraph 448 new revelations regarding Jimmy Seville and other pedophiles in esteemed institutions are being published every month. Hopefully the investigation trail will eventually expose just how deep the corruption goes. Food for thought. 1. How can a pedophile network infiltrate or compromise the authorities who would otherwise be responsible for exposing them and bringing them to justice? 2. Why is pedophilia so rampant among the elite? 448 The Telegraph, Jimmy Seville, BBC did nothing when director caught him in the act, October 12, 2012. 201. 3. How could Jimmy Seville and Larry King maintain their abuse when so many of their associates were aware? 4. Why does the reported child abuse go well beyond sexual acts into sadism and torture? 5. How widespread are these networks? 6. Is there collusion or connections between large pedophile rings? 7. Just how high up does the corruption go in Washington, the UK, and Belgium? 202. Cults and child abuse. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Finders. In 1987 the New York Times ran a story about a little-known cult called The Finders. The first paragraph reads. Police officials here said today that six disheveled children found in Tallahassee, FLA, might be the offspring of members of a little-known cult, but the officials said they had not ruled out the possibility of kidnapping. 449 Who are these suspicious men, and what were they doing with six undocumented children, transporting them across the country? Two children who were with the Tallahassee men were found to show signs of sexual abuse. 450 The finders had long been a topic of discussion for locals, who were naturally fascinated with the cult that lived amongst them. The Washington City paper once described the finders as such. In appearance, the finders mostly middle-aged men, always in dark suits wouldn't be out of place managing a local funeral home. But the behavior of the handful of adherents has people. Wondering whether they arrived by flying saucer. Townspeople say the finders constantly walk the streets, following people home and taking extensive notes and pictures. They often appear at local council meetings, never saying a word but simply observing the scene. At other times, they plunder the visitor's center of brochures, maps, and local travel guides. And they haunt the courthouse, scouring land deeds to find out who owns the local real estate, Washington City Paper 451 The Washington City Paper goes on to address the shocking specter of the alleged Satanist practices of the cult, with the startling revelation. But among all the cryptic inventory, cops found a photo album entitled The Execution of Henrietta and Igor, a series of snapshots depicting barabbed adults and children slaughtering goats in a wintry woodscape. One photo depicted giggling toddlers pulling dead kids from a womb, baby goats, ran the caption, another showed a grinning adult presenting a goat's head to a startled child. 452 One U.S. News & World Report article states, The more the police learned about the finders, the more bizarre they seemed, there were suggestions of child abuse, Satanism, dealing in pornography and ritualistic animal slaughter. None of the allegations was ever proved, however. 
the child abuse charges against the two men in Tallahassee were dropped. 453 The children were apparently en route to Mexico, to what the children described as a school for smart kids. It was noted in a customs report that the children were unable to accurately identify themselves or their custodians, could not identify the purpose of telephones, toilets or televisions, and were only given food as a reward. 454 These shocking developments led to a raid on the finders compound by the U.S. Customs Service. The report produced after the raid is astounding. During the execution of the warrant at 3918-20 W Street, I was able to observe and access the entire building. I saw large quantities of children's clothing and toys. The clothing consisted of diapers and clothes in the toddler to preschool range. No children were found on the premises. Cursory examination of the documents revealed detailed instructions for obtaining children for unspecified purposes. The instructions included the impregnation of female members of the community known as the finders, purchasing children, trading and kidnapping. One such telex specifically ordered the purchase of two children in Hong Kong to be arranged through a contact in the Chinese embassy there. Another telex expressed interest in bank secrecy situations. Other documents identified interests in high-tech transfers to the United Kingdom, numerous properties under control of the finders, a keen interest in terrorism, explosives, and evasion of authorities. There was also a set of instructions which appeared to be broadcast via a computer network which advised participants to move the children and to keep them moving through different jurisdictions, and instructions on how to avoid police attention. I was able to observe numerous documents which described explicit sexual conduct between members of the community known as finders. I also saw a large collection of photographs of unidentified persons. Some of the photographs were nudes, believed to be members of finders. There were numerous photos of children, some nude, at least one of which was a child on display and appearing to accent the child's genitals. One of the officers presented me with a photo album for review. The album contained a series of photos of adults and children dressed in white sheets participating in a blood ritual. The ritual centered around the execution of at least two goats. The photos portrayed the execution, disembowelment, and dismemberment of the goats at the hands of the children. This included the removal of the testes of the male goat, the discovery of the female goat's womb and the baby goats inside the womb, and the presentation of the goat head to one of the children. The warehouse contained a large library, two kitchens, a sauna, hot tub, and a video room. The video room seemed to be set up as an indoctrination center. It also appeared that the organization had the capability to produce its own videos. There were what appeared to be training areas for the children and what appeared to be an altar set up in a residential area of the warehouse. Many jars of feces and urine were located in this area. USCS Report of Investigation Continuation, filed by Special Agent Ramon J. Martinez, March 2, 1987 A follow-up report revealed the most shocking detail of the entire finder's case. I was advised that all of the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State Department in turn advised MPD, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, that all travel and use of passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and North Vietnam from the late 1950s to the early 1970s. The individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The MPD report has been classified and is not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that the FBI Foreign Counter Intelligence Division had directed the MPD not to advise the FBI Washington Field Office of anything that had transpired. 456, Emphasis Mine After the finders' investigation became a CIA internal matter, no action against the finders was ever taken, and the case has largely faded from public memory. Not everyone was content with the investigation simply ending. Florida Congressman Tom Lewis was quoted as saying, 
Could our own government have something to do with this finders organization and turn their backs on these children? That's what all the evidence points to, says Lewis. And there's a lot of evidence. I can tell you this, we've got a lot of people scrambling, and that wouldn't be happening if there was nothing here. 457 digging by the media could only produce one confirmed connection, a firm which operated as a front organization for the CIA providing officers with computer training employed several members of the finders. The Washington Times reported. Other Customs Service documents and records from the FBI and Metropolitan Police provide indications that the CIA had links to the finders or at least to some of the group's members. Metropolitan Police document dated February 19, 1987, quotes a CIA agent as confirming that his agency was sending its personnel to a finders corp, Future Enterprises, for training in computer operations. And a later Customs Service report says that the CIA admitted to owning the Finders organization as a front for a domestic computer training operation but that it had gone bad. 458 The CIA has denied any connection to the Finders. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Presidio. On November 16, 1987, the New York Times article glibly revealed a shocking statistic. In a three-year period from 1984 to 1987, over 30 different military bases were rocked by child abuse scandals, including West Point and Fort Dix. 459 The statement came on the heels of a massive scandal that was taking place in San Francisco, at a military base named Presidio. A federal grand jury in San Francisco spent 10 months investigating abuse allegations surrounding the Presidio Center, and almost 100 children were examined for physical or psychological signs of sexual abuse. At least four children were discovered to have chlamydia, a sexually transmitted disease. New York Times' The San Jose Mercury described the West Point scandal and its relation to ritual abuse in chilling detail. There had been sex abuse cases involving daycare centers at several other army bases. West Point was one of the most serious until the Presidio. In July 1984, a three-year-old girl was brought to the emergency room at West Point Hospital with a lacerated vagina. The child told the doctor who examined her that a teacher at the West Point daycare center was the one who hurt her. Children at West Point told stories that would become horrifyingly familiar. They said they had been ritually abused. They said they had had excrement smeared on their bodies and been forced to eat feces and drink urine. They said they were taken away from the daycare center and photographed. San Jose Mercury News 460 The Presidio that the San Jose Mercury News and New York Times mentioned is a military base located in San Francisco. It became the subject of one of the strangest and sickening child abuse scandals in American history. In 1987, some parents whose children attended the Presidio daycare center began to notice signs of abuse in their children who began acting strangely, using sexually provocative language and sexually inappropriate behavior. Upon taking their children to the hospital, it was revealed that they also suffered an array of physical symptoms showing clear cases of sexual abuse. When authorities would not act, the parents directly contacted the parents of other kids at the center and the result was shocking, 60 children had clear physical signs of abuse and 4 had contracted chlamydia. Some were only infants. The American Journal of Orthopsychiatry wrote an extensive analysis of the victims of the Presidio. They stated, The severity of the trauma for children at the Presidio was immediately manifest in clear-cut symptoms. Before the abuse was exposed, parents had already noticed the following changes in their children, vaginal discharge, genital soreness, rashes, fear of the dark, sleep disturbances, nightmares, sexually provocative language, and sexually inappropriate behavior. In addition, the children were exhibiting other radical changes in behavior, including temper outbursts, sudden mood shifts, and poor impulse control. All these behavioral symptoms are to be expected in preschool children who have been molested. 461 The U.S. Army was in no hurry to investigate the claims of child abuse. It took them 12 days to form a strategy group, 
and nearly a month passed before they notified other parents of the daycare that child abuse allegations had been made. Although it is normal 461 American Journal of Orthopsychiatry, Preschool Child Sex Abuse, The Aftermath of the Presidio Case, April 1992. 211. Procedure to shut down a government daycare after such allegations, the Presidio Daycare Center remained open for nearly a year. By then, 59 other victims between the ages of 3 and 7 were identified. 462 reports of a satanic cult being housed within the military base had apparently surfaced many years earlier. Military police had investigated some buildings after reports of a man dressed in all black holding a little girl's hand had been reported. An MP was recorded as saying, We kicked the door open and here's this nice little bedroom. In a corner was a mannequin with a gun aimed at the door. On the left side there was a bunk against the wall. There was a pentagram on the floor, a huge one. There were dolls' heads all over the ceiling, just off the wall stuff. We were sitting there, we've got a cult on the Presidio of San Francisco and nobody cares about it. We were told by the provost marshal to just forget about it. 463 On the autumnal equinox of 1987, an occult day of importance, fire would strike a building adjacent to the daycare, destroying many records relating to the center. A month later, fire would destroy the daycare center itself. The ATF found that the causes of both fires had been arson, contrary to the Army's own investigation which claimed faulty wiring. 464 Only one man would ever have charges brought against him, Gary Hambright, a civilian employee who oversaw the daycare center. However, the prosecution bungled the case, bringing to trial only the children who would make the best witnesses and leaving out the most prolific examples of physical abuse, such as those with rectal lesions and missing hymens. The judge presiding over the case deemed the charges as too vague and Hambright walked free. No other persons were charged and the U.S. government quietly closed the case against Presidio itself. 465 The lawyer for the Presidio was Joseph Rossaniello, who also defended the United States government during the Iran-slash-Contra trials. 466 At one point in the investigation, it was revealed that another man was being investigated by the police, Lt. Col. Michael Aquino, military intelligence specialist. Army documents and child testimony showed that children from the daycare center regularly took trips outside of the center, and many children were able to accurately identify what the inside of Aquino's house looked like. Investigators searched Aquino's house and retrieved thousands of videos and photographs, and found what appeared to be a soundproof room, but charges were never brought against him. 467 Who exactly is Michael Aquino? It turns out he is an important piece of the puzzle. Aquino is openly a Satanist, who founded his own church called the Temple of Set. He co-authored the highly controversial document Mind War in 1980, which would define the strategy and importance of psychological operations, aka SIOPS, for the Department of Defense from that point forward. In Mind War, Aquino argues that the reason for the failure in Vietnam was not tactical, but rather the United States simply lost the war of information, being unable to turn the Vietnamese to their cause and unable to convince the domestic public of the importance of the war. 468 He proposes a new look at SIOPS, claiming that it ought to be at the very forefront of the war effort, the very first and the most important technique employed as soon as conflict is deemed inevitable. No longer would tactical propaganda such as leaflets and loudspeakers on the battlefield suffice, instead a vast array of propaganda and coercion techniques are needed. This goes beyond what we traditionally think of propaganda, such as planted news stories or front organizations that we saw in Operation Mockingbird. He also advocates mind war on American citizens. Mind war must target all participants if it is to be effective. It must not only weaken the enemy, it must strengthen the United States. Immediately afterwards is some sick justification on the use of SIOPs on Americans. Under existing United States law, SIOP units may not target American citizens. 
that prohibition is based upon the presumption that propaganda is necessarily a lie or at least a misleading half-truth, and that the government has no right to lie to the people. The propaganda ministry of Goebbels must not be a part of the American way of life. Quite right, and so it must be axiomatic of mind war that it always speaks the truth. Its power lies in its ability to focus recipients' attention on the truth of the future as well as that of the present. Mind war thus involves the stated promise of the truth that the United States has resolved to make real if it is not already so. So there is virtually no law barring the use of mind war on Americans, because if it is not yet the truth, the Department of Defense will make it the truth. 214. Perhaps most terrifying is Aquino's insistence that there are some purely natural conditions under which minds may become more or less receptive to ideas, and mind war should take full advantage of such phenomena as atmospheric electromagnetic activity, air ionization, and extremely low frequency waves. Consider the magnitude of this statement, imagine the Department of Defense manipulating domestic and foreign persons with extremely low frequency waves to alter their political and moral dispositions to align with the interests of the United States. It sheds light on a statement Aquino makes in the beginning of the document. Psychotronic research is in its infancy, but the U.S. Army already possesses an operational weapons systems designed to do what LTC Alexander would like ESP to do, except that this weapons system uses existing communications media. It seeks to map the minds of neutral and enemy individuals and then to change them in accordance with U.S. national interests. It does this on a wide scale, embracing military units, regions, nations, and blocs. Emphasis retained, psychotronics, as defined by Aquino himself, is intelligence and operational use of ESP. In the simplest terms, the Department of Defense has the capability to map a person's brain waves, and then use techniques such as ELF, extremely low frequency waves, to alter that person's brain waves to a pattern more conducive to United States interests. This is the technique that Aquino is advocating to be used on domestic citizens. 215. In the most defining thesis in PSYOP's history. And remember this paper was published 34 years ago. Where is the technology today? As an important side note, Franklin victim Paul Bonaxi once identified Michael Aquino as an associate of Larry King. 469 Rusty Nelson at one point identified Michael Aquino as a man who he had seen Larry King once turn over a suitcase full of cash and bonds. 470 In addition, Michael Aquino has been implicated in various other daycare and military installation child abuse scandals. One important example is the abuse case at the Jubilation Daycare Center at Fort Bragg, where multiple children positively identified Aquino as an abuser out of a video lineup of men dressed exactly like him. 471. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Satanism in Franklin, Nebraska. Two primary witnesses in the Franklin proceedings, Paul Bonaxi and Loretta Smith, neither of whom knew each other, both told stories of being sexually abused at the hands of satanic cults operating in Nebraska. The Douglas County Grand Jury acknowledged that the allegations in the Franklin case necessitated our studying satanic and pedophile activity in eastern Nebraska, particularly in the Omaha metropolitan area of 472. Loretta Smith's testimony would be sealed by the Douglas County Grand Jury, but references in the Grand Jury final report shed some light on what she discussed. In 1988 an Omaha girl, who was an inpatient at Richard Young Hospital, described a number of gruesome cult activities which she claimed to have witnessed between the approximate ages of 9 and 12. According to the girl, she became involved in a cult where older male members sexually molested her and killed infants and children to establish their dominance over other cult members. Both Smith and Paul Bonaxi claimed to have seen Larry King present at some rituals. Paul Bonaxi wrote in his written history that King picked him up after school one day and took me to the Triangle which is in a wooded area in Sarpy County. I witnessed a sacrifice of a human baby boy. Everyone was chanting and it was a yearly ritual around the time of Christ's birth to pervert the blood of Christ. 
They used daggers and cut the boy and filled a cup with his blood and mixed urine in it and forced all of us to drink from the cup and chant Satan is Lord Lucifer our king. Realm of darkness come now empower us your slaves. Then they all began to chant some weird sounds and I got scared and was threatened I'd become the next sacrifice if I told anyone about it. One of the names on the suspicious death list surrounding the Franklin scandal is Kathleen Sorensen, who took in the children who fled from the Webb family among many other abused children. Sorensen gave a stunning report to a Christian television channel. 217. Which aired in Nebraska in 1989, based on her experiences with over 30 abused foster children who spent months or years in her home. It provides an eye-opening introduction to a shocking phenomenon known as ritual abuse. The claims without further documentation certainly seem to be fantastical, so I urge the reader to suspend their disbelief until after the empirical evidence of extreme abuse has been fully discussed. We got involved and learned about this subject because we were foster parents and worked with a number of children. And several years back, several of the children began, after a period of time and building up trust, began to talk about some very bizarre events that had happened in their past and they were frightening and very confusing. I really didn't know what to think. We went to the police, and we went to social services and there was really nothing anyone could do. These children we worked with are now adopted, in safe homes, and probably would never have talked had they not felt able to trust the people they were living with. There are certain things that are in common in the children's stories when we talk about devil worship. There are things that come up in every single story, such as candles. They all talk about sex. Sex is without a doubt a part of every area of this, all sorts of perverted sex. That is what you will first hear, about the sex, about the incest, and it is so hard to believe. But once we get that, we have learned that we can go on and ask and find out, and it will involve pornography, that is always part of it. Part of the reason is that they can use that too. 218. Threaten the children. We have pictures, we will show the police if you talk. It makes the children feel that they are in great danger, and they are all very frightened of the law. They talk about the garish makeup that the people in the group wear, they talk about singing that they didn't understand. Obviously that is chanting, and that has come up in every one of these stories, and none of them call it chanting. There will be dancing. Most often that will involve sexual acts. There will always be a leader and they will be very frightened of the leader. These children, from a very young age, and I am talking about children who came out of birth homes, the family they were born to, worship the devil. The children I have talked to have all had to murder before the age of two. That is something beyond anything I could comprehend. But in some way, whether with the help of an adult's hand over theirs, by having them practice, by getting them excited to be part of the adult scene, they do murder. And the evil thing that happens is, that they really believe that they want to. They want to do what the older people are doing, and they are praised for that. And that becomes their goal to be like the adults. They are told they will never get out, no one will ever believe them, that there is no freedom, that the law will get you, they. 219. Are hopeless before they get someone willing to listen. They are threatened with death. Every time a child is killed in their group, they are told, if you tell, this will happen to you. They have every reason to believe that. So even when they are into the foster care system, and with another family and begin to feel somewhat safe, they still expect these people to show up on the doorstep. They believe that these people know everything they are doing, everyone they're talking to. One teenager told me that she had been told, that if she ever got married, that they would fool her, it would be one of them and she wouldn't know it ahead of time. They set them up to fail in every area. It is very prevalent in the Midwest Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri. Some people have speculated recently that these states are headquarters. As you listen to us talk about these things, there will be a natural part of you which will deny much of what you hear, and believe me, we did too. I would like to share this with you, partly in the children's words, 
so that you can hear the things that they said that nobody could make up, that no child could know. That's what eventually convinced me, along with the deep emotion. The grieving, screeching damage and hurt that they cry out with as they talk. The children I will be talking about, these are all children that I personally talked to. They are today between the ages of 5 and 17. When they talked they were between the ages of 220, 5 and 15. When these things occurred to them, they were between the ages of, well birth, but of when memory enters in, I would say a year and a half to eight. So we are talking about very small children. We are talking about children forming consciences at that time, learning right from wrong. These children do not know. They come out and do not know what is right. They are confused. What they did before, that they were rewarded for, is such a horror to anybody else, that they are shunned. And most often they have been in multiple placements, they will go to a home, they will steal, they will lie, they will hurt animals. One little guy would sharpen pencils and try to stab people. I don't mean poke, I mean stab. People don't like that in their homes. They don't have any idea what it is, they just think, we have a weird kid. Many are sent to psychiatric hospitals where they are labeled psychotics, schizophrenics, and who would want them in. I will begin with the first stories that we heard, which will seem horrible to you, but are very mild to me, because we have progressed and heard far worse things. The first story is about two little boys who were seven and nine when they talked, and they told about sexual abuse at one point, and were very grieved. We talked about good and bad touching and we thought we really had gotten to the bottom of it, and then that afternoon the little one began to cry, and when we couldn't get the answer from him. 221. The older brother said, he is probably crying because he was in the room, when they killed his friend. That was the first one we know about. And as they described that, they talked about that particular victim being brought into a room, hands and arms tied, mouth taped, and how there had been X's marked on his body, on his vital organs. That was bad enough. Within a very few weeks we learned that it was not the adults who had killed that child. It was this oldest boy, who was talking. The next person that we talked to was a little boy, who was very borderline mentally. He had language problems, it was very hard for him to explain himself. And when he began to come out of it, everyone was startled the way he talked. We were real sure, we knew he had not been around these other children and heard anything, but we began to question ourselves, are we asking strange questions? Is there something odd about us which makes children come and dump these things on us? The part which made me believe this child's story, he talked about different babies being killed, but this particular one being stabbed, he curled up in a fetal position, he was nine years old when he was telling the story. He curled up in a fetal position, and his eyes got real glazed, and he said, they cooked that baby on the grill. And I thought, he has really flipped out. I mean, I didn't know. And he said, oh, gross, it smelled like rotten chicken, or rotten deer. He then went on to tell us how they would cut out the heart, or cut off the sex organs, and save them in the 222. Refrigerator. A very typical thing that these kids talk about. They worship the sex organs. They kept it for another ceremony. I asked him where the bodies went. I did not get any answers from that child about what happened to the bodies, but the other two boys, who I spoke about first, eventually, they talked about throwing the babies in the fire. And I asked about that, you mean they were dead when they threw them in the fire? And the littlest one said, no, no. Them was alive and them threw them. And by this time we were really getting freaked out. What were we going to do? How can you help these kids? Where do you find a therapist who can deal with this? But God set up a support system. Other families were helping us, and that really helped. The next child I will share about, and I am going sort of by categories here, how we learned, and the types of killings, this little girl is 11 today, 
she was nine when she first talked. It was a very painful thing when she first started to share the sex things. The sex things are so harmful to the children and they are so embarrassed and it is so personal to the children, and they know that they enjoyed that. They know that. We had been through all that. She began to draw pictures of cats, and the cats all had tails that were on the other side of the page, or their leg was someplace else. As we began to work with her and talk, she said that she had had to kill a pregnant cat. She first said that they had killed a 223 pregnant cat. We said how did you know it was pregnant? Well, she could not explain that, but as we got into it, she confessed that she had had to kill the cat. And I asked her. And her description was, with a knife, I put it in her bottom, and twisted it. Now you tell me, does a kid know that? If I ask a kid how do you kill a cat, do you think they will say that? Those are the kinds of details these children tell us. Later, and they eventually cut the cat open, and that was how they knew the cat was pregnant. And they eat parts of the cat, and the feces and the blood. And again, this was just the beginning. It progressed, and the next time she had to kill a baby, the same way put the knife in the bottom and twist. The baby was alive and he was screaming. And that child hears that, to this day, and has nightmares and flashbacks. And they cut the baby open, and they ate the baby. They do this, so there are no bodies left, and they bum what is left and grind up the bones. And she talked about that, pouring gasoline on the bodies and burning them in the backyard. And I used to think that was nuts, but I have heard it enough times now that I know it must be so. We know there are mortuaries involved, to cremate the bodies, and that makes sense. The most horrible story about fire that I have to tell, and this is extremely, extremely disturbing, it was a little girl, she was a teenager when she was telling me. And she was describing a barn where they used to go to have their 224 meetings and they used to gather outside the barn, and there would be chanting. And then as they went inside the barn they would be split into different groups. And she was never with any of her family, they all went to different places. And I asked her where she had to go and she said I was always in the burning room. And as she went on to describe the burning room, I thought, how she came out of this, with any sanity at all, I don't know. She was a very small child. They would take in children, probably preschoolers, and they would hang them from the rafters in this barn, and there would be as many as five or ten hung in a row. They would be fully clothed, which is unusual, because frequently they are naked. The children, like this girl, were all given candles. And you can picture the ceremony as she described it. And the candles were lit. Then the adults would go forward and would pour liquid from a cup on each of the children's clothing, which was obviously gasoline or kerosene. And then they would give a signal and the others would have to go forward and set the children on fire. When they were done they would cut them down. The first child that this girl had to kill was a cousin, a little cousin. What does that do to you? But you couldn't object, because the children that objected were killed. This child, about two years ago, just fell to the ground at Christmas time, everyone thinks that Christmas is such a 225. Wonderful time. And she confessed that she hated Christmas, she couldn't wait until everything was put away, because all she could hear was babies crying. Christmas is the time when the most babies die. And she covered her ears and cried for hours, and screamed, Stop it, stop it, stop it. Talk to God and make him stop it. All she could hear is the screams and the babies crying. Christmas for the children I have talked to, has been one of the worst times. I have had three children tell me about a very similar ceremony, and I will kind of merge that and tell you how it went. They were taken to a church, and all the children, it is a very festive occasion, and they are taken to the front of the church, and a small child is now brought in, two of them talked about babies and they put them on a platform. 
the adults are all celebrating and dancing and singing and the children are getting into the spirit of it, and what they are doing is forming a circle around the child, and of course the child represents the child Jesus, and they begin mocking and spitting and calling names, and then they encourage the children to begin doing it, and you can imagine how it gets out of control. And at some point they hand all of the children knives and then they are all hacking and slashing until the baby is dead, and then they all celebrate because the child Jesus is dead. Kathleen Sorensen died in October 1989, shortly after this testimony. On a long rural road returning to her home, a car heading in the opposite direction crossed lanes and caused a head-on collision. Both the young woman driver and her husband had police. Records for cruelty to animals. 473. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Historical precedent. The idea of active widespread satanic and other occult activity in the United States certainly seems ludicrous. But there is an historical precedent. Consider these two quotes from the works of Alastair Crowley, founder of the Church of Satan in the year 1900. Moreover, the Beast 666 adviseth that all children shall be accustomed from infancy to witness every type of sexual act, and also the process of birth, lest falsehood fog, and mystery stupefy, their minds, whose error else might thwart and misdirect the growth of their subconscious system of soul symbolism. There are cases when seduction or rape may be emancipation or initiation to another. Such acts can only be judged by their results. Crowley, the law is for all 474 in any case it was the theory of ancient magicians, that any living being is the storehouse of energy varying in quantity according to the size and the health of the animal, and in quality according to its mental and moral character. At the death of this animal the energy is liberated suddenly. The animal should therefore be killed within the circle, or the triangle, as the case 473 to camp 474 Alastair Crowley, the law is for all, usurped available here. 227. Maybe, so that its energy cannot escape. An animal should be selected whose nature accords with that of the ceremony. For the highest spiritual working one must accordingly choose the victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. Crowley, Magic in Theory and Practice 475 Asterisk 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 Empirical Evidence In 1996, three members of the American Psychological Association conducted a survey of the organization, receiving feedback from 2,709 clinical psychologists. 30% acknowledged seeing at least one case of ritualistic or religion-related abuse since January 1st, 1980. 476 and two-thirds RDS of these cases were described as religion-related and one-third were described as ritual abuse. Of those who acknowledged seeing these cases, 93% of the clinical psychologists said that they believed the abuse did indeed occur. The authors concluded that the psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers who responded to their survey overwhelmingly believed both the allegations of abuse and the allegations of ritual or religious elements of the abuse. Another study surveyed 810 members of the British Psychological Society who had patients who suffered from sexual abuse, and found that 15% had patients who reported satanic ritual abuse. Of these, 80% believed that their patient did indeed suffer from the reported abuse. 477 One study examined 270 cases of substantiated sexual abuse involving daycares in England found that 13% of the cases included allegations of ritual abuse. 478 One survey of the membership of the International Society for the Study of Multiple Personality and Association concluded that 88% of 1,185 respondents reported belief in ritual abuse, involving mind control and programming. 479 In 1992 alone, Child Help USA logged 1,741 calls pertaining to ritual abuse, Monarch Resources of Los Angeles logged approximately 5,000, real active survivors tallied nearly 3,600, 
Justice Unlimited of Colorado received almost 7,000, and Looking Up of Maine handled around 6,000. Even allowing for some of these calls to have been made by people who assist survivors but are not themselves survivors, and for some survivors to have called more than one helpline or made multiple calls to the same helpline, these numbers suggest that at a minimum there must be tens of thousands of survivors of ritual abuse in the United States. Catherine Gould, The Journal of Psychohistory 480 in 2007, four researchers created an international online survey divided into three parts, available in English and German, called Extreme Abuse Surveys, in an effort to gather a large number of responses to gather preliminary data on the nature and prevalence of extreme abuse. 481 The researchers were Wanda Carriker, Ph.D., and retired U.S. psychologist, Bettina Overkamp, Ph.D. and active psychologist in Germany, Torsten Becker, German social worker who won the German Child Protection Award in 1994 for his work with abused children, and Carol Rutz, a survivor of extreme abuse and mind control. The surveys show repeated allegations of abuse used for the purposes of mind control, which will be explored in the next chapter. 1,471 participants from 31 countries answered at least one question on the survey listed for adult survivors, and 451 people from 20 countries responded to at least one question listed for professionals who have worked with at least one adult survivor of extreme abuse. Of the adult survivors, 257 people from 15 countries responded that they had been victims of government mind control experimentation as a child, and 71 professionals from six countries responded that they had worked with at least one adult survivor of extreme abuse who reported to have been a victim of government mind control experimentation as a child. 166 survivors reported being experimented on by doctors who spoke German or with a heavy German accent. Of the adult survivors, 236 reported to have been drugged against their will, 236 reported to have been sexually abused by multiple perpetrators, 228 reported being threatened with death if they ever discussed their experiences, 222 reported sensory deprivation experiments, 217 reported electroshock experiments, 197 witnessed murder by their perpetrators, 196 witnessed animal mutilations, 184 reported the use of feces in their abuse, 183 reported being used in child pornography, 178 reported starvation, 171 reported hypnosis, and 169 reported child prostitution. Of the 257 EAS respondents who reported that secret mind control experiments were used on them as children, 69%, 177, reported having been abused in a satanic cult. Of the 543 EAS respondents who reported that they had been abused in a satanic cult, 33%, 179, reported having been used in secret mind control experiments as children. 159 survivors had heard Greek letters being used during their abuse, and 160 experienced sexual mind control programming used for blackmail or personal use. 228 survivors answered yes to the question, my perpetrator, S, deliberately created slash programmed dissociative states of mind, such as alters, personalities, ego states, in me. Research has consistently shown that false allegations of child sexual abuse by children are rare. One 1987 study examined 576 consecutive referrals of child sexual abuse to the Denver Department of Social Services, and categorized the reports as either reliable or fictitious. In only 8% of the total cases were children judged to have possibly advanced a fictitious allegation. 482 In a more recent study, Investigators reviewed case notes of all child sexual abuse reports to the Denver Department of Social Services over 12 months. Of the 551 cases reviewed, there were only 14, 2.5%, instances of erroneous concerns about abuse emanating from children. These consisted of three cases of allegations made in collusion with a parent, 
three cases where an innocent event was misinterpreted as sexual abuse and eight cases, 1.5%, of false allegations of sexual abuse 483 researchers into the phenomenon of satanic ritual abuse have come to the conclusion that the phenomenon is widespread and transcends geographic boundaries 484 One such study, titled Multiple Personality Disorder and Satanic Ritual Abuse, the issue of credibility states. The comparability of both the child and adult accounts is said to transcend geographical and relationship boundaries, with descriptions emerging from both survivor groups revealing common themes, behaviors, symbols, and paraphernalia. Assuredly, the possibility of cross-contamination of accounts exists when, for example, a group of suspected or potential victims seems to be involved in a single daycare case, or when adult contemporaries are aware of the details of others' reports. However, one cannot discount the similarity of accounts given spontaneously and independently by individuals who are unrelated personally, geographically, or through shared knowledge. The empirical evidence of ritual abuse for the purposes of mind control establishes that the phenomenon is widespread and international, and consistency between methods of abuse. Furthermore, the methods of abuse correlate both with known experimentation under MKUltra and the testimonies of child abuse case studies such as Franklin and Presidio. It also reveals a solid consensus that psychiatrists who have been exposed to patients who have suffered from ritual abuse believe that the abuse did indeed occur. It's interesting to note that such a widespread consensus is relatively rare in the field of psychology, let alone for such a controversial topic. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The false memory hoax. When the evidence of extreme abuse began surfacing in surprising numbers, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was set up to promote the theory that victims are suffering from a syndrome that creates false memories, often at the suggestion of psychotic parents or overzealous psychiatrists. The members of the FMSF have been called as expert witnesses in hundreds of trials around the United States and have been routinely quoted as experts in the media. Their mission has been exceptionally successful, as the false memory syndrome has become accepted as a fact in most of the public consciousness. Unfortunately, people rarely stop to ask the question, who exactly are the members of the FMSF, and how solid is their science? Peter J. Freyd initiated the founding of the FMSF after being accused of sexual abuse by his daughter, Jennifer. His behavior has been particularly suspect, such as accusing his daughter of being brain damaged, despite the fact that she holds a Ph.D. in psychology, graduated magna cum laude from Penn and is currently a tenured professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. Speaking to the Oregonian, Jennifer Freyd stated that I'm sometimes flabbergasted that my memory is considered false and my alcoholic father's memory is considered rational and sane. 485 Peter Freyd once stated that with the help of Harold Leaf and Marin Orne, the FMSF quickly gathered a respectable appearing advisory board, giving the new syndrome an aura of scientific acceptance. 486 Interestingly, Dr. Martin T. Orne has been heavily involved with MKUltra experiments since the early 60s, where he undertook hypnosis studies at Harvard Medical School with a $30,000 grant from the CIA. 487 CIA documents have confirmed that Orne had a top secret clearance in MKUltra. 488 He has published many papers relevant to the creation of a Manchurian candidate, including one called Can a hypnotized subject be compelled to carry out otherwise unacceptable behavior, another called the significance of unwitting cues for experimental outcomes, toward a pragmatic approach. And lastly restricted use of success cues in retrieval during post-hypnotic amnesia. 489 This is an interesting subject matter history given the FMSF's insistence that hypnotism is illegitimate. Dr. Harold Leaf was involved with brain electrode experiments at Tulane University, a notorious MKUltra institution. 490 Another prominent member, David Dingas, was a co-worker with Martin T. Orne and has been involved in research for naval intelligence, who oversaw the precursor mind control experiments to MKUltra. 491 founding member Ralph Underwager once proudly proclaimed to the pro-pedophilia publication Paydica. 
What I have been struck by as I have come to know more about and understand people who choose pedophilia is that they let themselves be too much defined by other people. That is usually an essentially negative definition. Pedophiles spend a lot of time and energy defending their choice. I don't think that a pedophile needs to do that. Pedophiles can boldly and courageously affirm what they choose. They can say that what they want is to find the best way to love. I am also a theologian and as a theologian, I believe it is God's will that there be closeness and intimacy, unity of the flesh, between people. A pedophile can say, this closeness is possible for me within the choices that I've made. Pedophiles are too defensive. They go around saying, you. People out there are saying that what I choose is bad, that it's no good. You're putting me in prison, you're doing all these terrible things to me. I have to define my love as being in some way or other illicit. What I think is that pedophiles can make the assertion that the pursuit of intimacy and love is what they choose. With boldness, they can say, I believe this is in fact part of God's will for 92. Regarding the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, Columbia Journalism Review stated, Rarely has such a strange and little understood organization had such a profound effect on media coverage of such a controversial matter. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation is an aggressive, well-financed PR machine adept at manipulating the press, harassing its critics, and mobilizing a diverse army of psychiatrists, outspoken academics, expert defense witnesses, litigious lawyers, Freud bashers, critics of psychotherapy, and devastated parents. 493 The FMSF has repeatedly cited a study presented at a Harvard conference where researchers were repeatedly able to implant the false memory of mundane tasks like grocery shopping, into their subjects using techniques such as hypnosis. 494 It has been championed as proof that memories are easily manipulated. However, research has shown that memories of abuse function very differently than average memories. However, leading memory researchers such as Dr. Bessel van der Kolk of Harvard Medical School maintain that traumatic memories, which typically are engraved in the sensorimotor processes, are not subject to the same kinds of contamination that can affect normal memory. Traumatic amnesia, described in the DSM-3R as psychogenic amnesia, is a phenomenon which has been known to mental health professionals for more than 100 years. The clinically observed characteristics of traumatic memory formation and retrieval match precisely the patterns of memory recovery exhibited by SRA survivors, and strongly confirm the reality of their cult abuse. 495 There is also the case of Paul and Shirley Everly, who are famous for propagating the idea of a satanic panic, that the widespread reporting of ritual abuse is merely a social contagion. They have published two books titled The Politics of Child Abuse and The Abuse of Innocence which promote this theory, and have been cited as experts in courts and the press. Ms. Magazine wrote a review of the interesting past of the Everleys, stating, What is startling about the Everleys' reputation as groundbreaking experts in the field is that their dubious credentials have not been widely challenged. Paul and Shirley Everly edit a softcore magazine in California called the L.A. Star that contains a mixture of nude photos, celebrity gossip, telephone sex ads, and promos for the politics of child abuse. In the 1970s, however, the Everleys were also publishing hardcore pornography. Their publication, Finger, depicted scenes of bondage, S&M, and sexual activities involving urination and defecation. A young girl portrayed with a white smile on her face sits on top of a man whose penis is inside of her, a woman has oral sex with a young boy in a drawing entitled Memories of My Boyhood. The Everleys were featured nude on one cover holding two life-size blow-up dolls names Love Girl and Play Guy. No dates appear on the issues and the Everleys rarely attach their names, referring to themselves as the L.A. Star Family the Everleys were the distributors of Finger and several other underground magazines, says Donald Smith, a sergeant with the obscenity section of the Los Angeles Police Department's vice division who followed the couple for years. LAPD was never able to prosecute for child pornography, 
there were a lot of photos of people who looked like they were underage but we could never prove it. The pictures of young children in finger are illustrations, and child pornography laws were less rigid a decade ago than they are today. Sex spot at 5, my first rape, she was only 13, and what happens when niggers adopt white children are some of the articles that appeared in finger. One letter states, I think it's really great that your mags have the courage to print articles and pics is sick on child sex, too bad I didn't hear from more women who are into child sex, since I'm single I'm not getting it on with my children, but I know of a few families that are. If I were married and my wife and kids approved I'd be having sex with my daughters. Another entry reads, I'm a pedophile and I think it's sick great a man is having sex with his daughter, since I didn't get finger number three, I didn't get to see the stories and pics of family sex. Would like to see pics of nude girls making it with their daddy, but realize it's too risky to print for 96. It is truly fascinating how compromised the leading debunkers of ritual abuse are. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conclusion. Even in light of the evidence, the idea of an active network of abusive cults certainly sounds ludicrous. In the context of psychopathy, the potential is at least recognizable. Cults serve as a network for psychopaths who enjoy sadistic sexual practices and the potential for concealing knowledge. The very concept of the occult is based is taking knowledge out of the circulation of the masses and reserving it for a select few. In other words, keeping knowledge for selfish usages and to use this knowledge to wield power over others. Former members of the Church of Satan and other similar cults have testified that the basic goal of the occult knowledge is to understand the human psyche, primary human motivations and how humanity functions. This knowledge is then used to exploit people. The worldview of these groups is extremely dark, and is based on controlling others, gaining knowledge to use as influence, and then partnering with like-minded individuals and groups to expand upon this knowledge and use it more effectively. The next step into the rabbit hole is that these groups act as psychopath filtration centers. They deliberately target psychopaths for initiation and then use their resources to put them into positions of power in a variety of fields such as politics, law, business, education, science, and more. Franklin, Dutroux, Seville, the Presidio, and the Finders are all examples of psychopathic networks that have infiltrated these institutions of power, and are each a small glimpse into the hierarchy of the pathocracy. The next chapter will explore the uses of extreme abuse for the purpose of mind control, and why so many men involved with MKUltra would have a vested interest in marginalizing the existence of such abuse. Food for Thought 1. How connected are occult groups with each other? 2. Is the CIA responsible for various cults as front groups for MKUltra and other projects? 3. Why is the discussion of the existence of cults marginalized from the mainstream? 4. Why were the finders interested in terrorism and explosives? 5. How widespread are networks that abuse and sell children? 6. What are the profits from child pornography and prostitution earned by cults such as the finders used for? 7. How much influence has Michael Aquino's mind war had on official psychological operation policy? 8. How much has technology discussed in mind war regarding the manipulation of the brain advanced in the more than 30 years of its publication? 9. Is it disturbing that Aquino's temple of set, and likely by extension other occult groups, have knowledge and access to this technology? 10. Why were there child abuse cases at 30 separate military bases in a three-year period? Trauma-based mind control the end apparently justifies the means, is the approach we had taken, he said, and so covered operations and assassinations, and maybe even the use of children in Monarch 497 and all these other things, seemed reasonable at the time, because we were saving the country. Everything for saving the country. National Security and the Cold War In war, all is fair. CIA Director William Colby, as related by John DeCamp, Executive Intelligence Review, Volume 26, Number 12, March 19, 1999 and to go a step further, 
he recalls one senior KGB man who told too many sexual jokes about young boys. It didn't take too long to recognize that he was more than a little fascinated by youths, says the source. I took the trouble to point out he was probably too good, too well trained, to be either entrapped or to give away secrets. But he would have been tempted toward a compromising position by a preteen. I mentioned this, and they said, as a psychological observer, you're probably quite right. But what the hell are we going to do about it? Where are we going to get a 12 year old boy? The source believes that if the Russian had had a taste for older men, U.S. intelligence might have mounted an operation, but the idea of a 12-year-old boy was just more than anybody could stomach. John Marks 498 The idea of using a child for entrapment might have been too much for the CIA operatives to stomach, but what about to the psychopathic leadership? Connecting the dots between the use of hypnosis, drugs, and entrapment under MK Ultra the abuse of children in Franklin, Belgium, Presidio and under the auspices of the Finders cult, and the extreme abuse perpetrated by occult groups against children, a dark picture begins to emerge. One link that ties together many of these cases is the creation of multiple personality disorder, now known as dissociative identity disorder, in the victims of extreme abuse. Franklin's Paul Bonaxi alleged that his condition was created deliberately by scientists operating out of Offutt Air Force Base outside of Omaha, Nebraska, beginning at the age of 3. 499 later, he was introduced to the pedophile and child abuse ring of Larry King, where he became a child prostitute to wealthy men and politicians around the country, as well as acting as a drug courier on many of his trips. Dutrua's first victim witness, X1, alleged that her multiple personalities were induced at a young age, as young as two, by being introduced to a group of violent pedophiles at the age of two by her grandmother. Indeed, multiple personality disorder is a big part of the picture. The current understanding of the disorder is that its onset begins at a very young age, after a child suffers from horrific abuse, often sexual in nature, that in a very real sense shatters the child's mind into a collection of coexisting personalities to deal with the abuse they have received. As many as 98% to 99% of individuals who develop dissociative disorders have recognized personal histories of recurring, overpowering, and often life-threatening disturbances at a sensitive developmental stage of childhood. WebMD 500 The brain apparently dissociates exceptionally well, Researchers have found that sufferers of dissociative identity disorder will often have no memories of abuse they endured, and go as far as to vehemently deny their past experiences, despite extensive documentation by hospitals and courts of the abuse at the time it happened, and in addition, lifelong physical scars and symptoms that had arisen from the abuse. However, when an altar was present as the dominant psyche, detailed memories of the abuse were present. 501 The same study found that the alters would have completely distinct personalities, with different handwriting, and often, different genders. It is very likely that the possibility of deliberately creating multiple personalities in a child was understood at least as early as the medical experiments undertaken during World War II by the Third Reich. A cursory reading of the available data regarding the work of certain doctors such as the notorious Angel of Death Dr. Menchel shows that much of the research undertaken at concentration camps had to do with inflicting trauma and recording its various effects. A logical conclusion is that these psychopathic doctors attempted to understand and then exploit the condition. Remember G.H. Estabrooks, associate of the FBI and CIA, and World War II hypnotist who was discussed in the Kultra chapter? Here is a salient quote, taken from a 1968 article in the Providence Evening Bulletin, which will set a stage for the introduction to the topic of dissociative identity disorder and hypnotism. The key to creating an effective spy or assassin rests in splitting a man's personality, or creating multiple personalities, with the aid of hypnotism, this is not science fiction. This has and is being done. I have done it. 502 The CIA and Estabrooks conceded that only one in five people could be susceptible to hypnotism, and even less would be able to be subjected to the extreme dissociation and amnesia involved in the creation of multiple personalities. 
True to CIA form, recalling the MK Ultra chapter, was the research done towards increasing the susceptibility of hypnotic mind control through the use of drugs and electroshock. The latter technique offers a glimpse of the tip of the iceberg into a variety of techniques involving using trauma to store memories in a sensitive part of the brain, with long-lasting recall potential but otherwise amnesiac effects in the primary personality. The extension of this research is known as trauma-based mind control. The general idea is to subject children to horrific and unthinkable abuse at a sensitive age of development with the purpose of deliberately creating multiple personalities. The alternate personalities would then be programmed, through the use of hypnosis, drugs, and further trauma, sometimes to store sensitive information, sometimes to create spies, assassins, prostitutes and more. The victim's primary personality would be completely unaware not only that they had programmed alternate personalities, but that they had been a victim of extreme abuse in the first place. Due to the associated trauma, the programming would be stored in a different part of the brain than normal memories. Increasing both the power of the memory and the difficulty of recall. 503 Using hypnotic suggestion, anyone with the proper information, such as a code word, would be able to access a victim's alternate personality and exploit the programming. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Green Bomb Speech, a trauma-based mind control expose in 1992, the preeminent psychologist in the study of clinical hypnosis, Dr. Corridan Hammond, PhD, gave an astounding speech delivered to the 4th Annual Eastern Regional Conference on Abuse and Multiple Personality Disorder, sponsored by the Center for Abuse Recovery and Empowerment, the Psychiatric Institute of Washington, D.C. in which he explained his experiences with patients suffering from dissociative identity disorder, titled Hypnosis in MPD, Ritual Abuse. 504 Before analyzing the speech, here are Dr. Corridan's credentials. B.S., M.S., Ph.D. Counseling Psychology, from the University of Utah. Diplomate in Clinical Hypnosis, the American Board of Psychological Hypnosis. Diplomate in Sex Therapy, the American Board of Sexology. Clinical Supervisor and Board Examiner, American Board of Sexology. Diplomate in Marital and Sex Therapy, American Board of Family Psychology. Licensed Psychologist, Licensed Marital Therapist, Licensed Family Therapist, State of Utah. Research Associate Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Utah School of Medicine. Director and Founder of the Sex and Marital Therapy Clinic, University of Utah. Adjunct Associate Professor of Educational Psychology, University of Utah Abstract. Editor, The American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis. Advising Editor and Founding Member, Editorial Board, The Ericksonian Monograph. Referee, The Journal of Abnormal Psychology. 1989 Presidential Award of Merit, American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. 1990 Urban Sector Award, American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. Current President, American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. 505 Dr. Hammond had been examining patients with dissociative identity disorder and came across some startling discoveries, which he verified with many of his peers. Many of them had undergone horrific ritual and sexual abuse as a child exactly as described in the case studies examined in previous chapters. After a brief introduction, Dr. Hammond began with saying, in Chicago at the first international congress where ritual abuse was talked about I can remember thinking, how strange and interesting. I can recall many people listening to an example given that somebody thought was so idiosyncratic and rare, and all the people coming up after saying, gee, you're treating one, two. You're in Seattle. Well, I'm in Toronto. Well, I'm in Florida. Well, I'm in Cincinnati. I didn't know what to think at that point. It wasn't too long after that I found my first ritual abuse patient in somebody I was already treating and we hadn't gotten that deep yet. Things in that case made me very curious about the use of mind control techniques and hypnosis and other brainwashing techniques. 
The fascinating thing was that as I did a telephone consult with a therapist that I'd been consulting with for quite a number of months on an MPD case in another state, I told her to inquire about certain things. She said, well, what are those things? I said, I'm not going to tell you, because I don't want there to be any possibility of contamination. Just come back to me and tell me what the patient says. She called me back two hours later, and said, I just had a double session with this patient and there was a part of him that said, oh, we're so excited. If you know about this stuff, you know how the cult programmers get on the inside and our therapy is going to go so much faster, I've consulted in 11 states and one foreign country, in some cases over the telephone, in some cases in person, in some cases giving the therapist information ahead of time and saying, be very careful how you phrase this. Phrase it in these ways so you don't contaminate. In other cases not even giving the therapist information ahead of time so they couldn't. When you start to find the same highly esoteric information in different states and different countries, from Florida to California, you start to get an idea that there's something going on that is very large, very well coordinated, with a great deal of communication and systematicness to what's happening. So I have gone from someone kind of neutral and not knowing what to think about it all, to someone who clearly believes ritual abuse is real and that the people who say it isn't are either naive like people who didn't want to believe the Holocaust or they're dirty. Immediately we get the understanding that these victims are not confined geographically, and in addition, an insight into how Dr. Hammond approached his investigation as to avoid hypnotic suggestion and other techniques which the False Memory Syndrome Foundation cites as the basis of all ritual abuse claims. The last line, stating that those who deny the existence of ritual abuse are either naive or dirty, was met with lots of applause from the audience. What they basically do is they will get a child and they will start this in basic forms, it appears, by about two and a half after the child's already been made dissociative. They'll make him dissociative not only through abuse, like sexual abuse, but also things like putting a mousetrap on their fingers and teaching the parents, you do not go in until the child stops crying. Only then do you go in and remove it. They start in rudimentary forms at about two and a half and kick into high gear, it appears, around six or six and a half, continue through adolescence with periodic reinforcements in adulthood. Basically, in the programming the child will be put typically on a gurney. They will have an IV in one hand or arm. They'll be strapped down, typically naked. There'll be wires attached to their head to monitor electroencephalograph patterns. They will see a pulsing light, most often described as red, occasionally white or blue. They'll be given, most commonly I believe, Demerol. Sometimes it'll be other drugs as well, depending on the kind of programming. They have it, I think, down to a science where they've learned you give so much every 25 minutes until the programming is done. They then will describe a pain on one ear, their right ear generally, where it appears a needle has been placed, and they will hear weird, disorienting sounds in that ear while they see photic stimulation to drive the brain into a brainwave pattern. 249. With a pulsing light at a certain frequency, not unlike the goggles that are now available through Sharper Image and some of those kinds of stores. Then, after a suitable period when they're in a certain brainwave state, they will begin programming, programming oriented to self-destruction and debasement of the person. In a patient at this point in time, about 8 years old, who has gone through a great deal of early programming that took place on a military installation, that's not uncommon. I've treated and been involved with cases who are part of this original mind control project, as well as having their programming on military reservations in many cases. We find a lot of connections with the CIA. The victim testimony of the use of drugs and other techniques is fascinatingly similar to the available evidence regarding MK Ultra experiments such as Dr. Ewan Cameron's psychic driving and the documented search for drugs which help induce hypnosis. The references to this type of mind control being undertaken at military bases certainly seems absurd, as does Paul Bonaxi's claim that he was victimized at Offutt Air Force Base. 
but remember the New York Times article cited earlier that referenced 30 different military institutions having sexual abuse scandals within a three-year period, and the depths of horrors unleashed at West Point and Presidio. Another important aspect that Dr. Hammond mentions is the creation of certain brainwave state before the programming begins. When a mind control subject would be put into a certain brainwave state and hypnosis, then their programming could only be activated under that brainwave state, a type of state-dependent learning. This increases the amnesiac effect of the abuse and programming from the primary personality of someone suffering from multiple personality disorder. Dr. Hammond goes on to describe the details of what a cult programming session would entail for one of his subjects. This patient now was in a cult school, a private cult school where several of these sessions occurred a week. She would go into a room, get all hooked up. They would do all of these sorts of things. When she was in the proper altered state, now they were no longer having to monitor it with electroencephalographs, she also had already had placed on her electrodes, one in the vagina, for example, four on the head. Sometimes they'll be on other parts of the body. They will then begin and they would say to her, you are angry with someone in the group. She'd say, no, I'm not and they'd violently shock her. They would say the same thing until she complied and didn't make any negative response. Then they would continue. And because you are angry with someone in the group, or when you are angry with someone in the group, you will hurt yourself. Do you understand? She said, no and they shocked her. They repeated again, do you understand? Well, yes, but I don't want to. Shock her again until they get compliance. Then they keep adding to it. And you will hurt yourself by cutting yourself. Do you understand? Maybe she'd say yes, but they might say, we don't believe you and shock her anyway. Go back and go over it again. 251. They would continue in this sort of fashion. She said typically it seemed as though they'd go about 30 minutes, take a break for a smoke or something, then come back. They may review what they'd done and stopped, or they might review what they'd done and go on to new material. She said the sessions might go half an hour, they might go three hours. She estimated three times a week. Programming under the influence of drugs in a certain brainwave state and with these noises in one ear and them speaking in the other ear, usually the left ear, associated with right hemisphere non-dominant brain functioning, and with them talking, therefore, and requiring intense concentration, intense focusing. Because often they'll have to memorize and say certain things back, word perfect, to avoid punishment, shock, and other kinds of things that are occurring. This is basically how a lot of programming goes on. Some of it'll also use other typical brainwashing kinds of techniques. There will be very standardized types of hypnotic things done at times. There'll be sensory deprivation which we know increases suggestibility in anyone. Total sensory deprivation, suggestibility has significantly increased, from the research. It's not uncommon for them to use a great deal of that, including formal sensory deprivation chambers before they do certain of these things. 252. The idea of cult school certainly recalls the Finder's case study discussed earlier. It is possible that after the series of revelations and inquiries such as the joint hearing of the Select Intelligence Committee during the 1970s prompted the CIA to discontinue their official relationship with these projects and instead contract them out to cults such as the Finders and Michael Aquino's Temple of Set. After all, official documents discussed in the MK Ultra chapter mentioned 6% of projects being too sensitive for any connections to the agency. In addition to the lack of official connection to the CIA, which diminishes liability and culpability, there is a bonus effect, plausible deniability. When these projects are uncovered, people are simply be disbelief that such atrocious acts could have occurred, let alone connected to the United States government. Dr. Hammond goes on to describe the different brainwave states during which programming took place, which were consistent throughout all of his patients and those of his peers, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Theta, Gamma, and Omega, 
a phenomenon noted by over 100 of the respondents to the extreme abuse surveys. Each brainwave state was associated with a specific type of programming and seemed to be present in a specific altar, which was also mostly consistent among the patients. Alphas appear to represent general programming, the first kind of things put in. Betas appear to be sexual programs. For example, how to perform oral sex in a certain way, how to perform sex in rituals, having to do with producing child pornography, directing child pornography, or prostitution. Deltas are killers trained in how to kill in ceremonies. There'll also be some self-harm stuff mixed in with that, assassination. 253. And killing. Then there's Omega. I usually don't include that word when I say my first question about this or any part inside that knows about Alpha, Beta, Delta, Theta, because Omega will shake them even more. Omega has to do with self-destruct programming. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. This can include self-mutilation as well as killing themselves programming. Gamma appears to be system protection and deception programming which will provide misinformation to you, try to misdirect you, tell you half-truths, protect different things inside. There can also be other Greek letters. I'd recommend that you go and get your entire Greek alphabet, and if you have verified that some of this stuff is present and they have given you some of the right answers about what some of this material is, and I can't underline enough, do not lead them. Do not say, is this killers? Get the answer from them, please. When you've done this and it appears to be present, I would take your entire Greek alphabet, and with idea motor signals, go through the alphabet and say, is there any programming inside associated with Epsilon, Omicron, and go on through. There may be some systematicness to some of the other letters, but I'm not aware of it. I've found, for example, in one case that Zeta had to do with the production of snuff films that this person was involved with. With another person. 254. Omicron had to do with their linkage and associations with drug smuggling and with the mafia, and with big business and government leaders. So there's going to be some individualism, I think, in some of those. Some of those are come home programs, come back to the cult, return to the cult program. One gets the impression that there is a very large, tightly connected network working through numerous organizations and institutions to undertake these experiments. At one point, Dr. Hammond notes that while the programming seems to be widely systematic among victims with no personal or geographic relations, there is one factor that is always different, erasure codes to remove certain aspects of programming. Here's the flaw in the system. They have built in shutdown and erasure codes, so if they got into trouble they could shut something down and they could also erase something. These codes will sometimes be idiosyncratic phrases, or ditties. Sometimes they will be numbers may be followed by a word. There's some real individuality to that. At first I had hoped if we can get some of these maybe they'll work with different people. No such luck. It's very unlikely unless they were programmed at about the same point in time as part of the same little group. Stuff that I've seen suggests that they carry laptop computers, the programmers, which still include everything that they did 20 or 30 years ago in them, in terms of the names of alters, the programs, the codes, and so on. 255. I remember a woman who came in, about 24 years old, claimed her father was a Satanist. Her parents divorced when she was six. After that, it would only be when her father had visitation and he would take her to rituals sometimes, up until age 15. She said, I haven't gone to anything since I was 15. Her therapist believed this at face value. We sat in my office. We did a two-hour inquiry using hypnosis. We found the programming present. In addition to that we found that every therapy session was debriefed, and in fact they had told her to get sick and not come to the appointment with me. Another one had been told that I was cult and that if she came I would know that she'd been told not to come and I would punish her. If anything meaningful comes out in a patient who's being monitored like that from what I've learned thus far, 
they're tortured with electric shocks my belief is if they're in that situation you can't do meaningful therapy other than being supportive and caring, and letting them know you care a lot and you'll be there to support them. But I wouldn't try to work with any kind of deep material or deprogramming with them, because I think it can do nothing but get them tortured and hurt, unless they can get into a safe, secure inpatient unit for an extended period of time to do some of the work required. I have a feeling that when you make inquiries you're going to find that probably greater than 50% of these patients, if their bloodline, meaning mother, or dad or both involved, will be monitored on. 256. Some ongoing basis. Much of the rest of the speech deals with techniques for the therapists attending the conference to approach treatment of patients who have dissociative identity disorder and were victims of satanic ritual abuse. But Dr. Hammond doesn't hesitate to come to conclusions about the purpose of the programming or the perpetrators. The way you create Manchurian candidates is you divide the mind. It's part of what the intelligence community wanted to look at. If you're going to get an assassin, you're going to get somebody to go do something, you divide the mind. It fascinates me about cases like the assassination of Robert Kennedy, where Bernard Diamond, on examining Sirhan Sirhan found that he had total amnesia of the killing of Robert Kennedy, but under hypnosis could remember it. But despite suggestions he would be able to consciously remember, could not remember a thing after was out of hypnosis. I'd love to examine Sirhan Sirhan. The interesting thing is how many people have described the same scenario, and how many people that we have worked with who have had relatives in NASA, in the CIA, and in the military, including very high UPS in the military. People say, what's the purpose of it? My best guess is that the purpose of it is that they want an army of Manchurian. 257. Candidates, 10 of thousands of mental robots who will do prostitution, do child pornography, smuggle drugs, engage in international arms smuggling, do snuff films, all sorts of very lucrative things, and do their bidding and eventually the megalomaniacs at the top believe they'll rule the world. The end of Dr. Corridan's speech was met with long, sustained applause by the attendees of the conference who recognized the bravery of going public with this information was well as many having their suspicions regarding the nature of mind control in their patients confirmed. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Victims speak. Bill Clinton's administration hosted the Presidential Advisory Committee on Radiation Experiments on March 15, 1995, and two victims of trauma-based mind control along with their therapist gave a stunning presentation of their abuse at the hands of MK Ultra. The case of victim Claudia Mullen is particularly interesting. Claudia had been referred to psychiatrist Valerie Wolf after experiencing a sexual assault, and was unresponsive in therapy for many months. Unlike many other therapists, Wolf did not use hypnosis or any other memory retrieval techniques with Mullen. It needs to be made clear that these clients have remembered these names and events spontaneously, with free recall and without the use of any memory retrieval technique such as 258. Hypnosis. As much as possible, we have tried to verify the memories. I have sent information from one of my clients to Alan Shefflin, professor of law at Santa Clara University Law School, and a judicially recognized expert on mind and behavior control. He has been able to confirm that the information that she has supplied is absolutely true, and that her memories could not have been derived from any published source. Valerie Wolf, speaking to the Presidential Advisory Commission on Radiation. 506 Here are some excerpts from Claudia Mullen's testimony, from which she has earned no money and named men who were still alive. Good afternoon. Between the years 1957 and 1984 I became a pawn in the government's game. Its ultimate goal was mind control and to create the perfect spy, all through the use of chemicals, radiation, drugs, hypnosis, electric shock, isolation in tubs of water, sleep deprivation, brainwashing, verbal, physical, emotional and sexual abuse. I was exploited unwittingly for nearly three decades of my life and the only explanations given to me were that the end justifies the means and I was serving my country in their bold effort to fight communism. 
I can only summarize my circumstances by saying they took an already abused seven-year-old child and compounded my suffering beyond belief. The saddest part is, I know for a fact I was not 506 The testimony of Valerie B. Wolfe. 259. Alone. There were countless other children in my same situation and there was no one to help us until now. In 1958 they told me I was to be tested by some important doctors from the society, or the Human Ecology Society and I was instructed to cooperate. I was told not to look at anyone's faces, and to try hard to ignore any names because this was a very secret project. I was told all these things to help me forget. Naturally, as most children do, I did the opposite and remembered as much as I could. A Dr. John Gittinger tested me, Dr. Cameron gave me the shock, and Dr. Green the x-rays. Then I was told by Sid Gottlieb that I was ripe for the big A meaning artichoke. By the time I left to go home, just like every time from then on, I would remember only whatever explanations Dr. Robert G. Heath, of Tulane Medical University, gave me for the odd bruises, needle marks, burns on my head, fingers, and even the genital soreness. I had no reason to think otherwise. They had already begun to control my mind. The next year I was sent to a lodge in Maryland called Deep Creek Cabins to learn how to sexually please men. I was taught how to coerce them into talking about themselves. I was used to entrap many unwitting men including themselves, all with the use of a hidden camera. I was only nine years old when the sexual humiliation began. 260. Another time I heard Dr. Martin Orn, who was the director then of the scientific office and later head of the Institute for Experimental Research state that in order to keep more funding coming from different sources for radiation and mind control projects, he suggested stepping up the amounts of stressors used and also the blackmail portions of the experiments. He said, it needed to be done faster than to get rid of the subjects or they were asking for us to come back later and haunt them with our remembrances. I would love nothing more than to say that I dreamed this all up and need to just forget it. But that would be a tragic mistake. It would also be lie. All these atrocities did occur to me and to countless other children, and all under the guise of defending our country. It is because of the cumulative effects of exposure to radiation, chemicals, drugs, pain, subsequent mental and physical distress that I have been robbed of the ability to work and even to bear children of my own. It is blatantly obvious that none of this was needed, nor should ever have been allowed to take place at all, and the only means we have to seek out the awful truth and bring it to light is by opening whatever files remain on all the projects, and through another presidential commission on mind control. In follow-up interviews, Mullen went into more details regarding the entrapment. 261. Operations she was a part of. The CIA kept hotel rooms in two of the best hotels in New Orleans, and year-round they kept a suite. It was unique in that it had two bathrooms, and one bathroom was where they kept the hidden cameras, and I was actually shown the hidden cameras by three men who handled that part of it. They called him Captain George White. He was formerly a doctor. He used to be in the narcotics squad in California, and then he became a doctor and joined the CIA. And then there were two other men who worked with him. They would put me with the subjects who would be filmed, the men, and then when the men would come into town I am talking about local politicians, government officials anybody who they needed to possibly get something on, keep on file for future reference should they need to coerce this person into supporting the projects. Senators, congressmen, anything like that if they were in town, they were given this room. They had no reason to think there was anything strange about the room. It didn't look any different than any other room. It was just one of the better suites in the two hotels. I was shown how the cameras were set up behind mirrors behind the mirrors which are in every hotel room, behind the dresser. They would sit there and they would film it. When I was first told this I, when I was nine, and I went to the Deep Creek cabins in Maryland. That's when I was taught I was. 262. Going to be part of this project, I had been accepted into this project, 
that I had been accepted into this project that would help the government stop communism. 507 At another point she stated that one man she was involved with as an entrapment operation was Frank Church. Some of them were. I think they were afraid they would talk about the projects, and so they had to use something to keep them quiet. For instance, there was a guy named Church, all I knew was, he would try, he was very important to them because he was going to convince other people to let the projects keep going and so they had to get something on this guy, Church. This was later, when I was in high school. Supposedly he ended up talking other people into letting the projects keep going. He was supposed to be investigating, to see if there was anything wrong being done by the CIA, and so he of course decided nothing wrong was being done because they had a film on him. 508 Senator Frank Church headed the United States Senate Select Committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities, popularly known as the Church Committee. 509 The committee was the first to investigate the CIA for their illegal actions under MKUltra, Project Mockingbird, and other enterprises. The alleged entrapment of Frank Church may explain how the CIA was able to escape any sort of reform from Congress and continued many illicit projects, albeit with more secrecy. It is the perfect example of how important entrapment was to the agency and how effective it could be to their uninterrupted continuation. There is certainly the potential that Mullen's testimony is a lie. After all, many of the names she alleged to have been a part of her mind control program had been publicly named as a part of the MK Ultra program. At least one had not, Darwin Fenner, a high society socialite and MK Ultra institution to lane administrator. 510 Mullen has not seemed to make any money from her allegations, against many men who were still alive, given to a presidential investigative committee. In addition, her testimony was reviewed by Alan Shefflin, professor of law at Santa Clara University Law School and judicially recognized expert in mind and behavior control, who stated that her claims could not have been derived from any known publication, making her testimony worth discussing. One particularly disturbing sentence from Mullen's testimony is, Dr. Martin T. Orne said, it needed to be done faster than to get rid of the subjects or they were asking for us to come back later and haunt them with our remembrances. The idea that trauma-based mind control victims would be disposed of once they outlived their usefulness is truly terrifying, but certainly in the mind of a psychopath it would be a logical and necessary step to take. Perhaps it explains why only a handful of victims have been able to recover from their abuse and synthesize their memories coherently enough to present their case of being abused. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Conclusion 510 to lanelink.com 264. All in all, trauma-based mind control has become a widespread program extended from original MK Ultra research. Extreme abuse at a young age has been revealed to be the most effective way of controlling the mind, and psychopathic networks in both occult groups and clandestine agencies jumped at the opportunity to create a veritable of mind-controlled slaves using the most depraved and violent techniques at their disposal. By using torture such as electric shock and sexual abuse, these psychopaths have found a way to literally create blank slate alternate personalities which can be programmed for all sorts of illicit activities. Child prostitution, pornography, snuff films, assassinations, and drug running are all direct applications of mind control programming. Another likelihood is programming among elite military units to undertake activities that would otherwise be balked at, such as death squads and terrorism. The documented MK Ultra interest in electric shock, hypnosis, and sensory deprivation are collectively the forerunners to trauma based mind control with the only missing documented ingredient being sexual abuse. It is certainly horrifying to consider that groups, government, or otherwise, would deliberately subject children to such abuse but in the context of psychopathy, where psychopaths are sexual deviants and sadists, it is actually quite logical. It is unclear how much of an overlap there is between the CIA and occult groups. The most likely scenario is that occult groups infiltrated the MK Ultra program and began using the knowledge they learned for their own subversive plans. 
It is also possible that the leading researchers into MKUltra were simultaneously members of occult groups themselves. The crossover between occult groups and military occupations, such as the Presidio, Michael Aquino, and Dr. Corridan's statement that the interesting thing is how many people have described the same scenario, and how many people that we have. 265. Worked with who have had relatives in NASA, in the CIA, and in the military, including very high UPS in the military, certainly demands further investigation. Many of the victims discussed by Dr. Hammond and those who responded to the extreme abuse surveys claim to have been born into a direct bloodline, meaning that their families have been practicing in a satanic cult for as many as 12 generations. These children have been essentially born for the purpose of being abused and exploited by cults. Some have referred to themselves as the chosen generation, perhaps indicating that they have a role to play in the end game of the pathocracy. Children outside of these bloodlines seem to be more expendable, and are likely killed once they enter adulthood, when they are no longer useful for child prostitution or pornography, and their programming begins to weaken. We can only speculate about the death toll. The two main groups involved in extreme abuse, the occult and clandestine intelligence agencies, seem to have distinct goals with significant overlap. The occult groups believe, in the vein of the writings of Alastair Crowley, that there are legitimate spiritual reasons for abuse and always perform their mind control operations during rituals. The CIA, on the other hand, seems more interested in espionage and entrapment. The overlap between the two is the goal of making money, and possibly the causing of violence and terror as part of a strategy of tension campaign designed to steer the populace towards certain political goals and psychological states of terror, making manipulation of the populace easier. Some researchers have suggested that trauma-based mind control dates as far back as the ancient Egyptian mystery schools, with the Book of the Dead serving as a blueprint to torture and utilize drugs to exert control over that person, raising the possibility that occult groups have been practicing a form of mind control for millennia and used the laboratory settings of the Nazis and the CIA to enhance and refine their techniques. 511511 Ron Patton, Project Monarch, Nazi Mind Control 266 I want to state emphatically that the entirety of the evidence does not necessarily point to a world with comprehensive and full subversion by satanic cults. These cults comprise only a portion of the occult groups operating within the pathocracy and instead seem to be one arm of the psychopathic network, being concealed and protected for the use and creation of mind-controlled slaves, profits from drug and child trafficking, and entrapment of pedophiles in government, military, finance and beyond. Ultimately, the full motivations of trauma-based mind control, the breadth of the operations and number of victims cannot fully be known until the pathocracy which is responsible for these crimes against humanity is brought down and dissected. There is no knowledge more important towards this end than the extent of pedophilia and child abuse at the hands of the government and elite. The disbelief of trauma-based mind control is understandable so we must collectively work together to bring further evidence to light. After all, before the liberation of Auschwitz, the general sentiment was that such atrocities were impossible and reports of mass murder were greatly exaggerated. Unfortunately, they did happen, and serve as a reminder that crimes against humanity at the hands of psychopaths are very real. As the final word on trauma-based mind control, I would like to reiterate the conclusion of Dr. Corridan Hammond. People say, what's the purpose of it? My best guess is that the purpose of it is that they want an army of Manchurian candidates, ten of thousands of mental robots who will do prostitution, do child pornography, smuggle drugs, engage in international arms smuggling, do snuff films, all sorts of very lucrative things, and do their bidding and eventually the megalomaniacs at the top believe they'll rule the world. 267. Food for Thought One are Manchurian candidates responsible for many of the assassinations and terrorist attacks in world history? Two What are the limits of the possibility of controlling a society using mind control? 3. How many victims of Monarch are currently programmed today? 4. How many deaths have occurred due to the Monarch program? 
5. Why are members of the military-industrial complex so interested in marginalizing the existence of extreme abuse? 6. Just how dark does the crimes against humanity perpetrated by networks of psychopaths get? 268. The Pathocracy On August 12, 1991, investigative journalist Danny Casolero was found dead in a bathtub at a hotel in West Virginia. He was in the state to meet a source on a story he was working on called The Octopus, which referred to a sprawling international criminal cabal that was exerting influence over a multitude of world events, such as the Iran hostage crisis that helped get Ronald Reagan elected. Although his death was ruled a suicide, the Casoluro family was adamant it was a murder, citing threats on Danny's life. 512 The octopus that Danny Casoluro was following is the pathocracy. It has grown over the centuries, spreading its many tentacles across the globe, tightening its grip on control of information, money, wars, and beyond. The scope of this book was mostly kept within the context of the United States but the scope of the octopus is truly international. Of course, we cannot fully know the extent of the beast until it is starved and dissected. But until then, we can still reasonable construct the big picture of our current situation. The history recounted thus far is the history of institutions that have become saturated with psychopaths, who began to act ruthlessly on their desires to control and manipulate others. The process is called ponerology, a term coined by Polish psychologist Andrzej Lobazowski, who studied how the governments of the Soviet bloc became increasingly evil. The term comes from the Greek word poneria, meaning lawlessness. Lobazowski published his work in a book titled Political Ponerology. 513 Lobazowski had tremendous difficulty in publishing his book, at one point the manuscript was thrown in the furnace shortly before a raid by the secret police, and later. The publication was blocked by none other than Zbigniew Brzezinski himself. He had hopes that by sending his manuscript to the Vatican, the word about pathocracy would be heard on a global level. The manuscript was never returned. When he came to the United States, he figured that the freer society would be more accepting of his thesis, again, publication was blocked and his work was marginalized. What was so revolutionary about Lobazowski's work that it was repressed by the elite worldwide? It is impossible to come to any conclusion from his work except that the development of pathocracy is inevitable as long as the general population is ignorant about the psychopathic other. Psychopaths have always existed, and they view the world of normal people, those with morality and conscience, as something to be looked down upon and exploited. Perhaps the most shocking revelation of his work is that psychopaths learn to recognize each other, even at a young age. 514 The natural result is a network of psychopaths, a subset of the population that recognize their differences and feel not only contempt for the rest of society, but the need to control and manipulate them as well. Over time they become experts in our weaknesses and follies, watching from a distance with curiosity and amusement. The idea that psychopaths can recognize each other is central to the pathocracy. Imagine for millennia the process of evolution of a psychopathic cabal growing in power and numbers, increasingly manipulating society. You would think that the United States would think twice when in 2004 we had one presidential candidate who was a member of a powerful secretive society known as the Skull and Bones run against the presidential incumbent who was also a member of the same secretive society. 515 Tim Russert, you both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society of Yale. What does that tell us? Sen. John Kerry, not much because it's a secret. 516 These connections are not insignificant, rather they are the tip of the iceberg of a vast covered network of collusion, the result of the process of the polarization. This process of polarization has happened to the major centers of covered power in our world. The CIA, FBI, NSA, and the global financial elite all the way down to local police departments have all become polarized institutions. Understanding the condition and development of polarized networks is not just important, it is perhaps the most important information that society can have. It is the next step in evolution of society, the next grand paradigm shift.
This is the context under which the pathocracy operates. A system of government hidden from the public view and operated by a psychologically distinct subset of the population whom do not feel empathy, have no conscience, and derive pleasure from the manipulation and abuse of the mass of the population they view as inferior. When we read accounts of horrific extreme abuse perpetrated against children, understand that the psychopathic other enjoys this abuse. They derive pleasure from torture and murder. These psychopaths recognize each other and over time they come to be the sole holders of power wherever it exists in an unadulterated form. Seemingly antagonistic institutions such as competing banks are actually operated by the same psychopathic cabal behind the scenes. In the same way that you and I naturally exclude social deviants from our social groups, psychopaths do with normal people. The result is a web of mutual conditioning of evil. Through a vast propaganda matrix, the pathocracy is slowly conditioning humanity to conform to their six standards such as endless war, resulting in a large portion of the population displaying secondary psychopathic tendencies. This is 516 Campbell Brown, on CNN, transcript available here. 271. The group that has subverted democracy not only in the United States but around the world, and are currently manipulating world events behind the scenes. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Terrorism today. At the outset of Operation Cyclone in the late 70s, the CIA, acting as an arm of the Western financial elite, began fostering close relationships with a variety of powerful and important figures in the Middle East. The goal was a profoundly different landscape in the region, one where governments could do little to prevent the manipulation and control of indigenous resources and ideas. One of these men was Osama bin Laden, a wealthy Saudi businessman, who would maintain a relationship with the CIA for an extended period of time, coordinating Islamic radicals to promote the goals of the CIA through terrorism and indoctrination, and further acting as a scapegoat to cast out to the public as an enemy that, for some reason, evaded capture for decades. Bin Laden was not alone, but his organization, Al-Qaeda, would become the centerpiece of a contrived conflict known today as the War on Terror, which would eventually create trillions of profits for the very people tasked with ending it. The United States made strong alliances with the very countries and people responsible for the funding and proliferation of terrorists such as Bin Laden, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. The intelligence agencies of these countries are entirely corrupt, and have grown massively in power, to the point where they exert more control than the nominal. 272. Governments of these states, becoming the deep state, where the true power of a country resides in its covert operations and with people whose names are generally not known to the public. Each of these countries, including the United States, act as an arm of the pathocracy, and are responsible for a vast majority of the terrorism in the world today. To some extent they literally operate organizations such as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. This relationship becomes crystal clear when we see that the objectives of Al-Qaeda are perfectly in line with those of the pathocracy. In Middle East conflicts such as the Libyan Revolution, struggles in Kosovo and Serbia, the Syrian Civil War, we see Al-Qaeda and the United States fighting on the same side. The lack of any tangible results from the war on terror is a smoking gun for its uselessness. Terrorism today benefits the pathocracy and the pathocracy only. The alleged true perpetrators of terrorism have their homelands bombed and ravished while it provides an excuse for continuous militarization and increasingly repressive domestic policies that do more to stifle legitimate domestic dissent than to curb foreign violence. Terrorism in countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq provide a convenient reason for increasing military presence, and to make the local governments dependent on the United States for protection. The resulting destabilization makes the economies and resources easier to exploit. It is not a coincidence that terrorism and destabilization seem to precede important geopolitical objectives in that region. Domestic terrorism serves to keep the populace in fear and justify increased infringement of civil rights. Tragic events such as school shootings are nearly universally followed by a push for an agenda that furthers the goal of the pathocracy. That the last known meeting of Operation Gladio coordinators was in 1990 ought to have been, and still should be, 
Front page news. A variety of the actors involved with Gladio are absolutely still in significant positions of power today. 273. Gladio has evolved from a localized European campaign of terrorism into a global network. Former FBI agent turned whistleblower Sybil Edmonds refers to it as Gladio B. The strategy of tension has proved to be one of the most useful tools of the pathocracy. Across the world, they have assassinated leaders, terrorized populations, destroyed infrastructure, and spread destructive propaganda, and it has worked. Where would Latin America be today had they not been terrorized by the pathocracy? Decades of progress have been lost to repressive dictatorships propped up by the CIA spreading corruption and keeping the means of economic production in the hands of foreign powers. And what about the Middle East? The landscape would be radically different without decades of interference. Minor differences between Islamic sects have been exploited to divide communities and nations. If even only a portion of the countries in this region united economically, the house of cards of the pathocracy would tumble down. They know this, and it is why the Middle East is such a hotbed of violence and destabilization today. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Agenda the pathocracy has been firmly in control of the United States democratic process for decades. As it stands, there are no significant tangible differences between the two parties. To hide this fact, a variety of actors routinely circuit the mainstream media spitting vehemence towards their political rivals while behind the scenes they joke about the smoke screen they have created. 274 the agenda that has evolved over the past decades is one of global hegemony, economic and military. Once distinct ideologies of liberalism and conservatism have evolved into neoliberalism and neoconservatism, who share the same goals and differ only slightly in means of implementing them. The agenda is the agenda of the financial elite, using a manipulated democratic process, the United States military, and covered institutions as tools of maintaining their socially dominant position. When a foreign country threatens to upset the status quo, there is a regime change in nearly every single instance. In the few countries where this hasn't been accomplished, it is very likely that a regime change is in the works, a plan evolving behind the scenes as I write. In the entire history of the United States, the country has not gone 40 months without a military conflict since at least 1963. 517 There are long periods where the enemy is focused around one vague ideology. Yesterday's communism is today's Islamic radicalism. The Red Scare is alive and well, it has found a new face to demonize. Today's wars show no sign of ending. The pathocracy has repeatedly exploited crises to implement new legislation with applause that would otherwise be universally panned. 9-11 brought us the Patriot Act and continuity of government, which has laid the groundwork for a vast surveillance state and indefinite detention. What crises will be manufactured when the Trans-Pacific Partnership is ready to be officially revealed? Asterisk 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 asterisk. The Deep State. In the United States, and indeed much of the nations around the world, there exists two governments, one that operates out in the open, which the citizens are familiar with and interact with, and a parallel top-secret government, whose existence is visible only to a select few and only occasionally exposed to the general public. This clandestine hybrid network of shadowy institutions and figures, both public and private, operates with its own intentions and its own power regardless of who is formally the head of state. The deep state does not consist of the entire government. It is a hybrid of national security and law enforcement agencies, the Department of Defense, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Justice Department. I also include the Department of the Treasury because of its jurisdiction over financial flows, its enforcement of international sanctions and its organic symbiosis with Wall Street. All these agencies are coordinated by the Executive Office of the President via the National Security Council. Mike Lofgren 518 The Deep State is also largely privatized. The Washington Post has reported that the number of private contractors with top-secret clearances has reached 854,000, a mind-blowing number in itself, 
and greater than the number of top secret clearances among civilian employees of the government. 519 Wall Street is also a main component of the deep state, by which the very grease that allows the cogs of the machine to run originates. If there is any one thing that the deep state requires, it is silent and uninterrupted cash flow. The deep state was legalized on September 11, 2001 after George W. Bush declared a state of emergency and enacted the continuity of government operations. It is the natural result of the progressive number of power grabs by various intelligence agencies detailed throughout the previous chapters. It is the deep state that is responsible for endless war and the one-party state, effectively ensuring its continued existence and importance by providing an impetus for war, surveillance, and propaganda while simultaneously removing any possibility of civilian reform. The deep state is the vehicle from which the pathocracy operates. It has expanded its operations into drug running, child trafficking and more so that it does not have to rely entirely on taxpayer money for its projects. For all intents and purposes, the rise of the deep state can be considered a silent coup on the United States of America. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Cults. When we peel back the layers of the pathocracy and travel deeper into the rabbit hole, by exploring the depths of trauma-based mind control and child abuse that has become institutionalized among the elite, we are given a glimpse of the world of cults. The reality is that the pathocracy sits on top of, and in the process conceals and protects, a black network of Satanists and other occultists who explore the darkest evils imaginable. The pathocracy conceals this arm of the octopus because it provides a valuable service to 277 their goals and has a network of lots of influential people. Furthermore, cults likely operate as psychopathic recruitment centers. The whole idea of a cult revolves around hidden knowledge and the manipulation of the masses. Psychopaths are drawn to such ideologies, and are then recruited into the broader pathocracy. There is no topic that reveals the depths of depravity of the pathocracy more than their use of pedophilia as a tool for control. It is how they conceal their biggest conspiracies, by holding over the heads of their subjects a type of blackmail that will ensure compliance. In addition, there is no topic that reveals the necessity of action than their abuse of children. And if the extent of this phenomenon can be exposed fully, no truth will bring down their reign quicker. Unfortunately, it is necessary to paint such a dark picture because the reality is dark, and we cannot pretend that the end game of the pathocracy does not exist. If resistance to the pathocracy grows, we must be prepared for the worst, such as a series of major terrorist attacks, wars between major world powers, and the collapse of fiat currency. This is the big picture, an agenda of total control, and events are accelerating as the octopus tightens the grip of its tentacles around the globe. We are living in grand times, at no point in history has the current moment been so important for the future of humanity. Fortunately, the pathocracy is doomed to fail. 278. Solutions. The problem of the pathocracy seems to be so vast and complex, it is certainly intimidating. We are fortunate that the solutions are relatively simple. It begins and ends with education and non-participation. Ignorance is the sole tool that keeps the pathocracy afloat. It's truly this easy. An awake populace can collectively choose to stop holding the pyramid above their shoulders by refusing to oil the gears of the machine. We need to. 279. Collectively move our money out of banks, support local enterprise instead of multinational corporations, and be excessively vocal about the truth. The time to start being as vocal as possible was decades ago. By this I mean that there is no time for anything else anymore. If you are awake, start making waking others up your number one priority. There are few things I desire to do than to forget all of this and get lost in World of Warcraft. Yet the stakes are too high, there is something bigger going on than our selfish desires. Imagine yourself reflecting on the past in 20, 30 years. Will you be content with the impact you had on the awakening, or will you regret not doing more as the police state becomes fully entrenched around you and it is too late to make a difference?
the first step is to become fully educated yourself. Be able to articulate the problem to even the most skeptical. Collect information and resources that effectively expose the abuses and inner workings of the pathocracy. Then take this knowledge and share it. I know I have had reservations about sharing the truth with those who seem so content with their circumstances because shattering worldviews is not a pleasant experience by any means. But it is time to put these reservations aside. The building is on fire, and we need to evacuate before it is too late, those who will be momentarily angry for being slapped awake will be grateful once the gravity of the situation becomes clear. While a personal discussion is certainly the most valuable tool, there are other means. For example, you can compile the sources and information you find most pertinent and send them out in an anonymous email to your contacts list. 520 Perhaps begin your email with from a concerned friend, please read this information with an open mind. If one out of 100 people is reached this way, the seed will be planted for an inevitable blossom. Ideas follow a pattern of being ridiculed until they reach a critical mass and are accepted. We must endeavor to reach this critical mass as soon as possible, before the grip of the pathocracy is sufficiently tight enough to prevent the flow of information. Asterisk 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 asterisk. One valuable tool we have is alternative currencies, especially cryptocurrencies. First off, it is a great way to avoid using traditional means of money transfer and bank holdings that prop up the beast. Yet there is another tremendously important value, especially with Bitcoin and potentially with future Bitcoin competitors, it has made the counterculture rich. There are thousands of people who are receptive to the type of information contained in this book who thanks to newfound wealth from cryptocurrencies now have the means to proliferate the truth far and wide. If this applies to you, please consider using your assets for a positive impact, perhaps by placing relevant information in public places, by organizing protests, or supporting independent media. Asterisk 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 asterisk. The worst thing we can do is wait for someone else to step up and be a leader, for someone else to organize a movement for us to join, for someone else to take a stand against the pathocracy. A true paradigm shift has to start from within ourselves. An organization or institution has too much propensity to be led astray or infiltrated. After all, preventing the rise of a messiah is a documented top priority of the pathocracy. Be the change you want to see in the world, and educate others to do the same. Research where the materials you consume come from, and make smart purchasing choices. Strive to minimize your corporate and government footprint. It is truly as simple as this, and this chapter can be complete while being one of the shortest in the book. Stop. 281. Holding the pyramid above us and let it collapse around us, then we can put the important pieces back together without the potential for the massive centralization of covered power that we see today. One by one is how the awakening grows, until it is inevitable. 282. The Awakening. The date was December 21, 2012, one day after my graduation from the University of Illinois. I was sitting at home, contemplating life, exhausted from a frenzy of theses, finals, and celebrations. I wondered what I would possibly do with a degree in history, a question I had been deftly avoiding throughout my time in school. I wondered if I could ride out my bartending gig into adulthood, wondered how quickly I could get myself out of the suburbs and out of the Midwest. That night, in my typical fashion of procrastinating instead of facing issues head-on, I was lead to the dark corners of the Internet. I was not a conspiracy theorist, but I found the topics interesting, and fell head first deep into the rabbit hole of Gultra. A truth so dark and disgusting that I cried, a mountain of evidence that the cabal that I would eventually come to know as the pathocracy is responsible for a global network of child trafficking and child abuse. My worldview was flipped upside down the moment it all sunk it. Some call it waking up. I looked at the clock and the time read 10.33. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Synchronicity was described by Carl Jung as temporally coincident occurrences of a causal events. 
In other words it means events that are causally unrelated yet experienced together in a meaningful manner, related conceptually with the chance of them occurring together being very small. That evening, I would look at the clock again at 11.33, 12.33 and 1.33. It was the beginning of a lengthy and profound series of synchronicity I would. 283. Experience with the number. 33 had been my lucky number for quite some time. At age 10, it was the centerpiece of an inside joke for my camp counselors. I didn't understand the joke, of course, but I emulated them as any 10-year-old would. It was the number of my lacrosse jersey in high school, and my standardized test score. It's labeled on the bottle of one of my favorite beers. Nothing seriously profound, but enough for it to be my number. I remember being quite hungover on December 21st, not just because of celebrating my graduation, but because of a series of parties centered around the end of the Mayan calendar, which some believed predicted the end of the world. Neither my friends nor myself truly thought that the world was going to end, it was just another excuse to get hammered and party as if there was no tomorrow. Yet in hindsight, perhaps this date was not a coincidence. The end of the calendar didn't intend to predict the end of the world, rather, it reflected the Mayan belief that the end of the calendar era would usher in a new age, the age of enlightenment. In the months preceding December 21st, I would go days, sometimes even weeks at a time seeing 33 on the clock every single hour I was awake. I had been a committed atheist for much of my life. I still understand it to be one of the most rational worldviews. After all, the world is filled with evil and suffering, and the major religions are filled with corruption and hypocrisy. But this was a phenomenon I could not ignore, and decided to explore it further. It went deeper than just numbers on a clock, I would come to profound thoughts and insights at 33, I met a great friend who had the 33rd ticket at the pub I flipped burgers at to pay the bills, I have frequently and repeatedly published important writing at 33. Following insights from synchronicity brought me to South America, where I met my soulmate and spiritual partner at 6.33 p.m. I am having a direct communication with God and the experience has 284 been phenomenal. My experience with synchronicity goes beyond numbers. Reflecting on my life, I am fascinated by how events weave their way together to put me in exactly the right place at the right time to wake up and to have developed the skills to synthesize this information and share it with others. When I needed to learn an important lesson, the structure of my life evolved to put me into a position to truly internalize new values and ideas, a sort of synchronistic flow of events. The ride, as the brilliant comedian and commentator Bill Hicks would put it, has not been easy. My whole life has been a series of learning the hard way. I had to fail out of school to learn the value of learning. I had to spend weeks in a hospital with major burns to get a grip on my issues with drugs and alcohol. I had to get arrested to learn how my actions impact others. I had to experience obesity to learn the value of health and caring for my body. I had to experience deep and prolonged depression to appreciate happiness and action. A whole lot of experiences to synthesize in 23 years of living, but I am grateful for every one of them. They made me who I am today. In the same sense, humanity is learning the hard way. We have to confront the pathocracy in order to collectively evolve, to not just blindly follow the next paradigm shift but to actively construct it within ourselves. As the waning pathocracy clashes with the rising awakening, there will be a lot of suffering, but we should not be upset, instead, we should be grateful for the catalyst that will be responsible for the inevitable beautiful renaissance that represents the light at the end of the tunnel. Asterisk 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 asterisk. I absolutely wish I could lay out a comprehensive metaphysical thesis here but the truth is, I simply don't know what the truth is. I do know that at the very bottom of the 285 conspiracy rabbit hole, is that each and every one of us is a powerful spiritual being. We have a part of us that is eternal and perfect, hidden behind layers of ego. Some have more layers than others, and that is okay, 
not everyone began their journey at the same time, and eventually we will all finish it. There is a series of paradoxes, the present we are experiencing is but a blink of an eye along the path of evolution for our souls, yet simultaneously the road ahead of us is of the utmost importance. There is an infinite amount of life not only in this universe but each one that exists beyond it, that has existed before it and will exist after it. Yet, we are each special. This is the nature of infinity, we are not insignificant. Entering the age of enlightenment, and lifting the veil, means more than just shining a spotlight on the pathocracy. While I think the information contained within this book is important, I believe that its true significance lies in showing that our collective understanding of reality is vastly incomplete and largely incorrect. As we move forward, we must base our thoughts and actions not in hate and anger towards the pathocracy but with love and respect towards one another. This is not only the best means of confronting the problems we face but it is simply the right thing to do. It is time to search deep inside ourselves and hold on tightly to our inner light, develop it and share it with others. Be a catalyst for the beautiful renaissance that is in our future. As you fight fire not with more fire but with water, fight evil not with evil but with love. The return of God consciousness to our world, or whichever name you want to give it, this is the true meaning of the Age of Enlightenment and lifting the veil, the underlying meaning of the existence of the pathocracy and the struggles we will face as we confront it. 286. Don't forget to share this book with at least two people. 287. About me. My name is Timothy Silver. I am 23 years old. I have a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Illinois. I understand that these credentials aren't going to blow anyone's mind, which is why I opted for the approach of citing every claim with a publicly available source. After all, I am simply too young to have the advanced degrees that would thrust this work into the spotlight. Does that make the information any less true, any less profound? I have spent most of my life in Illinois, some of it in Chicago, some in the suburbs, and most of the last five years in Champaign. Currently, I have no permanent address. I am backpacking through South America experimenting with alternative ways of living and experiencing different cultures. My budget is $15 a day and I have temporarily settled in Lima, Peru to spend time with my girlfriend and focus on production of more work related to shining light on the truth. The trip has been phenomenal. Lifting the Veil is my first full project and I have been running a blog called The People's History for the last five months. It has been a fantastic experience. I am grateful for all of the positive feedback I have received during this time. I've received threats that I consider credible as well, many months before I began writing this book, back when I began raising hell over the suspicious circumstances surrounding the death of investigative journalist Michael Hastings. I don't think there is any value in discussing them in depth other than to make the fact public record. For that reason, I won't be promoting this book to any significant extent. There is a time for bravery and a time for common sense. If you found the content of this book insightful, please share it with as many people as possible, anonymously if you must. It is the only way these ideas will. 288. Spread. Please contact me if you have any questions and criticism or input, research you think is important, or if you simply want to say hi. I thoroughly enjoy all of the correspondence, and find my opinions and views are constantly being refined through discussing them with others. Timothy M. Silver Tim Silver People's History at gmail.com 289. Donate. This book and all future work will be free because the proliferation of this information is the most important goal I have. That being said, if you have available funds, I would appreciate it if you considered this book as a pay-what-you-want type of deal, to donate some money which reflects how important you feel this information is to you. Any money beyond subsistence I will put to work towards expanding my writing activities and to support future projects that are in the works. If you are having financial problems, or have a family to support, please keep your money to yourself. Otherwise, any contribution will be put to good use. 
please email me at timsilverpeopleshistory at gmail.com if you are interested in supporting my work or funding a project, either through fiat currency or your favorite cryptocurrency. You can also donate using the links at the sidebar at my website thepeopleshistory.net Thanks for reading, Timothy Silver. 290. In memory of Michael Hastings. On July 18, 2013, investigative journalist Michael Hastings, the man who single-handedly brought down one of the most powerful men in the military with his reporting, 521 died in a fiery car crash in Los Angeles. Suspicious circumstances of his death immediately began streaming in. For example, Hastings had contacted the WikiLeaks lawyer just hours before his death worried that he was being followed by the FBI. 522 The next day, an email that Hastings had sent to colleagues was released, titled FBI. Investigation re-NSA. It stated, I'm on to a big story, and need to go off the radar for a bit. 523 In a 2012 interview, Hastings revealed that he had received numerous death threats from recent investigative reporting. 524 Yes. Every once and a while, I'll get a death threat from someone like, if we don't like what you write, we'll hunt you down and kill you kind of thing. The autopsy report found that neither drugs nor alcohol played a role in the crash. 525 Why? Then, have witnesses described Hastings' vehicle, a Mercedes C250, a car not prone to bursting into flames, traveling at full speed down a suburban road, crossing a red light and then skipping over a median into a tree, exploding. 526 security footage from a gas station caught the speeding, the crash and the explosion, confirming the eyewitness testimony. 527 Hastings was intensely interested in government surveillance of journalists. In May, the story broke about the Department of Justice obtaining the phone records of Associated Press reporters. A couple weeks later, Edward Snowden's revelations about the National Security Agency's massive surveillance program became public. Hastings was convinced he was a target. One night in June, he came to Thigpen's apartment after midnight and urgently asked to borrow her Volvo. He said he was afraid to drive his own car. She declined, telling him her car was having mechanical problems. He was scared, and he wanted to leave town, she says. The next day, around 11.15 a.m., she got a call from her landlord, who told her Hastings had died early that morning. His car had crashed into a palm tree at 75 miles per hour and exploded in a ball of fire. LA Weekly 528 The type of cyber attack that could have taken control of Hastings' vehicle is very real, confirmed by independent hackers to a Forbes journalist in a demonstration 529, and by the government itself, in a presentation by DARPA, the Defense Advances Research Projects Agency. 530 Rest in Peace Michael Hastings, and to each and every victim of the pathocracy. We will pick up where you left off. Help improve this work. I am grateful for all of the help and insights from peers I have received over the course of writing Lifting the Veil. Each time I write an essay or present an idea, I find that my work is constantly refined from input. Due to this, I plan on continually releasing updates of this book as I refine my thesis and come across new research to synthesize. If you have any constructive criticism, any ideas to add, or any other type of help to offer, please do not hesitate to contact me at timsilverpeopleshistory at gmail.com. 294. Stay tuned. In the works. Lifting the Veil 2 which will explore the history of government complicity in global drug trafficking, the foreknowledge of 9-11, the scam of the global monetary system, the real motivations behind modern geopolitics, the occult history of the United States political elite, and more. Much of the work for this book is already completed though cut from this edition to maintain an accessible length. The CIA, Cults, Mind Control, and Child Abuse, Title Subject to Change, an expanded version of the chapters MK Ultra, the pedophocracy, cults, and child abuse, 
and trauma-based mind control into a standalone book with an expanded thesis. Lifting the Veil Podcast Lifting the Veil YouTube Series Lifting the Veil Documentary Further Essays on Various Topics to be posted on my website, thepeopleshistory.net Lifting the Veil Physical Edition Thanks for your readership and support. 295. Lifting the Veil is licensed under Creative Commons. You may share this work with anyone and everyone, provided you give proper attribution, and do not profit commercially. All citations and incorporation of material are legal under fair use guidelines.